Okay, I think we'll start then. So welcome everyone to the uh, joint EGO40 and EPIC workshop. So this is the third international EGO40 workshop and the 11th workshop for egocentric perception, interaction and computing. So welcome once again. I thought I'd just spend a few minutes kind of introducing uh, egocentric where we've been uh, for the workshop series and maybe um, that will lead into the, the workshop today. So egocentric vision, first person vision, we go back 500, million years ago. This is a trilobite. So this is the first animal that we found with which kind of generated or evolved eyes. So these were the first e egocentric creatures. Obviously, they didn't have computers at that time. So the the next kind of egocentric vision for computer vision was 499.9 million years later. So this is uh, Steve Mann with wearable computing, a first step towards personal imaging in 1997. As you can see, he's wearing Kind of two cameras on kind of a augmented kind of reality headset with a lot of communication devices around his waist. So not a very comfortable uh, setup, but this is kind of recording uh, egocentric vision. I mean, kind of uh, maybe one of the starting points of uh, egocentric. Uh, next year, we kind of got this much light, more lightweight device. So you have two cameras in this case, one facing forward and one facing downwards to get the uh, interactions. So this was 1998. Um, and then kind of jumping forward a few years, we kind of had maybe one of the first kind of big data sets in this kind of area, um, which was the CMU MMAC or the multimodal. And you can see this kind of, uh, they have markers on, they have the um, setup and they're doing kitchen activities. So in this case, they're making some brownies, but this was kind of um, also had multiple cameras as well in the scene, so fixed cameras. So this is kind of blending egocentric with other different uh, modalities. The same year at CUPR 2009 in Miami, uh, there was actually the first workshop on egocentric vision. So this was by uh, Philip Herbert and Rem, which is a first uh, a full day workshop and you know kind of really kickstarted this uh, egocentric vision within the CUPR community. And this kind of went on a few years as well. Next up, we can have the GTEA EA data sets and the kind of a whole stream of these data sets uh, at Georgia Tech, and this is kind of focusing on initially on recognizing objects. And you can see this is a very challenging kind of uh, setup at the time of like lots of different objects that you're trying to find within a home uh, situation and understand what's going on. And uh, our kind of epic workshop series actually starts in 2016. So this is kind of the start of uh, egocentric perception, interaction and computing. You can see it just here. And actually this is um, the first version. This was actually me during my first year of my PhD presenting, Anthony now found this, so I guess a nice closing loop. But yeah, this was the, uh, in uh, Amsterdam, and this kind of really pushed off egocentric. But the main thing that everyone said at this workshop is deep learning is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. How do we use deep learning for egocentric? Because these data sets are just not big enough. And so two years later, uh, at Bristol and Catania in Toronto, we collected Epic Kitchens. So this was kind of the largest uh, egocentric uh, data set at the time. And we wanted this to be kind of unscripted and really kind of paved the way for egocentric to be pushed forward within uh, deep learning. This was presented in Munich and ECCV. You can see Antonino at the poster session and as well as the, uh, alongside the, the Epic workshop. And we even had the badges and leaflets, which I'm sure you've seen uh, lots of. The following year at CBPR 2019, we kind of started the challenges. So we had uh, the five challenges for, for Epic, and you can see some of the winners, and these challenges have continued until today. So later on, we'll have these uh, challenge winners. You might recognize some faces. Um, and that kind of brings us on to just before the start of the pandemic in uh, 2020. And I, I believe these are Kristen's slides, which are going over the challenges of egocentric vision. And this is really the starting point which became the Ego 4D Consortium. And it was two years later, collected through the pandemic, that we released Ego 4D around the world in 3,000 hours of egocentric video. And this was really kind of upscaling uh, an egocentric data set from kind of Epic and from the other data sets at the time to kind of much larger for kind of self supervised learning and uh, other kind of modern deep learning approaches. This was held alongside the, uh, or we held last year the uh, Ego 4D workshop as well. And this was when we were presenting the poster last year. And of course, we had a whole suite of benchmark challenges for Ego4D. Um, so we had kind of the five different benchmark tasks. We had researchers participating across the world, and these were held at both CBPR and ECCB. 
And here's some of the pictures from the challenge winners, which I believe is at ECCB. We also have had the uh, Epic Kitchens challenges uh, for the whole time as well. So these were the original five, but this year we have another nine. And this was last year's in the, the workshop for the challenge winners as well. So this year, what's uh, the program like and what are we doing? We have an eager 4D morning, followed by an epic afternoon for the joint workshop. We're starting with two keynotes in the morning. So Andrew, Andrew Vidaldi will uh, talk after this and can see and after their coffee break. We'll have the ego 4D challenge winners, as well as some invited CDR papers, CDPR papers for session one. And then in the afternoon, we'll have another two keynotes from Suraj and, uh, Nair and David Fowey. The epic challenge winners, as well as project area data sets and challenges uh, talks. And then our uh, second set of invited CDPR papers, as well as accepted abstract talks. So before I uh, go on, I want to thank uh, my fellow organizers. So there's quite a few, but um, without them, this uh, workshop won't be possible. And also thanks to all the uh, reviewers and program committee who uh, were checking through the reports and the accepted abstracts. So without further ado, let's move on to our next uh, our next session. So this will be the invited keynote by uh, Andrea Vidal. Hey. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Hey, hey, Giovanni. How are you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna just uh, one minute. Thank you. Stop sharing that. And then... So it's time to welcome our our first speaker, Andrea Lealdi. I'm delighted to introduce Andrea. Andrea is a professor of computer, uh, computer vision and machine learning and co-lead the VGG group at the engineering department, uh, University of Oxford. And his research focuses uh, on computer vision machine learning methods to understand content of images um, with the little or no manual supervision uh, in terms of uh, semantics and 3D geometry. Andrea is also a research scientist at MetaAI in London, and he has got uh, many, many uh, recognition from our community um, and also uh, different grants and two prestigious ARC uh, grants from European Union. So thank you, Andrea, for joining us, <coughs> and the stage is for you. All right. Thank you for the kind introduction, Giovanni. Uh, so first of all, an apology is not being able to be there. Unfortunately, it's uh, examination time in Oxford and required to be here to, to mark papers, of all things. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about today is egocentric data, yes, but uh, I would also like to talk about how 3D uh, vision and 3D understanding and reconstruction can play an important role uh, in it and how this role is likely to increase in the future. Uh, I should also ask, you can see my screen, right? So screen sharing is working. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. So uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about, is gonna, it's not going to be egocentric vision, it's going to be this object. Okay, this is an object, is a, is a glass made of glass, comes from Murano, actually. And so suppose our goal is to be able to model that object so that we can process that uh, computationally. So we need to come up with a representation for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, define a density function. So that's a function that takes as input a 3D point, like X here, and spits out a number that tells you whether that point is occupied with matter or not, whether it's empty space or not. So that gives you the shape of the object. But you also want to know the appearance, so you can render an image of the object. So we're going to add to that another function, which is called a radiance function. Okay. So the radiance function has this input, uh, the 3D point, as well as the viewing direction B. And that gives you the color that you're going to see by looking at that point from a given angle. All right. Of course, this is nothing new. This is just a, a radiance field. Uh, this is an idea which has become very popular in computer vision in the last couple of years. And uh, the reason why this is a popular representation for the, the object is that now you get two functions. You get the radiance and you get the density. And it turns out that those are very effectively representable via deep networks. So particularly, you can define an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, just some parameter theta here, that captures or represents these two functions, and this representation is very efficient. Okay. Not only that, but this allows you to connect the geometry to the geometry and machine learning. And because we use machine learning for understanding, now we can make a connection between 3D reconstruction and eventually also 3D understanding. 
Now, another important ingredient here is that I can render uh, the model I have of the object, so the MLP with this parameter theta, into an image i by just specifying a viewpoint pi. This works by a process of casting rays. So you go from uh, your viewpoint back into the scene by literally casting a sampling points. And then that gives you the color of a pixel. You repeat that for all the pixels, you get an image out. Now, this process is not too important. It does. Suffice to say that this function that you get in this manner, this rent function here that gives you the image, is differentiable. Okay. And because now we have a differentiable function that allows us to render the object from different viewpoints, given a collection of views of our object, what we can do is we can simply set up a learning problem in which I render my object from the different viewpoints I have. And for each one of the viewpoints, I set up a uh, reconstruction loss, just uh, the L2 loss between the image I, I, I have them given and the image that I predict through this differentiable rendering process. I minimize that over the parameter state of my model and uh, I get a reconstruction of my scene, right? So now I have an object. In fact, I have a model of the object, uh, which is just the parameters of the network. Okay, now, you can also see this process in a different way. So you can see this process as you have lots and lots of video frames or images as input, for example, the Lego, Lego sequence here. And through this learning of the neural network or the MLP that you have done, what you have achieved is effectively a compression of information into a single model, which is very, very small compared to you know, the dozens or even hundreds of images you have as input. So it's much more compressed and also is consistent from uh, the viewpoint uh, for multiple viewpoints and is available in 3D. So it's an interpretation, it has a three-dimensional interpretation. Okay, so we are fusing information to the information into a three-dimensional model. Now the question is, all right, so we have fused RGB images. Is there something else we can fuse and get something useful out of? And the answer is, of course, yes. So one thing you can do, which is quite interesting, is you can take any network file that can perform an analysis of an image. For example, you can take an image segmentation network that takes as input an image I and spits out as output a segmentation of the image. So for each pixel, you're going to get a corresponding color, which maps into a space of possible concepts, just image segmentation or semantic segmentation. And what you can do is you can integrate this information to get from individual video frames or individual images back into your 2D model. Now, the way to do that is very simple. So all you do is you take your input images, you extract the semantic segmentation uh, using your network, your 2D network. You repeat that for all the viewpoints you have. There's a bit of an echo, right? Okay, thanks. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, right. So as I was saying, so now we are at the point where we have our input images, but we augment each one of them by applying the, our 2D network. So we get, say, a 2D semantic segmentation, and we can still summarize that information that we get from the multiple views independently into a single coherent 3D reconstruction by extending our MLP to also predict the function f, which is a function of space, which effectively reproduces the features that you get from the individual frames, okay? Same process, same differentiable rendering function, but now what we're doing is we're transferring this 2D information to this 2D semantic, semantic information back in our 3D volume. And this is actually very useful to process egocentric data, okay? That's the point that I wanted to get at. I'm going to show a few examples of that, and then, uh, and then I'm going to discuss something which is brand new. So first of all, uh, the most basic version of that is literally semantic segmentation. So what you can do is you can take an egocentric video, for example, you going around in an apartment, apply semantic segmentation to each individual frame, and then capture a three-dimensional model of the scene, which is now augmented with semantic labels. So you know what's where, okay? This is called semantic nerf, and it was done already in 2021. The next year we introduce NEF, uh, which does the same, but instead of using a semantic simulation network, it uses some genetic features. In particular, we have demonstrated that we can pick unsupervised two-dimensional features like Dino. Dino is a very good uh, unsupervised feature extractor that can capture information in an image like that, which is highly correlated with objects, despite the fact that it's trained without using any human provided label, okay? And now you can extract Dino from individual frames into your egocentric video, and you can fuse that information into a single three-dimensional interpretation, okay? Now, effectively, what we have is that we have augmented our nerve, our reconstruction with Dino features. And once we have done that, the reconstruction becomes, in some sense, smarter. For instance, you can click on a point here on the flower, 
and you can grab the flower in three, in three dimensional space automatically. Okay, this is like semantic segmentation in 3D or instant segmentation in 3D, but there is no manual supervision at all here. And it's done by fusing three dimensional supervised features using a neural field. And you can go on and on with that. So very recently we have introduced a new method which is called contrastive lift, which does the same, but uh, for instant segmentation instead. So what you see here in the middle is applied to an egocentric video. You can see an image segmentation system, which is done in 2D, and that is extracting segments at the level of individual frames. So you can see that the segments are colored differently in different frames because there is no reason for the idea of these segments to be consistent over time. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the segments are actually flash in and out. So the stability of the instant segmentation system is also not perfect. It's a state-of-the-art system, by the way. But when we fuse that information in 3D, and this is a bit more complicated now because we have to resolve the fact that the label is not coherent across time, but we can do that. And in the process of doing that, we can fix all, the, all these little problems. So we're gonna have a consistent instant, instant, segment, instant segmentation of our video. We're gonna have that in 3D and we can also kill off a lot of the noise. Okay, so these are some example applications of what you can do when uh, you combine 2D processing of a recentered video with a 3D reconstruction of it. And you can get some benefits by doing that. But really what I would like to talk to you the most about today is not these relatively simple cases, but it's something which is quite a bit harder. So you want to look at the egocentric data, but also data which is highly dynamic. So the one trick that uh, you might or might not have noticed so far is that all these videos, yes, they were egocentric for the most part, but there was nothing else but the actual person going around the environment changing in the scene, all right? So you get a lot of motion, but the motion is only from the viewpoint of the camera. It's only created or caused because the camera itself, the viewpoint changes over time, but there is nothing in the scene which is changing. But if you look at an actual egocentric video, and you know, because you're sitting here in this workshop, you're very familiar with this kind of data. This is a sample, of course, from Epic Kitchen. But what you see is that there is lots going on. So there, is, there are actions, like activities that we would like to be able to interpret and parse. And uh, yeah, the camera focuses on those actions, but it does that in a very confusing way because you, there is a lot of camera motion, which is overlaying with the motion that exists in the scene. So these two things are confused. And also at any given time, you only see a little bit of the scene, right? So you know that this thing is happening in a kitchen and uh, there is a context that explains uh, this needed uh, in order to explain this activity in full, but you don't see that in every single frame of the video because the field of view is limited. But if you could uh, you know, understand the video in 3D, and this is an example of a reconstruction of a kitchen uh, in a big kitchen done with cold maps. So you see here a sparse point cloud that approximates the three-dimensional shape of the kitchen. Well, then this would effectively open up and clarify what's happening in the video because first of all, it will remove the egocentric viewpoint. So it will kill off the motion of the camera. And two, you would be able to map different activities or actions to different parts of the environment. For example, here you have a label which says pick up garlic. And as you can see here in this diagram that this action is happening here and not anywhere else in the kitchen. So this contextualization of the information is required to make sense of the activity as a whole, all right? But to do that, to get there, you should reconstruct or understand the video not in 2D as a 2D, 2D, 2D stream of frames, but rather by explaining the underlying three-dimensional structure, the kitchen, as well as the object and everything else which is changing the scene in 3D. Now, this is really hard, but uh, this year we're introducing an extension of the kitchen. So this is uh, done in collaboration with uh, the folks uh, that did Epic Kitchen in the first place. And so what we've done here was to take Epic Kitchen and estimate cameras for you. So you see here the construction of uh, one of the many kitchens in the big kitchens, and you can see that uh, at the bottom, top bottom right, you see the video. And of course, what you see otherwise is the camera flying around. This is like a disembodied head. So with this information, uh, now you can really get started on uh, researching 3D reconstruction and 3D uh, interpretation of the kitchen because this, the task of reconstructing the cameras has been solved for you by us, okay? So you can have fun and start to look at the problem of understanding data in 3D. Now this is, was actually, getting these cameras was actually rather challenging. So it took, took a while to get to, to do this well. And once we have done it, you have this data set, which is Epic Kitchen. So we have all the benefit of Epic Kitchen originally, including labels like the visor annotations, which I introduced last year, and also hands annotations that now you can map 
in the three-dimensional kitchen as well. And once you have these data sets, you can start to look at um, different tasks you can solve with it. For example, new view synthesis, in which you can reconstruct the video from a fixed viewpoint, so you remove the egocentric factor. Of course, we have lots and lots of kitchens because that's what we have in Epic Kitchen in the first place. So we have 45 of those. We have reconstructed most of the videos, if not, maybe not all, but most of them. We're gonna see that in a minute. We have 99 hours of videos reconstructed and we have about 18 million, 19 million registered frames. Okay, this is Epic. And we call this data set Epic Fields because it's a combination of uh, Epic Kitchen and Neural Brilliance Fields. That is to say, that's the purpose for which this data was created. Okay, and here you can see some reconstruction. Uh, some, in fact, neural, neural rendering based reconstructions. Okay, right. So now I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes discussing this data set in more detail and showcasing some examples and things you can do with it. All right, again, Epic Kitchen, uh, or Epic Field is an augmentation of the kitchen with camera information. Again, so you're gonna get 671 videos reconstructed, which is not, not all the videos in Epic Kitchen because not all the videos worked, but it's the vast majority of them. And in total, you're gonna get your 90 million frames registered with all the benefits of Epic Kitchen annotations and uh, additional annotations have been collected through the years for this data set. But the Costati camera, as mentioned, was very hard. Uh, the reason is that uh, the videos are very long. They can be 30 minutes long and even more sometimes. So if you apply something off the shelf like Colmap, it's gonna struggle because of scale, but it's also gonna struggle because the videos are very unbalanced. You get hot spots of activity, for example, the place where you cut uh, your vegetables and this very rapid transition from one place to another. And if you don't do anything about that, then this is gonna confuse column up and structure for motion quite a bit. So the solution to that was essentially to devise a smart um, frame, in, frame down sampling scheme in which we select frames in a way which are not especially redundant any longer. So essentially we downsample less the hotspots and more the transition between them by comparison. And with that, we could reconstruct a large subset of the frames and then register all the others against the initial reconstruction. That's how we get our frames out, our reconstructions out. Next, I'm gonna show you a simple example of what you can do. This is, a, I'm gonna apply a neural, neural, neural um, radiance field model to interpret those videos. It's a special version though of that, which is called neural diff, which is designed specifically for understanding these egocentric videos where things are changing over time. So this is a model that has uh, three components. By the way, this is a still a relatively old work. This, we introduced that in 2021. So yeah, now we could do better probably. But this is consider this as a, as a good baseline, all right? Now, this has three components. The first one is a static uh, uh, radiance field, which is modeling the static background. This is just a regular nerve. Then you have a semi-static field here, which is a network that is like nerve, but has a time dependency, okay? And this time dependency allows that, allows this network to model changes that you observe during the video. And we use, we use this component to explain well, think of those as discrete state changes. So we call this a semi-static semi field because it's meant to capture uh, large changes that, uh, that, object, um, that affect objects over time in the, in the duration of the video. For example, moving a pan from place A to place B, all right? And then we have a dynamic component of that, which is modeling what is changing right now. So if uh, the actor is, um, the person doing the, cooking the food is moving a pan, that's considered dynamic because it's moving right now. It's not, it's not moving before or after you observe the motion in that particular frame of the video. And to model that, we also change the reference frame of going from a, a, reference frame, a reference frame, which is attached to the kitchen or to the word to into a reference frame, which is attached to the head of the person which is cooking the food, which makes more sense because of course the human body is not, well, it's just one piece and therefore it makes more sense to explain it in a reference frame, which is relative to the human body itself, okay? So with that, you can get results like those. So you see here to the left, the input video. In the middle, you see the same video reconstructed using NERF where we have frozen the viewpoint. Again, this is quite useful because it's easier to figure out the changes which are important because they're changing in the, in the world as opposed to just changes which are due to the moving camera, okay? And to the right here, you should see the semi-static layer, which ideally, of course, it's not perfect, but ideally should only highlight the sort of semi-static objects as they change over time. So you see here, for example, that a cap has been added and now it has gone because the person has moved away. So by looking at this stream of data in particular, it's more easy to understand how things are being changed in the kitchen, how the, the state of the kitchen or the food you're preparing is, is being updated over time. 
Okay, this you can do already with the extensions of NERF. And we define a bunch of benchmarks in uh, Epic Field. One of them is uh, the new synthesis benchmark. This is a proxy benchmark that allows to, asks you to try to reconstruct a frame in the video given as condition a, a number of other frames. We divide that in three tiers of difficulty. The easy one is called easy out of action. So here, there is nothing moving but the camera. Okay, that's called this, this is called out, out, out of action. And then you have frames um, all around the frames that you want to reconstruct in terms of um, uh, in term of so which, which you can use in order to determine what's, what's missing in between. So this is an interpolation task, which is relatively easy because the only thing that changes is the viewpoint and uh, you, have condition, you can condition your reconstruction of frames which are nearby. The medium case is the same, except that there is a larger gap, a couple of seconds in between the frames that you're allowed for reconstruction to observe for reconstruction the frame you want to predict. So now you need to get better at interpolating viewpoint. And then there is the hardest case, which is called heart inaction, in which, which is the same as before, but now you can see stuff changing during that, that little window. For example, a person moving a pan around. So this is much harder because now you also have to interpolate the motion of whatever is changing the scene, not just the camera. And here are some example results. Again, you can probably do better with state of the art methods these days, but it's still really very hard, a very hard problem to solve, at least for what concerns the dynamic component of the scene. So as you can see here the ground truth, and you can see here reconstruction by different methods. Near Deep here is the most specialized method for this task, and it tends to work a bit better. For example, here there should be no bread on the on the on the plate, but near Nerf W, which is a variant of Nerf that is able to capture changes in the scene actually doesn't capture that correctly and your relief does, okay? But the most interesting case is probably this one of unsupervised dynamic segmentation. So in this task, the goal is literally to take the video and to be able to label each pixel as being part of the static background or being part of a semi-static object, something that's moved at some point in the video, although maybe not right now, and then uh, as part of a dynamic object, some, something that which is being observed moving right at this spot in time, okay? There's no, there are no provided human labels here. So you only get the video and the goal is to come up with a method that can perform the segmentation automatically. And now we can compare doing that using a three-dimensional based method like uh, neural dev or an off-the-shelf unsupervised video segmentation system like motion grouping here, okay? Now the important message here is that this works very well uh, when you base this on the reconstruction for the for the background, if you like, for the static part of the, of, uh, of the reconstruction as well as for the semi-static one. But in what doesn't work quite as well as using a 2D-based segmentation system when for, for, uh, for, for the dynamic part, for example, for segmenting the arm of the person, okay? It's not hopeless, but it's not quite as good. Now, this is an important message because it shows that, yes, 3D understanding can benefit egocentric videos. I think this is pretty obvious. And uh, we have already done a lot of progress as a community toward the goal of actually exploiting these potential benefits. But it does, this doesn't work yet uh, all across the board. In particular, modeling dynamic objects in 3D, like a person moving or manipulating objects, is still beyond what uh, neural rendering field can actually do effectively these days. So this is where a lot of research can be done. Um, and so this data set, this epic field data set, is an invitation, if you like, to the community to actually try to get uh, to get uh, get going with it, okay? Now, in the remaining part of the talk, I would like to discuss yet again another data set that we are introducing this year. This one is from Meta, okay? And it's called Replay. This is a data set we have originally collected for the problem of recording a memory, for example, a family event like those you can see here in the videos, or, yeah, something like that anyway, and then being able to play that back into a mixed device, a virtual reality or mixed reality device, all right? So what we, what we have here is a collection of, that we'll be releasing to the public, at least, is a collection of 68 scenes. Each scene lasts for about 130 seconds. And we have, the scenes contain these acted um, episodes, and there we have 42 different actors of diverse, diverse demo, um, demographics. Now this data is collected by a bunch of sensors, by a number of sensors. So we have eight fixed cameras, just like DSLRs all around the scene. And then we have also three head-mounted GoPros. The idea here is to simulate what you might be able to record if you were to use uh, some uh, augmented reality device, all right? 
And that's also why this is relevant to this workshop because we do also have ecocentric streams of data that, come, that go with all the other cameras as well. And we also have a bunch of acoustic sensors, basically microphones that we're going to discuss in some detail later. So here's uh, some samples of the different sensors as you collect them. You see that we have the GoPros here and we have the DSLR cameras. And we also have a head a silly mounted camera that captures the scene as a whole. Now you can, you can see that the, the DSLR cameras, they tend to be a bit grainy. Uh, it's actually not the case. It's a very high quality footage, but we are compressing uh, the, this HDR videos to avoid losing information. And when you do this compression in, the, in this version of uh, the, the way these are rendered these videos, they look like they're grayish, but actually they're not. You can convert them back into some bright and vivid colors if you want to, more similar to what you see here in the GoPros. This data is completely synchronized. It means we synchronize uh, with respect to time. It's synchronized with respect to viewpoint for which we use a, com a combination of a uh, calibration object, including a digital clipper, as well as a uh, uh, distraction from motion, something like Colmap or Colmap in fact, specifically. We also have color calibration. So the sensors, as you can expect, they're very diverse. GoPros and DSLRs are completely different, really, especially in the way they treat colors. So we have done uh, quite a bit of work on aligning the color spaces. So you can see here that after calibration, they look very, very similar, which is very important if you want to use this for benchmarking. As, as I mentioned, if you want to get bright colors back, you can. It's just, just some detail of visualization, really. We provide masks. So there is a lot of clutter in these scenes because, of course, there are people doing the recording as well as cameras on tripods. But uh, we have masks from all the cameras on the views, so you can focus your attention on the part of the scene that you want to actually reconstruct and or analyze. Okay. And these are the provider for all the cameras and for all the benchmark scenes. Speaking of benchmarks, we define two benchmarks. The first one is very similar to what we have done for Epic Kitchen. This is an ecocentric video benchmark. Sorry, new synthesis benchmark, in which the goal is to reconstruct the video frames uh, given others in the video. And we have two. Uh, flavors for that, fly around phase and acting phase. The fly around phase is an initial phase in which uh, the eccentric camera goes around the scene and captures the actors while they're just freezing, frozen in time, all right? So that's quite easy because there is no motion in the scene. So that uh, works very well for Nerf. And you can see here some examples of that reconstruction. And then we have an acted phase in which the actors are actually doing their thing and that's much harder to reconstruct. Okay, this is quite challenging. Again, okay, dynamics is challenging. But this data set, which is actually rather unique, is also multimodal. So in particular, is, uh, we have microphones attached to the scene, to the cameras. So this is what you get. Studying? No, she's studying. She's trying to study criminology. Whoa. Yeah. But that's super different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because she's like really, like, we're both like really into true crime, but she's like more. Okay, so what you can see here, not only that the viewpoint changes, but also what you hear. I hope that was clear enough in the auditorium. What you hear is also very different. So if you want to be to do good new view synthesis, you also should also take care of the audio as well. So we are looking at this problem and uh, hopefully, okay. So we have a paper here at CVPR on the new view acoustic synthesis that I invite you to, uh, to look at if you're interested. The goal is similar to new view synthesis, but it's done for audio. So here you get both the vision and the audio as input and through a network, which is very similar to WaveNet, we condition on, on the visual modal modality as well your goal is to synthesize the audio from a, as captured by a different microphone in a different place in the room. Here's so just some examples to show you how this works. So on the left, we have the source video. And then we have the ground truth recording from a different viewpoint. And then here's another example. So source. Heads on target right. Heads on and prediction. Right. Heads on I don't know whether this was easy to, to listen to in the auditorium, but this is to say that it works fairly well for what it is. Okay, so as an initial baby steps in a way, but it's already kind of encouraging. Final thing, there are, we have quite a few more papers on three reconstruction, three generation, etc. here at CPR. One which could be particularly relevant to this workshop is uh, stereo stereo from videos. If you have an egocentric sensor, which is a stereo camera, then you probably want to use that for the reconstruction. And now we have the opportunity of doing stereo, but on a video. So now we have a network now that can take advantage of that to get uh, disparity results in a very, very stable manner. And then you can just project them back in 3D and you're gonna get pretty, pretty decent reconstructions. 
if you want to try um, uh, the Oculus Pro Go at the poster here, we're going to try to show you this reconstruction on device as well. Okay, so that's going to be just fun. Not very important scientifically, but just fun. All right, these are my takeaways then. So the first one is geometry and learning. This is coming uh, and it's going to be very useful in my view for understanding um, egocentric videos. But there is this bottleneck of the modeling dynamic content, which is uh, still there. So we need to do more work as a community on modeling dynamic content for the And for this purpose, we have introduced here two data sets. One is Epic Fields, which is this extension of Epic Kitchen with cameras. And then the, also the replay data sets, which is the all brand new data set of acted scenes in apartments uh, that also have multiple cameras, all registered, as well as the audio modality, if you're interested in exploring that uh, aspect of the problem as well. All right, thank you very much. And I think maybe I have one or two minutes for questions. Which I cannot hear. Sorry, she can you hear? hear us now. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can, I can actually, yes. Okay, question from the audience. Just a point of view, um, just a question as a community, how we can um, try to uh, to do more uh, on this context, uh, how, which is the role of uh, egocentric vision in, in computer vision now for, from your point of view? Um, th those data sets are enough, we need more. Uh, are we able to work to, to push vision, not only in, in first person vision, but first, first, first person vision can give us uh, more information to other kinds of stuff like, like robotics and so on and so forth, which is your point of view. Since this is a forum, uh, this is the main forum, uh, Epic and mm -hmm. Ego4D for our community, and this community is growing, which is your view for the future? Well, it's, it's a very interesting question, very open-ended as well. So um, I do think that egocentric data, data is quite interesting. Um, that in part it may depend on how popular this egocentric device will become, become in the future. We think uh, also in meta, of course, that they will become very important. So in that sense, we're going to get more and more of this data, which is going to just make it more and more important because of the relevance of that to applications and the consumer user cases. Okay. Having said that, we already have lots of egocentric data recorded. For example, I mean, I showed you Epic Kitchen here, but of course, there's also Ego4D, which is you know, even larger, much larger, I guess. So it would be really nice if this data set would be augmented in a similar way to uh, what we've done here with Epic Field with, for example, camera information. I might think this is uh, not a lot, but actually it is because if you think about NERF and how the way is exploded, um, it was because again, it allowed the community to work combined geometry machine learning. But one, one reason was because they had this idea of modeling 3D with a, with a neural network, right? But the other reason is that they framed this in a setup in which you have the images and you also have the cameras, okay? And getting the cameras is actually very hard usually because it requires photogrammetry or you know, structure for motion which in its own right is a very difficult task. So you don't see that in Nerf at all, but it's there. Someone else has done that for you, either because it is synthetic or because someone has run karma for you, which is what we do here and what, some, what someone should be, also, should be do also for, should also do for Ego4D. And uh, uh, this can really simplify uh, getting started on these kind of problems. So I think, if someone were to, for example, augment ego for the with the cameras, that would create another data sets, which would be quite useful for the community to engage in these sort of tasks. It can be as simple as that. And of course, when we collect future data set, it would be nice to consider the problem of 3D reconstruction as well during the, during the collection of data. So it would, these, these problems, this reconstruction problem would become easier or at least easier to study. Thank you. Thank you for your point of view. Uh, other questions? Yeah, one, one here. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so here, the, all the 3D reconstruction is done offline. Um, but if you imagine going to a new environment, you're going to want to do it online. How far away yeah. do you think that is? And do you think we should just kind of ignore that for now, work on these 3D ones, and then assume it will be solved? Um, I guess I have uh, two possible answers to that. Um, first of all, I think we're going to be fast enough eventually. 
and you can already see that uh, the, the speed of uh, neural reconstruction has, be, has been increasing by leaps and bounds. Um, you know, now nerve is maybe at least an order or maybe two orders of money to the faster than it was in the, originally, at least certain versions of nerve. Okay, so this will continue probably. And so we'll become more able to do the uh, dense three reconstructions over time. Having said that, it's also possible to consider a scenario in which you first do a reconstruction. Um, and once you are done the reconstruction, then you have uh, your egocentric device roaming around. For instance, you can acquire first your home, your apartment. Maybe that's going to be a bit slow and done offline. And once you have done it, then uh, you know, the day-to-day -day activities and usage of your device in this environment, which is pre-reconstructed, is not going to be quite as uh, as intensive in terms of of computational cost. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, thank you for the talk. I think it's a, maybe a related question. Uh, how would this deal with um, changing environments? So maybe it's not at the case of kitchens, but think of moving furniture or installing new things. And I wonder if, since there is, uh, I think you use like Happy Kitchens uh, 100, which has both the old and new data, if reconstructing a model with the old data, um, then how it works, um, tracking cameras with the new data, same kitchen, maybe something changed. Um, so, first of all, we do have recording of the same kitchen, uh, multiple pieces in the same environment over time, it's even in the Epic Kitchen version we have used. So things can change between sessions. At the moment, we didn't quite work out um, the problem of aligning all these scenes together between episodes, although we have considered that. I do think it's completely possible, to be honest, um, because the majority of the geometry will not change. Okay. Now, having said that, modeling what changed at the level of, you know, here's a new chair, or we have moved this, you know, piece of furniture somewhere else, that is very interesting. Uh, as I said, we're not very good at modeling changes yet. We have done some baby steps in that direction, but it's a bit of an open question. Other questions? If not, uh, let's thank thanks again, Andrea. Thank you for joining the workshop, opening with your first keynote. And uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Bye bye. <clears throat> so now we are going to the next section, the, the first section of the Ego Foodie. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the first session of Ego 4D 2023 Challenges. So uh, this year, the challenge ran from uh, March 1st to March uh, to May 19th and comprised of 14 tracks. This also included two, two new tracks that were added uh, as part of the episodic memory benchmark this year. Uh, for this year, the challenge ran on the V2 release of Ego 4D, which added new data for some of the tracks. Uh, however, I can't see the slide. Okay. Uh, 
might just need to re reshare. The screen sharing is paused. Yeah, I think just maybe just try stopping sharing and starting again. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the challenge this year ran on the V2 release of Ego 4D, uh, which added new data for some of the tracks. However, the test set remained the same as previous year. And like previous editions, we also provide cash prize for the top three winners in each track. In the ECCB 22 edition, uh, the challenge consisted of 16 tracks across four benchmarks. This year, we selected 12 out of those 16, try to reduce the number of tracks that we have across the benchmarks. But we also added two new tracks covering long-term object tracking and zero-shot image instance retrieval. Now, before we dive into the details of this year's edition, uh, let's do a quick recap of all the individual tracks. As we know, the first benchmark is episodic memory which is centered around understanding the first person's visual experience in the past. Now, this includes localizing object instances in 2D and 3D using visual queries as input or generating answers to natural language queries by looking at video frames in the past. We also have a task that involves localizing all the moments in the video with a specific action category. And coming up onto the new tracks, this year, we added two new challenges, as I mentioned previously. First one is known as Ego Tracks. Now, this challenge introduces a data set for long term visual object tracking in first person videos. Now, this data set contains really long object tracks with significant gaps in between when the object just completely disappears. This is a very challenging tracking problem where you have to, you might not see objects for minutes and then it reappears. And so making progress on this specific task will enable us to improve performance on other Ego 4D challenges as well. Finally, in episodic memory, we have this new challenge called Paco Zero Shot Challenge. Now in this task, the input is a natural language query describing the object of interest. And the goal is to localize this specific unique instance within a sad set of images consisting of a single relevant image and several distractor images. So for example, in this case, the query can be a blender with a white base. And so you have a collection of images. A lot of them actually contains blender, but the goal is to rec uh, localize this specific instance in presence of other distractor images. Moving on to the benchmarks that are centered around understanding the present, we have hands in objects, which are designed to understand hand object manipulation, Audiovisual tasks, which involves localizing speakers both in space and time, and also transcribing what they say. And finally, we have the social interaction tasks, which aim to understand when each speaker is looking or talking to the camera wearer. And finally, the last benchmark aims at predicting future behavior for the user, both in short term and as well as long term. Now, let's deep dive into the participation and results for this year's challenge. This year, a total of 62 unique teams submitted 68 different methods in 14 challenges. This means that we have a 3x growth in the number of teams participating and 1.4x growth in the number of methods submitted compared to ECCV. Now, this is great news and demonstrates that the interest in Ego 4D challenges is growing really fast. If we break it down by each benchmark, we see that the episodic memory is most popular. We also see participation double in three out of four benchmarks this year. Hands-on objects turned out to be less popular this year for some reason. We can also look at the same data 
per task. And we see that the highest participation is in NLQ. We had 17 methods submitted for NLQ, talking to me, long-term anticipation, and moment queries. In terms of growth, NLQ and talking to me saw 4x increase, and long-term anticipation and looking at me saw 2x increase. Uh, the new challenges, which were live only for the short two and a half month period, are starting to see interest. Now, hopefully, we see these challenges pick up significantly in the next edition. Another interesting trend that we saw this year is that it is becoming increasingly difficult to beat baselines or previous year winners. Only 62% of the submitted methods could outperform the winners or baselines compared to ECCB where 93% of the methods outperformed baselines. They saw that we are making solid progress on these tasks and it's becoming increasingly hard to beat the current state of the art methods. Interestingly, we also saw a gap between challenge participation and number of validation reports we got. This has to do with the number of teams which would actually beat the baselines, but we still had a couple of winners who did not submit the report even when they were in top three in the leaderboard and probably need to do more outreach to make sure that we get reports from more people. Looking at the trends between industry and academic teams, we saw that the participation from academic team continues to remain strong, accounting for more than 85% participation. Uh, and this really cool trend that we saw that in previous edition, we had this trend of super teams where two teams accounted for more than 50% of the prizes. This year, we changed this completely and only a single team won two prizes and rest all the winners were unique. So this is really nice to see that we have more diverse participations across different tasks. Finally, we look at the gains per benchmark. This year, VQ3D was an outlier. We had like 238% relative improvement in VQ3D. Really, really solid improvement on this. But we also saw pretty good benchmark uh, improvements in episodic memory and AV social benchmarks. Forecasting continues to remain a very challenging problem, essentially. And the individual benchmark talks will cover these trends in more detail. Now, before I conclude, I wanted to highlight some common trends that we have observed across various methods. First, as previous years, pre-trained, uh, well-trained uh, well, well, well feature backbones continue to have major impact. We saw winners leveraging multi-scale, multi-modal feature backbones, and especially fusing features from various backbones seems to help a lot. Another trend that we saw was adaptive weighting of features. What this means is that instead of just fusing features from all the frames, we saw teams identifying frames which are relevant to the task or are better quality and doing some sort of adaptive fusion that seems to help a lot with the performance. And finally, as with everything else, large language models are starting to have an impact on Ego4D as well. Uh, we saw teams combining image and video captioning models to generate inputs for LLMs and then use prop engineering to generate task output as responses. This is an interesting new direction and we probably will see more of this, you know, going forward. Now, before I hand it over to Santosh, uh, I want to thank all the Ego4D users, challenge participants and organizers. Uh, in this session, we will have three individual benchmark talks. Uh, before we conclude this session. And in the next session, we'll have the spotlight talks and a prize ceremony. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Santosh uh, and I'm very happy to present the results of the episodic memory challenge. Uh, the broad motivation of episodic memory is to augment human memory with the ability to query about their past and therefore enable superhuman memory. Uh, in this context, we have three different types of queries that we consider. Natural language queries with uh, natural language questions as the input, moment queries with high-level even classes, and visual queries with a visual crop of the, uh, of the target object. Let us look at natural language queries first. Here, the goal is to search for responses to natural language queries. The input is a long-form egocentric video and the natural language query is issued at the end of the video. The goal is for a system to go back in time and identify the part of the video that contains the response to this query. 
the query could be either, you know, uh, bad really my keys, did I add salt and so on. Here's an example of, uh, uh, excuse me. Um, is it playing? Um, ah, okay, great. Um, so the uh, here's an example of the task. Um, clearly, as you can see, um, the challenges involve uh, multimodal reasoning, long form media understanding, and this is a needle in the haystack problem since the response to your query might, might be as small as five seconds, but the entire video itself could be as long as eight minutes. We evaluate the performance on this task using the mean recall at K metrics. The baseline for this uh, year's challenge was the uh, narrations as uh, queries or data augmentation combined with the Reller architecture from a previous uh, year's entry. Uh, here, the key idea was to use uh, um, large scale narrations data as additional supervision to train episodic memory models. This year's winner for the NLQ challenge is the ground NLQ method. The key ideas in this method was to use multi-scale multimodal transformer, leverage uh, state-of-the-art features from previous entries, and also use the NAQ data augmentation to improve the performance. Congrats to the winners. Uh, a quick shout out to the uh, runner-ups. The first runner-up was the ASL team. Here they proposed to use action sensitivity learning to weight the importance of each frame to predict the action. They also combine uh, features from previous year's entries to obtain good performance. The second runner up was the MZS snag team. The key idea here was uh, to use large language models to predict co screen localization. Basically given a video, they convert it into the form of text and then generate prompts that can uh, obtain course localizations of the responses, and then refine this further using the video. Uh, when compared to the baseline results that we introduced this time, the uh, submission entries made steady progress and the winning entry obtained a significant gain of four to 5% on the two metrics. In conclusion, the key ideas that uh, we saw this year was to use action sensitivity to weight the contribution of each frame, leverage multi-scale multimodal transformers, and to fuse video features uh, uh, from previous year's winning entries, which sees continuous success. Moreover, we had a new data augmentation technique that was beneficial for several methods. In the future, we hope there'll be more methods that can incorporate more object-centric features and leverage large-scale LLMs to help localization. Let us move on to the moment queries. The goal in the MQ task is to search for commonly occurring activities in egocentric videos, uh, given a video clip and a moment activity category like stir food while cooking or cut the dough. The goal is to output uh, temporal localizations of this activity, these activities throughout the video. Here's an example of this uh, task for uh, the activity class full clothes. Overall, the data set contains around 110 moment classes, such as converse, use phone, take out food, and so on. We evaluate the performance using the average MAP metric and the recall at one. The baseline for this year uh, uses the action former uh, architecture, which was introduced in a previous year's challenge entry. Here, the baseline combines the action former architecture with uh, state-of-the-art features from this video intern method, which won some challenges last year. The winning entry of the moment query challenge was the action sensitivity learning team. As I mentioned in the NLQ problem, these method, this method uses the uh, action sensitivity to measure the importance of each frame for both localization and classification. They further used a multi-scale transformer and combined several uh, features from previous years to obtain the winning entry. Congrats to the winning team. A quick shout out to the runner up. This was the NMS threshold matters for ego 4 d moment queries team. The key idea here was to adapt a dynamic label assignment strategy and to tune the hyperparameters for the soft NMS method to improve the performance. When compared to our baseline entry, the winning entry made significant progress of 6% absolute improvement in the mean AP metric. 
In conclusion, the key ideas for the moment query challenge this year was to fuse features extracted from different backbones. This was similar to the natural language queries. Moreover, the smart frame selection method uh, to target both classification and detection work for both NLQ and MQ. And we are seeing a progress in more generic models that can target multiple tasks. In the future, we hope to see more methods that can perform end-to-end -end training of the backbone and the detector and to further unify the models for each of these tasks. Let us move on to Visual Query 2D localization. The goal in the VQ2D task is to search for a visually specified query object in the video. In particular, given a long-form egocentric video and a query post at some point in the video and the queries of the form, when or where did I last see this object and the object is specified by a visual crop. The goal is to go back in time and identify the most recent occurrence of this object in the video. The output is in the form of a contiguous sequence of uh, bounding boxes. Uh, as you can see in this example, um, the, this is a quite a challenging setting for uh, object localization, since the object in the video might appear in variable viewpoints, might have motion blur, or may even appear at a distance and uh, be appear very small. We evaluate the performance on this task using the spatio-temporal AP, temporal AP, success percentage and recall percentage metrics. The baseline that we employed this year was a three-stage detection plus tracking approach. First, it performs frame-level object detection to identify candidate proposals for the query object in each video frame. It then performs temporal peak detection to identify the most recent occurrence of the object and then performs tracking around the peak to identify the rest of the uh, appearance. This year's winning entry was the single stage visual query localization method. This method proposes a novel end-to-end -end trainable architecture for visual queries by performing uh, spatio-temporal correspondences and then jointly predicting bounding boxes for the entire video at the same time. Congrats to the winners. We, we observed substantial improvement for the winning entry compared to the baseline across all the metrics. Moreover, we analyze the challenge uh, results based on two different axes. One, uh, does the object appear prominently in the video? And the other, does the object appear for long enough in the video? When the object appears prominently, the task becomes significantly easier, and we see that the winning entry makes substantial progress in this easier case. But the winning entry does not improve in the harder case where the object appears uh, very small in the video. And this has scope for improvement in the future. Similarly, when the object appears for sufficiently long, it is again an easier case. And the baseline, um, the winning entry makes substantial progress in that case. But when the object appears for less than two seconds, it becomes much more challenging. And you can see that the progress has not been made yet. In conclusion, the VQ2D challenge had a novel end-to-end -end trainable architecture for visual queries for the first time. But this method continues to, um, uh, uh, you know, fails to address the challenges of the object appearing small or at a distance and for the object appearing for a very short duration. In the future, we hope to uh, see more, more methods that can overcome these challenges and the challenge of the lack of training data for this task. Moreover, uh, we hope to see methods like uh, uh, foundation models like SAM to be used for instance segmentation. Let us move on to Visual Queries 3D localization. Unlike the 2D localization version of this task, the 3D localization version of the task uh, goes one step further and tries to localize the object not just in the video, but also in a 3D scan that is associated with that particular video. The goal here is to output a 3D displacement vector specifying where in the 3D scene was the object last seen. Here's an example of this task. In the center, I'm showing the response track in the video and you can see the object uh, in terms of 2D bonding boxes. And in the right, you can see the 3D bonding box in the 3D scan. And this is a challenging problem. And we evaluate the performance using several metrics like overall success, success when the uh, when each frame is correctly uh, localized, 
uh, L2 error, Angular error, and the, also measure the number of queries that have associated poses. For the baseline, we use the visual queries 2D localization method to generate the response tracks within the video. We then estimate the camera poses for these frames uh, by comparing it with the 3D scan, perform depth estimation, and then obtain the 3D prediction. The winning entry for the Visual Queries 3D localization challenge was the EcoLock team. This method adapts and improves over the previous year's winner, where they improve the uh, camera pose estimates for each frame and also aggregate the detections over multiple views to obtain more robust estimates. This year, we saw significant improvement uh, from the winning entry on the number of uh, camera frames that are correctly localized in the 3D scan, and this led to significant successes across the board. In conclusion, the winning entry uh, improved the uh, state of the art for the Visual Queries 3D localization challenge by obtaining a better camera pose estimates for the video and also aggregating the detections in the egocentric video. We still continue to have challenges like uh, uh, frames with missing camera poses and frames with low quality depth estimates, which pose challenges for the future. Therefore, in the future, we hope that there can be more methods addressing these challenges and also enabling uh, interesting 3D reconstruction and 3D de detection methods. Let us move on to the ego tracks challenge. This was a newly introduced challenge this year, where the goal is to perform long-term long visual object tracking in the context of egocentric videos. This is a unique challenge since the object may appear for very short durations in the video, but may also disappear for several minutes at a time and have to be relocalized again. Moreover, there are the egocentric challenges of uh, frequent occlusions, uh, motion blurs, and so on, making this a challenging task. The EgoTrax dataset, which was introduced for this benchmark, is uh, an order of magnitude larger than the past visual object tracking uh, datasets for the long term case and has significantly more uh, object appearances and disappearances in the video when compared to prior datasets. On average, each video is around six minutes long, and we evaluate the performance metric using the tracking F score. The winning entry for the Ego Tracks challenges was the ABCCBA team from University of Tokyo and Shanghai AI. The key idea here was to uh, perform a long term weighted bonding box fusion and ensembling of several methods to improve the detection of object visibility. Congrats to the winning entry. The winning entry this time beats the baseline by 1.7% uh, on the tracking F score. But in the future, we hope to see even more improvements given that this was the first year this challenge was introduced. <clears throat> Let us move on to the Paco Zero Shot Instance Detection Challenge. This was also a newly introduced challenge this year. The key idea here is to given a set of uh, uh, images, one positive and several negative, and a natural language query describing an object. The goal is to now identify the image that contains this uh, object described by the natural language query and to reject all the distractor frames. And in the positive image, the goal is to also identify the bonding box of where the object is appearing. The motivation here is to um, recognize personal objects and query about them via natural language queries. And unlike the visual queries task, uh, instead of specifying an actual image crop of what object you're describing, you can just describe it with a natural language. Uh, the Paco zero shot dataset itself contains queries of different forms, depending on the number of uh, uh, attributes associated with that particular object. Uh, and for each uh, sample, there is one positive and 100 negatives, some of which are hard negatives. And therefore, this dataset is also suitable for zero shot, uh, zero shot performance evaluation of uh, image text models that are trained on large scale datasets. The performance is evaluated using the recall at K metrics for ranking. The baseline entry for this challenge uh, was to train our detection model to detect objects 
parts of objects and their attributes, and then fuse these predictions to obtain the final scores. The winning entry for this challenge was the Lenovo SJTU team. The key idea of this uh, method was to use ensembling to improve the performance and also to um, combine the predictions with two variants of a VIT model to use for attribute predictions. The winning entry improved the performance by 1.3 uh, absolute points in the, in the primary metric. But clearly, you can see that this is a very challenging problem, and we hope to see even more participation in the future. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Mike Shaw from National University of Singapore. And happy to be here to share with you about the um, result from our winners on audio, visual, and social benchmarks. So the first challenge we have in the audio, visual check is the diarization. So the idea is that in this given video captured by the camera wielder, uh, we are trying to identify basically localize the uh, face of each uh, speaker and then associate the voice to each speaker. So you can see that uh, actually here we have four speakers and then also the, in the last row is the uh, camera viewer. And we're trying to map in the uh, speech segments with each uh, identity. And the metric we use here is the uh, conventional diarization rate error rate, DER. So the uh, winner is from Intel uh, Labs. Congratulations to the team. So the... Uh, Results has been improved from 66 to 61 this year. And the idea of the method is essentially to join in modeling all the speakers in this scene, including the camera wielders, which uh, the show is actually uh, make a significant improvement. And they, uh, most specifically, they construct a spatial temporal homogeneous graph where basically each node in the graph represents the speaker and the age captures the spatial temporal interaction between them. Uh, and, and then finally, they just need to formulate the speaker detection problem as a binary node classification task. Basically, in the graph neural network, each node um, has to be classified as uh, the uh, uh, speaker or not speaking. And another challenge we have in this audio visual chat is the uh, transcription. Uh, so Essentially, the idea is to transcribe the uh, speech of each speaker, and this is a conventional task, and the metric is the word error rate, W-E-R. And the winner is from uh, Oxford. Uh, congratulations to the team. Uh, so the idea of the master is essentially to first do voice activity detection, VAD, and then followed by Khan and Merz's technologies to handle long-form videos. And then they use the uh, whisper library to do transcription and then followed by some text normalization on the uh, output. And they consider there are some future words that to basically um, liberate the visual string and the multilingual model as well. And the results has been improved from 68 something uh, from last year and to this year, 56% uh, WER. So that's quite significant, I think. So that's for the audiovisual uh, check and for the social check, uh, the first task we are trying to do is about whether the person uh, in the uh, video stream is talking to me or uh, is looking at me or not. So uh, this, this, uh, this task is basically kind of like um, uh, more high level and we are trying to analyze the interaction between the camera wielder and the person in the uh, type basically captured by the camera. And the social challenges are uh, essentially binary classification tasks. So we used to commonly use the relation matrix average precision AP and uh, accuracy ACC. And the average precision considers the um, confidence score for each phase and used as the primary metric in these two challenges. So the champion master for this year's Look at Me challenge is from uh, Xinyu. Uh, and from 
Peking University. So they achieved state of art result for looking at me. Congratulations to the team. And let me introduce more details of their method. So this uh, solution is called gates post. Essentially, it employs uh, prior from post rated information to improve eye contact recognition for looking at me detection. Their framework is based on the transform architecture. It uses the spatial face features, head pose, and landmarks to assist the LAM recognition. In addition, the first person viewpoint usually suffers from motion blur, so they also develop a temporal refinement module to select the high quality, clear uh, frames to enhance the temporal features of a given video snippet. And here is the uh, operation study, and it shows that the uh, effect effectiveness of the spatial and temporal information for LAM task, when the spatial temporal information are used, they can actually achieve the uh, best result. And the state of run method, this one it improves uh, the baseline method by uh, almost like 20% for AP and 24% for uh, accuracy. And uh, here comes the second best solution for talking ME challenge. Uh, congratulations to Jensi and uh, and Duan. So they introduced a double model ensemble technology to explore the correlation between talking to me and looking at me task. So uh, next one is the uh, champion of this year, uh, talking to me challenge. Uh, congratulations to uh, National, Univers uh, National Taiwan University and NVIDIA. So this uh, champion solution is essentially designed a uh, quality aware audio visual fusion framework. And it achieves the uh, state of our result by leveraging a powerful pre-chain speech recognition model whisper. And it's the, actually the first method to further explore the semantic lexical uh, meaning of the audio strings. It shows that such like understanding of the dialogue content is actually very important for talking to me task. And here is the uh, comparisons between the uh, two top submissions and our baseline method. The Stevra approach actually improves against the baseline by 24% for um, AP and 7.4 gain for uh, accuracy. And this is the uh, most significant improvement we have seen ever in over the past few years. And here are uh, some quick takeaways we can get from these uh, two challenges. So first of all, um, first the person perspective is certainly challenges, like especially due to the uh, mo mo uh, motion blur. Um, so we can see that actually nearly all of these solutions, they choose to adopt the quality of wave fusion technology to elevate this uh, you know, motion blur, uh, low quality issue. And also talking to me is relatively more challenging task in this context. And but uh, remember it's uh, actually uh, not only single model just use the audio, but actually it's a multi-model task that we can uh, further uh, understanding the lexical meaning of the uh, content. So this year, uh, actually the solution shows that the kind of like semantic lexical understanding of the utterance is actually quite helpful for talking to me task. Uh, but yes, still, still there exists more improvement room. Um, I think that for us to further working on that in the uh, in this in this talking to me task. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, for audio wish and uh, social checks. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Francesco Ragusa from University of Catania and I am the POC for the short term object interaction anticipation challenge. So given a video V and a timestamp T methods are required to process the video to predict the future interaction after, which will start after a time interval delta. Prediction are composed of bounding boxes around the object which will be active in the future interaction, the nouns associated to these objects, a verb which describes the future interaction, and a time to contact, which is a real number, which indicates when the future interaction will start. 
and then a score. So we evaluated this method with a top five mean average precision related to nouns, nouns plus verbs, noun plus time to contact, and the noun plus verbs plus time to contact, which we named overall. So the top five mean average precision discounts up to four false positive for ground truth box. For example, in this case, we have a ground truth box in red and two predictions. One, uh, one is a true positive and one is a false positive if we evaluated this, this prediction with a, a standard mean average precision. But if we use the top five mean average precision in the same example, we have only a true positive. The baseline for this challenge is still fast. This method is able to process simultaneously two inputs, a high resolution image and a low resolution video. These are sent to related backbones, 2D and 3D, to obtain the, the 2D feature stack and 3D feature stack. Then these stacks are fused and sent in a future pyramid layer to obtain a combined feature pyramid. This combined feature pyramid are then sent to our head which is composed of a region proposal networks and a royal line layer, which extract local feature from these region proposals. Then global feature are concatenated to these local features. And, we, and then we sum it again, local features with a residual connection. The last layer is able then to predict the probability distribution from nouns for verbs and the time to contact. These are some qualitative results, which we can see the red bounding box, which is the ground truth, and the green bounding boxes, which are related to the predictions. And the leaderboard, the leaderboard shows that there is a winning team, uh, congratulations, which outperformed our baseline with a small gap, considering the overall top five mean average precision. And uh, in general, uh, these methods outperformed our baseline uh, related to it. So considering the nouns, the verbs, and the overall. In particular, we can see an, uh, an improvement on nouns of 0.61 for the verbs of 0.31, but this method uh, performed worse respect to our method with respect to the top five mean average precision time to contact. And the main characteristics of this uh, submission is that uh, the method is built on our baseline still fast, and they use object and mendix extracted for each sample video frame. And then they added a guide attention mechanism applied on the fast branch. So there is still open challenges for this task. So there is still a large gap uh, between noun and noun plus verb. The performance drops when we added, uh, when we added verb predictions from 25 Point sixty-seven to thirty point sixty, and also this uh, this behavior is uh, visible also when we had time to contact predictions. Overall results are still low. We have uh, so the, this new meters which won the challenge that obtain uh, five point sixteen, uh, considering the overall top five mean average precision, and the improvement over the baseline still fast is uh, uh, very small. In general, methods seem to skew. Uh, towards object detection, while a verb and time to contact anticipation still need more exploration. So thank you. All right, I'm Tashar Nagarajan, I'm the PUC for LTA. And so the task is a little bit different than short-term anticipation. Over here, given a video uh, that's input up to a certain time t, the task is to now predict the next set of actions or the next sequence of actions in the right order. This involves predicting both the verb and the noun. Uh, and of course, this is a pretty ambiguous task. Um, you, you can't predict the future very well uh, for very long durations. And so our evaluation metrics sort of account for this in some sense. These are edit distance based. So we allow some sort of like permutation um, or the metric accounts for some sort of rearrangement of the actions. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, and it's, yeah, it's accounted for in the metric as well. So this year we had three uh, approaches outperform the baseline that we had. Congratulations to all three teams. Um, and overall, if you look at uh, what, what this looked like, the performance, uh, as you know, we had um, these baselines trained on the new data, uh, V2 data that's collected on Ego 4D. And uh, point number one is just how, how far can you get with more scale? And I think uh, 
uh, we, we saw like improvements of about 2% with just training the same baselines over um, new existing data. But I think what's encouraging is that the new sets of winners uh, went even further than this. And so there is more to be gained than just, um, these aren't just re existing uh, sort of approaches reapplied to, to a larger volume of data. There's a lot to be gained um, from these approaches as well. And so I've summarized the key takeaways from these, these approaches in these slides. Um, the first is that verbs and nouns sort of require this individual special treatment. And we've seen this as a recurring theme in previous uh, previous benchmarks, previous methods, uh, where some backbones like clip are just better for nouns, some backbones like slow fast are better for verbs. Um, and these baselines sort of, or these approaches sort of capitalize on that uh, notion as well. Um, the other important point that we noticed is there's the shift in how we're training these models as well. Um, the, the loss functions that people are starting to use are more aligned with the long-term forecasting task. So for example, the baseline is just predict trained as a classification task, predict the, the next action and it's that's it. Whereas uh, some of the newer approaches uh, take into account for the answer, take, take the uncertainty into account and adjust the loss functions by sort of smoothing the label space over time and saying, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna predict like, anything in that smooth distribution, and that's still gonna be valid. And then the other big takeaway is, here's like a formal welcome to large language models into the scene. We've seen this appear in various other, um, various other works, uh, ranging from like forecasting and procedural planning and so on. And so this year's winning entry featured large language models um, as, 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 as like a ca caption the video and then process the captions in a Socratic sort of way. Um, so yeah, formal welcome to LLMs. And so finally, I'll end with just some of the open challenges that still exist and that have been persisting through these uh, challenges so far. One is just how, how to model long-term temporal context. We've seen methods that just stack on a bunch of video features and hope that that works out. We've seen models pass these into individual chunks, convert these into labels or captions and pass these into uh, sequential models. But this still remains an open question about just what is the best way to do this. And then finally, the other open question that's going to be answered, my, my bet is just by the next edition of this uh, of this conference, is just how far can we get by scaling up these models uh, on the language side? So the winning entry was a 1.3 billion parameter model, which is still large, but put into context compared to the 70 billion parameter models out there, uh, is still relatively small. And so how much of this challenge of this predicting the future involves this prior of human understanding this capture in these large language models is yet to be explored. All right, yeah, that's about it, thank you. Okay, this concludes this first session. And uh, if, you, if you have questions from audience, uh, if there are some questions, curiosity, we have, uh, um, we can, you can send feedback on the challenges on, on the workshop, please email uh, the email over the consortium and uh, we'll take care about all, all your feedback It's very useful to improve uh, what we are doing, um, not only for the next workshop, but also for the next challenges as research. So uh, if there are no questions, uh, we will stop for the coffee break and uh, the next session will start um, just after coffee break will be 1045. All right. So anyway, uh, so I'd like to share uh, what we have done so far and uh, where, where we are going. Okay. So we interact with the, so many objects and people in daily life and, and, uh, Eagle 4D is uh, so interesting because it captures uh, unnatural, uh, natural and uh, unscripted activities of egocentric uh, from the egocentric viewpoint. And uh, for for me, what makes so excited about the Eagle 4D is to enable us to study the embodied uh, embodied AI. The definition of embodied AI is uh, to create the agent that can solve a problem by interacting with the environment, okay? I want to focus on the, uh, by interacting with the environment, which means that it has to be 3D. We have to perceive in 3D. We have to move in 3D. 
okay? Because we are interacting with object in three-dimensional space. So it's hard, hard to imagine that we can build an embodied AI with a two-dimensional representation. Okay? So we have to push this into three-dimensional space. Okay? So then what 3D representation do we have so far? Okay, so, uh, so computer vision system uh, uh, now enables to reconstruct the humans, uh, facial expressions, and then the render from the different viewpoints. So this is like our uh, previous work where we use the egocentric video and then reconstruct the human face and the render from the different viewpoints. Okay, this is a great work, uh, but the, to, with a little bit of exaggeration, to me, this is like, we are building model uh, floating on the space like astronaut. There's a no context in the scene. We reconstruct a human, but there's a no context. Every action that we take that associated with some context. So for instance, this person walking on the street, okay? And while talking to camera web, okay? So this is a context that we need to reconstruct all together, but that is completely ignorant on the, the previous work, okay? Another example. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, the camera localization uh, in, uh, with, uh, with ARIA glasses. Okay, this is amazing work. Now they reconstruct whole context. Okay, they reconstruct the static scenes and everything here that, but they uh, treat the, the uh, dynamic object as an outlier uh, because of fundamentals of structure from motion. Okay, to me, uh, this reminds me of abandoned cities in the Blade Runner. Right? It's like completely like a, we have full context, but there's like no such dynamic object in humans, which is most interesting thing about the scene. Okay? So we interact with the, our word. Okay, our word is rather dynamic and context dependent. Okay, there's a, a, the friends of uh, friends that uh, uh, drinking beers on the table. Okay, making a meal in the kitchen. There's a actions associated with the text, uh, context of the scene, okay? So this talk, I will uh, talk about a little bit about the, how to represent the egocentric videos in three-dimensional space to enable embodied AI, okay? So this is what I'm going to talk about this uh, talk. All right, so of course, we are not the first people who look into this problem, okay? In autonomous driving domain, uh, researchers have been developing representation for the, 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 the scenes like this. Uh, they, they come up with a 3D, uh, 3D geometry, depths and, and surface normal, and even the 3D uh, semantic. This is not like a two-dimensional semantic. This is a three-dimensional semantic. They have the, the 3D bounding box associated with this. Okay? They predict the, not only the, the, the dynamic part, they reconstruct entire pixels. Let's see. This has been used for the um, uh, embodied AI. Okay? So the question is, can we leverage this idea to our egocentric videos? I argue that it is important, it's very difficult because of this head, uh, severe head motion. Okay? One thing that significantly different from the, this autonomous driving and the egocentric is we have a severe head motion. So what do I mean by that? Right, so I will show you two images here, okay? And one is original image, another one is a manipulated image. And you will tell me which one is a manipulated image. How many of you think uh, the left is a manipulated image? No one? One. What about the, the left? Oh, how, what make you think so? It's a popular image. It's a popular image. <laughs> so easy to, right. So the whole point that I want to make is orientation map. Okay, so now I'm going to rotate this image. Right, so we perceive, uh, our perception is always grounded on some orientation, usually ground uh, the gravity direction. Okay, it is so obvious to tell the uh, manipulated image on the upright image. But if we uh, rotate uh, to the upside down, that is very difficult. It is very on. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to perceive uh, it with the different orientations. Okay. This happened in our uh, the egocentric uh, video as well. 
So I'm showing the two images, the same room, uh, the ground plane, the uh, chairs and, and table, those are same, the same scene, okay? Uh, one is taken by the third person camera with a tripod that where the, the camera is a gravity aligned. Okay? The other one is uh, the capture from the first person image, first person camera, okay? With a little bit of a tilt here, okay? So the same scene, the same camera, but a little bit of different orientation. Okay, this is like a small difference on the camera orientation that makes a big difference in perception. Okay? So, uh, first of all, the distribution is different. Okay, we have uh, three uh, the major uh, plane on here that where like a ground plane and two side wall. Okay, that generates the that uh, where the the surface normal of each plane that forms like a three uh, dominant direction of a surface normal. Okay. If we rotate slightly here, then the distribution of surface normal will uh, significantly change because of this rotation. Okay. So what we did is, yeah, so there's a, a number of data set uh, for the for uh, scene understanding tasks, such as a scan net and NYU, okay, that provide not only depth, but surface normal and the semantic meaning of each uh, the pixels in there. So I reorganize this data based on the surface norm. Okay, so this actually visualizes the uh, the visualizes the uh, the distribution of surface norm. Okay, because the surface norm can be represented as a two degree of freedom, we can plot the, the surface norm on the, the the sphere, and now you see that the uneven distribution of the surface norm. So actually, this is like a most dense reason where that corresponds to the ground plane. Okay, and you see that the band around this that corresponds to the two side wall on the space because we are living in a Manhattan world. Okay, so the, the scene is uh, quite structured in this way. Okay, so this is like the data set that we can obtain uh, in the, in the, uh, from the public data here. Okay, so my idea is that can we use this data to predict, uh, to uh, get the geometry for the egocentric field? All right, so given this data set, we can uh, train a neural network that where we can predict the surface norm. Okay, so here's an input image, ground plane, uh, ground truth, and this is a surface normal prediction from this image. And we see that the, the error is a pretty, uh, it's a small, pretty small, which we get the reasonable prediction of the surface norm. Okay, now I'm going to apply that onto the egocentric video. Okay, I just shifted, uh, uh, rotate the image, and now you see that the error is significantly higher than, uh, uh, than the third person image, gravity aligned image, just because like, we have a tilted image. Okay? That completely changed the, the distribution. So this is the in distribution, this is out of distribution now. So the, our idea to resolve this is actually we rectify image back to the, the gravity line and predict it and then pre, uh, and rotate back which allow us to produce a better, the surface normal estimation. All right, it sounds very easy and, and it, it turns out that it's not really that uh, the simple problem uh, because there, uh, th this is a chicken or egg dilemma here, okay? To estimate the surface normal, we need to know the gravity direction, okay? Uh, and, and to estimate the gravity reliably, we need to know the, the distribution of surface normal. So there's a, a, these two things are coupled together and it's very difficult to estimate one to others. So the, our idea is uh, matching our uh, distributions onto the third person cameras. So by rotating the, the cameras, uh, the, the rotating image, which allow us to align with the, the gravity aligned images. Okay. That's uh, our insight here. Okay. So here I'm showing an uh, image. And uh, then here, this is a three-dimensional, uh, the camera rotation, okay? And this image will be worked based on the 3D rotation that we apply, okay? And this is the surface normal distribution of that image. And this is uh, actually the, the surface normal distribution for the ground truth data, okay? So as we rotate the camera on that space, uh, then we can work the image, okay? That can uh, where it actually rotate the uh, this surface normal distributions. Uh, 
Uh, I need to restart the program, sorry. My PowerPoint doesn't respond. I have to reshare it, right? Uh, no, it's good. It's good? Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, sorry for the technical issues that we have. All right, so the idea that we, uh, the, how do we do so? So the idea that we apply here is the EQ variance, the geometric property that the function need to preserve after the transformation, okay? So we have uh, the egocentric image here, okay? Uh, that is a little bit tilt from the, the, uh, the gravity uh, aligned image, okay? And then we want to learn the function that, that predict the surface norm. Okay? But as I mentioned before, this is a challenging because the, your camera orientation is not gravity aligned. So what we propose here is that we're going to warp the image such that images can be aligned with the gravity attraction. Okay, this is a very simple idea. And then learn the function that, that uh, uh, operate on the, the in distribution where that can predict the surface normal on the gravity aligned image and then transform back to the egocentric image. Okay. So uh, this is a simple uh, equivariance idea that will allow us to uh, predict the surface normal for the egocentric cameras. Okay? And we call this is a spatial rectifier. All right, so let me show you how, how it works. So we have a, okay, the field of the image, okay? And then we rotate the camera such that it can match this distribution to match to this distribution. Okay, this is the distribution of the training data where we want to match the, the our testing distribution to be the, for, uh, to be the scan image. So uh, we can estimate the surface normal and at the same time we can estimate the gravity direction altogether. All right, so uh, here I'm going to illustrate how we design the spectral rectifier. Uh, for, uh, first of all, we have uh, the image from the scan net. This is a gravity aligned image. Okay? And then we apply some random warping, which, is, uh, uh, which corresponds to the, some, the data augmentation skill that we have. All right, so the one naive way to predict the surface normal is a given image, we uh, launch some function that can predict the surface normal, okay? But as I said, this doesn't work. So we come up with a spatial rectifier, given the image, we can predict the gravity direction, okay? So that we can work the image that can match the, the distribution with the, the training dress distribution, and then transform back to the, the egocentric image, okay? So that's how we uh, apply. So the, the, we train the neural network with the uh, scan net data, which is a gravity aligned image, okay? We only train on the, scan, uh, the, the gravity aligned image and then apply to the, the tilted image, the egocentric video, okay? And we show that our method is a, shows a significant outperformance compared to the existing method, uh, especially for the tilted image space. So uh, I'm going to show you some qualitative result where given the image, uh, this is the prediction without spatial rectifier. This is one with a spatial rectifier and this is a ground truth, okay? When the image is almost a gravity aligned, okay? The performance is almost the same, comparable, okay? So the, the, the performance is pretty much similar now. Right, so, But as a rotation change significantly, the, perf uh, the, the, the performance of the spatial rectifier degrades significantly without the uh, spatial rectifier significantly. All right, so 
yeah, although there's a special rectifier idea that provides some improvements on egocentric videos, okay, but still produce a large error due to the tilted image. Okay? So here I'm plotting the adder distribution, okay, with respect to the pitch angle. So pitch angle is a distant angle, okay, when you change the orientation of that. So uh, as we increase the pitch angle, the adder increase. The reason why that, ha so, uh, this is a very uh, happen uh, that this happened very often for the egocentric camera because unlike the uh, the third person camera that look always out, okay, uh, the uh, the egocentric uh, scene usually involve with some eye hand coordination, so we always look down, okay, and so the pitch angles are almost perpendicular to each other, which produce uh, severe warping when you warp the image to the, the, uh, the, the gravity aligned images. Okay. So this uh, produce uh, excessive warping and then that produce uh, the degenerate case of the surface normal projections. All right, so we, to address this, we come up with a very simple idea. Okay. Uh, we decompose the distributions. Here, I visualize the, the surface normal distributions of third person plus the first person data, okay? And then we decompose this into the few major directions of the pitch angles. For instance, looking down here and the 45 degree uh, tilt down and, 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 and upright images, okay? Each direction that associated with some special activities. For instance, the upright image that usually happen when the person walk, so it is associated with some navigation task. And looking down, of course, this is more like involved with the hand-eye coordinations. Okay? So we can learn the distributions uh, separately for, by decomposing into the multiple uh, pitch angle. And we call this is a multimodal uh, spatial rectifier. Right? So using this, now we can uh, uh, transform back to like a few different angles, multimodal angles. Okay, uh, which produce a more uh, reasonable uh, the warping, and that produce uh, reasonable, uh, reliable surface normal predictions on this. All right. So to enable this, so we collect a large scale the egocentric videos using the uh, uh, RGB sensor, RGBD sensors. So one of my students. Where the, this work, uh, the the uh, Kinet, uh, fusion uh, Kinet cameras, uh, where she also wear the, the batteries and, and and the computers on her back, and we collect uh, a lot of uh, data from a lot of different activities, diverse activities, including uh, this is throwing uh, trash, cooking, and playing, and so on. A lot of uh, indoor activities we collect with this RGBD cameras. All right, so now. Given this training data, we can predict the, the surface normal, and now we can even predict the, the depth because we have a training data for the first person videos. Okay. Uh, we reconstruct not only the, the, uh, the static objects that represent the context of a scene, but also the dynamic object, for instance, the hands and, and other objects uh, uh, from these videos. All right, so then we also extending our work uh, to include the uh, more 3D semantics of the scene. Okay, so we manipulate a lot of objects and then we uh, fit uh, our mesh model, 3D mesh model onto the scene such that uh, we can label, uh, we can la have a, like a label for the egocentric videos. Okay. So uh, we, I truly think that this is like a direction that we uh, the we need to uh, to to esteem, to have a uh, embodied AI. We need the semantics and we need the geometry on this. So this is like where we are moving forward. And so uh, Eagle 4D is about to unlock the new possibility of creating the embodied uh, AI. And I think the key is interacting with the 3D environment. We need the 3D representation to do so. So uh, that's it, and I, I'm happy to take your question.
Is the method supposed to have uh, the three uh, main uh, direction of the null noise to be uh, working properly? So some, sometimes, many times, you have just two uh, direction of the normal. So this can, can have uh, an ambiguity on, on matching the distribution. You know? uh, if you have all the three planes, would be much easier to register in, in your uh, in your world, but if you have just two, and many times you have just two uh, directions, are you do you deal with this? Or, for instance, in a corridor, you have two different well walls and uh, the ground, but you don't have a uh, the third. Uh, yeah, so the, the existing training data set for the scene understanding that include all this kind of distribution as well. So it includes all possible pairs of uh, yeah, two walls and, and, and three walls and so on. So I think that is in already integrated in, in the training data set, I believe. So uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, the what I'm proposing here is that egocentric video it has a, so much like a, uh, head motion associated with this. It's a very difficult to come up with a training data that can span the entire possible the angle the we, we, the first person the camera wearer can generate. Okay. So my suggestion is uh, why don't we uh, register? Every all the the egocentric uh, uh, video onto the one canonical representation, like a gravity line image, or so on, mm -hmm. so that we can train the neural network that can predict better on that space. So basically, what we're trying to do is we have a train a testing dis distribution of uh, egocentric video. And we have a training distribution of from the ego uh, the, the the third person cameras. Right, so uh, we need to somehow uh, transform the, the, the distribution such that it can match to each other. So that's what I'm proposing here. And so I think we need to uh, use both data together, but we need to use it more wisely. So uh, this is something interesting. So when you translate, like, uh, instead of translating, will it be better to align it closely, like when a training? Using the same setting, mm -hmm. we use the both ego and exo data in the same setting. Will it be appropriate to, like, instead of the transferring, it will be aligning the representation? Oh, I'm sorry that I, I don't follow. Like, the uh, when, if we change the uh, model, the combined data of the ego and the exo centric, will it be better to model know that data comes from the ego centric view or the exo centric view? Or, like, you change the model. Without any information about the weather assumption, then you can do Uh I don't think it really matters to have a uh, uh, difference between that. Like the, there is a motion involved, like egocentric has a motion involved, like head motion involved, but the egocentric doesn't have this like, Right. Obviously, if we mount the camera on like robots or a mobile platform, in that case, we have the same thing, like the same. Uh, motions involved. Otherwise it can be static like it was simple or like the eye fisher camera or other person. Right. right. So uh that's true. That's true. So um but I, I, my my answer is still the same that like we need to uh the the space that we, I mean the on the scene understanding itself the problem itself is like huge. 
Okay, there's like so many the visual statistic that we need to model with this. What I'm saying is if we combine this with the head motion, okay, that generate a more complexity and the, 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 the data that we need to create is exponential uh, given the, by adding a more head motion on top of this. So what I'm saying is like, we need to uh, uh, rectify such that it can be more useful on this. Thank you so much for this. Any other questions? Timing is perfect. Um, so thanks so much, Hinsu. Sorry. So, so first, I think the visual appearance of action in the first video, first view videos is different, differs significantly from that in third person view. So, and another challenge is how to effectively precise uh, long videos, usually within, usually span over several minutes. So, actually, there are some uh, previous methods has uh, overcome this type of challenges. And there have, there have two directions. The first is we want to pre-train some very powerful egocentric facial representation like EVO, VLP, or internal video. And another thing is we are tackling with very long form radio. So how could we design very efficient grounding model to process to consume this kind of long form videos? So actually our methods also propose new solutions for these two type of challenges along these two directions. So the first, we, we propose some new training strategy and previous methods you will have proposed some pre-training strategy for a general, for a more general uh, uh, task, but this, this, this method, we propose better training method for the grounding. And also uh, for the grounding model, we propose a new solution for handle long form videos. So specifically, let's uh, look at the training strategy of our methods. So first, at the stage one, actually, we want to pre-train the egocentric video feature extractor. Actually, already Go AVLP and internal radio has done a great job. So we directly use their pre-trained methods in uh, our ground NLQ model. 
So what is different is we propose a different stage. This stage is grounding model pre-training. So we follow the uh, methods like NAQ. We actually automatically generate a lot of data from, from the ego 4D and uh, formalize this kind of data to a grounding format. So we can further pre-training our ground NLQ model to more better focus on the grounding tasks. And at stage three, we can use uh, auto, uh, auto annotated uh, data and ground and fine tuning on this kind of data uh, will get uh, better results. Uh, and so let's look at the ground NLQ architecture. Uh, so to effectively consume the long form videos, we propose a multimodal, multi skill transformer encoder. So actually, we first use uh, early multimodal fusions to uh, reduce the uh, computation cost of the model. And as the next step to better uh, process the video, we propose a text aware video frame, video feature, pyramid learning. So given a long video, we will uh, strictly uh, use max pooling method to uh, gradually downsample the video feature and uh, construct a video feature pyramid. So with these two kind of uh, designs, we achieve very promising results on the uh, challenge. So there are two key observations of our method. So first, we think our single and ensemble models all outperform all, all other teams by a substantial margin across all metrics, especially the R5 metrics, metrics. And also we achieve a sizable performance boost compared with the ECC V22 winner. And also the more interesting we find, our model uh, still have some limitations and that we want to share this kind of funding with, uh, with you. And first we think a current model still very uh, performs, perform, perform poorly on the temporal reasoning query. For example, some queries about uh, localizing one events before one events. So actually the current model cannot understand what is the meaning of before so it just uh, will localize the uh, temporal with all the nouns in the sentence, in all the nouns in the query. And the next limitation of current uh, other methods is actually we didn't in incorporate a fine green attribute understanding model. So actually current methods only recognize some specific uh, objects, but uh, it feels when requires a model to uh, understand some specific attributes like lean. So I think it, it is quite interesting to overcome this kind of methods in the future work. So take away, uh, for takeaway, we present the winner solution for our methods and we adopted the two stage pre-training and multimodal, multi-skill, multi, multimodal and multi-skill model. And we also uh, present the limitations of our methods and hope it will help still design more powerful uh, works. And thank you, that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Now we have a second speaker in the channel. And then start this. And then show right. Yeah. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Okay. Am I, am I good to go? Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Kyle Min from Intel Labs, and I'm going to talk about our work on spatial temporal heterogeneous graph learning. Okay. Audiovisual diarization is about finding and also identifying the temporal segments for each speaking activity in a video. And because we consider egocentric videos, uh, we also need to find all the speaking activities of the camera wearer, uh, which I'll refer to as CW uh, in short. And this figure illustrates uh, the overall framework that I previously used for last year's challenge, and it has many things, but uh, for this presentation, let's uh, focus on these two highlighted uh, components for uh, speaking detection only. So first, uh, the active speaker detection model detects the speaking activities of 
visible speakers in a video. Uh, it uses the audiovisual information uh, of each face region in the scene to model their speaking activities. However, it cannot be used uh, to detect the CW speaking activities because their faces are uh, not visible. Uh, this is where the egocentric video analysis is differentiated from the usual third person view uh, video understanding. The CW's face is not visible, but their recorded voice is usually the loudest uh, because they hold the camera and are closest uh, to it. So last year, uh, I used a separate model to detect the CW's speech activities only from the, the audio signal as all the previous approaches did. And for active speaker detection of visible speakers, I used a state-of-the-art method called SPELL, uh, which uses a spatial temporal graph learning. It represents a video in a graph structure uh, and models the spatial and temporal uh, interactions between the speakers using the graph nodes and edges. As you can see, we demonstrated that using high performing speaker detection models uh, reduces the diarization uh, error quite a lot. And okay, next. Okay, this year uh, I further improved the performance by merging these two components uh, into, into a single model as seen in this updated figure on the left. So the key innovation here is that it models all the speakers, including, including the CW, using a single uh, unified heterogeneous graph learning framework. Unlike previous approaches that require a separate component for the CW, it can jointly model all the speakers in, in a video, um, including the CW. And in the updated figure on the right, these um, new green rectangular nodes represent the, the CW. They are different from the circular nodes of visible speakers because they only have audio information. So for example, if we use ResNet 18 features, the th circular nodes for visible speakers have 1024 dimensional uh, audio visual features, whereas the, the, the rectangular nodes for the CW have only 512 dimensional audio features. So this makes this graph heterogeneous. So I built um, heterogeneous graphs based on two different types of, uh, two different types of no graph nodes and multiple types of edges. By using this spatial temporal heterogeneous graph learning framework, which we named STHG, I could lower the error rate further for this year's challenge. So I wanna point out that we used the exact same set of features we, um, that were used in last year's submission. Uh, yet our method increases the detection performance for the CW as well as uh, all the visible speakers. Uh, this is because uh, it models all the speakers uh, jointly so it can fully leverage the inter-speaker context uh, between the CW and others. Uh, in conclusion, the main idea was to capture the spatial and temporal temporal relationships between the speakers using our unique uh, graph structure. It can jointly model all the speakers, including the CW using a single unified framework, and it boosts the detection performance both for the CW and other visible speakers. Also, the graphs uh, are very sparse, so the whole GNN framework can be optimized using a single uh, Titan GPU. But our method is not end-to-end -end because it requires an initial set of um, node features and the graphs uh, need to be constructed in advance. But we are um, currently working on this problem and in the future version of our code, the graphs uh, will be constructed uh, on the fly. And the code will be updated soon. So please visit our um, code base of graph-based graph solutions for video understanding. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. 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 We're not sharing the message. Okay. This, this was great, right? I'm not on Zoom. So oh, okay. So you just reshare the screen. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Who share? Leave the screen. Yeah, yeah. Share the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Frank Wong, and I'm going to present our work uh, case uh, for the Talking to Me Challenge. And this is a joint work between NTU and um, NVIDIA Taiwan. All right. So, what is the Talking to Me Challenge? Uh, basically, uh, we are given an input sequence um, of person's face images plus the audio data. And the output is to de uh, determine whether or not the target person is talking to the camera wearer. And uh, basically, we need to do a frame-wise binary prediction and to determine whether or not uh, the person is talking to, to, to the camera wearer. So the initial stage of our, of our approach, we consider a simple feature level fusion. Uh, as you can see, for the Im image part, we take the ResNet uh, 50 as our uh, feature backbone. For the audio part, we take the whisper uh, and followed by a self-attention mechanism, uh, which replaces the standard RN, the standard LSTN to, do, uh, to deal with the sequential data. And finally, we deploy an MLP to do the recognition. And even with such a simple uh, early stage feature level fusion, we already uh, reported a comparable results uh, when comparing to uh, the ECCV winner last year. And later we found out that there are actually some issues like the first one, the face input annotations are quite noisy. Uh, in some of the video frames, we found out that the target person is not really in the field of view. And actually out of the uh, annotated frames, about 40% 40, about 40 of them, uh, we do not observe any bounding box uh, labels. So the first issue is the noisy labels. And the second issue is that even, even the, the bounding box uh, uh, inputs, uh, we found out that the quality of the visual features are not that uh, sufficient. Uh, as you can see, the score distribution, and I'll explain a bit about uh, how we calculate the quality scores. All right, so this is our proposed method. Uh, as you can see, we consider a late fusion. We consider a quality aware late fusion, and we call it QUAVE. Uh, it is uh, in short of quality aware audio visual fusion. In this architecture, we train the video part and the audio part separately. Uh, we feel that it that allows us better uh, utilize the uh, labels observed for either modality. And uh, more importantly, we calculate the quality scores from especially the video parts. And that will be in an important part for the training, uh, not only for the visual uh, architecture, but for the overall lead fusion. So how did we calculate the quality scores? Basically, we take the ICV 2017 work to calculate the confidence scores for each landmark. And finally, that sums up and gave us the final quality score for each video frame. And that quality score is quite important because that comes to uh, into three different uh, parts. The first part is to do data filtering. If we feel that the data, the video data is not, uh, the quality score is not above the threshold, then we will not consider it at all. We will simply consider the audio parts. Secondly, we use the quality scores, as, uh, we quantize the quality scores and we use that as a uh, one hot feature and that will be concatenated with the video uh, features in the video branch. And finally, the quality scores will be uh, a key factor for the late fusion, like the final equation shown in this slide. And from our quantitative results, uh, actually we did pretty good. And uh, even using the audio only features, we already achieved quite comparable results comparing to uh, previous years. And with the quality aware late feature fusion, uh, we further proved, uh, improved the, 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 the uh, accuracy. And finally, we, do some, uh, we did some ablation studies to verify our designs. First of all, using Whisper is better than Hubert. Uh, we think that the reason is Whisper, uh, uh, the audio part I, uh, that is quite related has a strong association with speech recognition. And that is why using Whisper is better than using Hubert. 
And from the right-hand side, you can see that, like I just mentioned, using audio part is good enough. And using the uh, video part is uh, not as satisfactory because the poor qu uh, video quality. And that is why really, we really need to do some kind of fusion to further improve the uh, boundary. And for the later part, that is our way to uh, utilize the quality scores as a one hot feature into our design. And here, let me sh show you some qualitative examples. So you can see that even the bounding box is given, however, it is quite just a partial view of the person and the person is not really looking at the camera wearer. So if you see the scores uh, in red, that means incorrect prediction. If you see the scores in green, that is correct recognition. <laughs> so as you can see from these examples, the quality of the visual part is not very high. And that is why we need to calculate additional indicator, the additional quality scores from the visual parts. And we also observe some failure cases. And you can see that you can see that if the background is with noise, if there are multiple speakers, if the speaker is quite far away from the camera, then we do not expect uh, yeah, cool, uh, yeah. satisfactory outputs. Wow. All right, there are some quick takeaways. Uh, the first of all, this task is quite challenging due to uh, uh, insufficient data quality, diverse scenarios, something like that. And uh, uh, this items number two and number three I just mentioned, audio part is quite important and the quality where fusion is, is necessary. And we feel that it is possible to explore more features because here we only consider the uh, funding box, the crop face images as the visual features, not the context information from the entire frame. And finally, we observed that there is a gap between the validation and test data, and that suggests that implies there is a domain gap. So that is my presentation. Thank you. and the video, and the target is to search and localize the viral query within the video. The difficulties of VQL rest from three aspects. First, it deals with the needle in the haystack problem, as the video can be very long 
but the response track can be only a few seconds. Second, the model should be able to work on open set queries from diverse categories. Third, there are no exact match, which means that we observe large variation between the viral query and its appearance in the video. Previous work solved the task with a stage-wise method. In the first stage, they detect all objects in each frame and perform similarity-based matching with the query. Then the detection proposal with the highest score is maintained. In the second stage, they detect the confidence or similarity peak. And finally, they perform bidirectional tracking around the peak to get a result. This work suffers from non-end-to-end -end model, the split of spatial temporal reasoning, and slow speed. So how do we deal with it? We argue that it's important to build a holistic understanding of query video relationship. To this end, we model the spatial temporal correspondence between them. Specifically, it's query-to-frame spatial relationship and frame-to-frame -frame temporal relationship. We build an end-to-end -end model performing single-stage inference. In detail, it first extracts image features from all video frames and the viral query using a shared encoder. Then we use a spatial transformer model to get a query-to-frame correspondence features. We then refine the features with a spatial temporal transformer module, leveraging the temporal continuity of video frames. We notify it as the query video correspondence features. Finally, we predict frame-wise results. We show some visualization results. On the left is the viral query, and on the right is the localization result in the video. We also show the predicted object occurrence probability for the entire video. And here is another example where the object occurs very shortly. We provide quantitative results. Our model achieves state-of-the-art performance on the Eagle 4D VQ2D benchmark with 20% performance gain and 10 times faster inference speed. We are also the top one entry on the leaderboard. Besides, our model demonstrates reasonable speed accuracy balance using different kind of backbones. Finally, we show more response tracks. Thanks for listening. So, hello everyone. Here we are going to present our winner solution for the video 3D task. So, we propose a method called Eagleog revisiting 3D object localization from ecocentric videos with video queries. So, we are a team come from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, Coast from Saudi Arabia.
So thanks to the great contribution of EcoFold dataset thing. So basically the task is that given an eccentric video clip and an image crop displaying a query object, our goal is to localize the last time a query object was seen in the video and return the 3D displacement vector to help the camera reader to find that object he wants to find. So current the Q3D baselines estimate the camera poses without regard to the difference in the domains, echo video, and metapixel scans. So also they just naive relate the video 2D result to 3D predictions and make their approved performance. So here we are going to present our methodology. So here is an overload pipeline in our echo 4D method. So it mainly consisting of three modules the post module, detection module, and the multi-view aggregation module. So for the first module, since we want to localize an object in the video, we estimate the camera pose with structure flow motion. Here we adopt the very popular core map of our method for all the frames in all the micro 3D video sequences. Um, because we observe that the eco 4 d and they use camera relocalization to relocalize this video frame's camera pose from metapod scans, but uh, we find it can just recap a few camera poses because of the domain gap. For the 2D detection part, unlike the eco 4 d baseline that creates use vq 2 d result which consists of detector and tracker to localize the last appearance of the object in 2D, we find that the tracker is noise and inaccurate, so we just run the 2D detection network in used in VQ2D to obtain object proposals with similarity scores for all the frames. And here is a closer view of the 2D detection part. So the detection is a Siamese, the detector is a Siamese architecture. It will give different proposals with different similarity score for every eccentric frames. So we select the peaks as positive appearance of the query object, resulting in multiple 2D bonding blocks proposals with scores across the whole video. For the aggregation and lift part, which means given 2D bonding box proposal and 3D camera pose of the frames, we need to give the final prediction for the 3D object. Eco phone the baseline just use the single last frames predicted by the, by the tracker as the 2D proposal. And in our case, our multi-view module used two detection scores, 2D bonding box proposals, 3D camera pose, and depths from all the peak frames to do a weighted average. Finally, which will finally give us the prediction. For the experiments, we use the vq 3 d dataset and we use all the same metrics used in the previous baseline. So for our results, uh, here is the table showing our result on the test server leaderboard. As we can see, our final method gives a, a huge improvement to 87% overall success rate and the egocentric structure flow motion part, which means the camera post estimation module give us the most performance boost. And we also show some compar comparison from the visualization. So we can give more accurate 2D prediction and also the closer 3D object localization. And we also show some limitations. So since we just simply do multi-view uh, aggregation regardless of the last appearance. So when the object is dynamic, uh, it means the camera rail is moving the object. Our method will give a little bit of shift. And current, the biggest limitation is still the camera pose estimation. For some hard scenes, if we just get 40% of the camera pose, and then our overall success rate is also constrained to just 40%. Our code and report will be public on Ecofoldi's official website soon. If you have questions, feel free to contact my email. Thank you so much for your listening. We are entries from Rala Lab in Zhejiang University. We now introduce our findings and solutions to the Ecofoldi episodic memory challenge. We finally rank first in moment queries challenge and second in natural language queries challenge. This page shows the information about our team. 
First, we give a brief introduction of these two challenges. For moment queries challenge, namely MQ, given the video clip, we need to design a model to directly predict all possible action instances inside, including action category, start time, and end time. For natural language queries challenge, namely NLQ, that is, given a video clip and a text query, our model aims to locate a video segment, including start time and end time, which reveals the answer to the query. Both these two tasks are challenging as videos are egocentric in this benchmark and extremely long, while durations of actions or corresponding answers varies a lot. Some actions last for only one second, while others might for several minutes. Previous solutions treat each frame inside action instances equally, however we find it is not exactly true. For example, given an action instance close drying, there are some possible sub-actions inside, such as lift laundry basket, or hand close on the hanger, or take out clothes. And actually, frames of hand close on the hanger are more important to classify this action, since they reveal the intrinsic content of this action while frames of lift laundry basket or take out clothes from laundry basket are more important to locate the start and end time of actions since they reveal something about boundaries. So that we introduce action sensitivity to measure the importance of each frame inside action instances and we aim to utilize it to recalibrate the training process. To this end, we propose action sensitivity learning to tackle these two tasks. First, videos are encoded by a 3D convolution network and a transformer encoder. We use ground truth to sample action instance. Then we do action sensitivity learning to assess each frame's importance. It is modeled from two parts, class level and instance level. For class level action sensitivity, it is learned by learnable Gaussian distributions, that is, for classification we assign one Gaussian for each action class. For localization we assign two Gaussians. The mu and the sigma of Gaussians are optimized during training. Instance level action sensitivity is learned by an instance level evaluator and we utilize temporal IOU and uh, class scores to guide the instance level training. More details please refer to our report. Learned action sensitivities will be used as loss weights of each frame. Besides, we also do a contrastive loss to further enhance the features. In NLQ track, text queries are encoded and fused with video features by a common multimodal encoder. Then we also utilize the similar pipeline as to the moment queries challenge, where we only employ class level modeling to learn action sensitivity. Moreover, we use stronger features, for example, the intern video and the Eagle VRP to further enhance the performance, and we utilize a model ensembling strategy as follows. For moment queries challenge, we ensemble models by average their predicted logits. For natural language queries, we do a top K operation among all the predictions from different models. Here is our results on Eagle4D. For moment queries challenge, we can see action sensitivity learning boosts the performance notably. And uh, with ensembling strategy and strong features, we finally obtain around 29 average MAP, ranking first on the leaderboard. And for natural language queries challenge, action sensitivity learning also boosts the performance, and we finally obtain the second on the leaderboard. This is our visualization of action sensitivity learning, and we can see frames have different uh, action sensitivities. We utilize these making the model pay more attention to important frames according to different subtasks, that is localization and classification. Above is our presentation and more details please refer to our report or manuscript. 
and our code will also be released later in this GitHub repository. Thank you. We present Palm prediction action through language models, the first place solution to the Eagle for the long term action anticipation LTA challenge. The task of long term action anticipation receives the video clips as input and predict future actions, represented by a sequence of verb and noun pairs. So, previous methods on the LTA task mostly follow the paradigm of extracting video features of each past action and learn a neural network to predict future ones by classifying verbs and nouns. Progresses are made through making better video features and designing better neural networks. We argue that such formulation does not model the complicated structural dependencies required in the LTA task. First, for the method based on the eco 4 d baseline, each future action is predicted with a separate decoder, and thus the dependencies among actions are not explicitly modeled. Also, the verbs and nouns are classified independently within the same action, and thus the dependencies between verbs and nouns are also not explicitly captured. We notice that language models have demonstrated remarkable ability for decision making and planning a task very similar to the LTA task. And we hypothesize that such procedural knowledge are embedded in language models and by carefully designed prompting, we can extract such information for the LTA tasks. Moreover, current transformer-based language model generates autoregressively and thus explicitly models the dependencies of actions and verb norms. And we can formulate action anticipation as a task generation task and make use of the advances in language models Region language models and all the prompting techniques. Here is an overview of our method. Given a video clip of past actions, we try to formulate a prompt for the language model. And the prompt consists of image caption and past actions. The image caption serves as a broader context for the whole scene, and the action recognition module provides reference words for the generation. We concatenate text descriptions together as a prompt for the language model. And then we pass the captions and pass actions to language model, which will generate future actions for us. So here is how the prompt formatted with a concrete example. You can see the prompt in the middle. The prompt starts with an instruction describing the task, followed by several retrieved training examples with similar semantic features for maximum reference and then the query input is appended. Here we will show one retrieved example and note how a complex action sequence is recovered exactly in our output compared to ground truth. Here we show the leaderboard result of our method compared to other competitors. Notice that the non at the distance and the action at the distance is significantly lower in our method compared to others. We examine all the modules in our pipeline here. We found both image captions and the recognized actions help with the prediction. We also apply the choice of language models and find a larger off-the-shelf language model with a longer contact size produces better future anticipations. In conclusion, we present Palm, a language model-centric method for long-term action anticipation. We show the effectiveness of language model for this task, and they've achieved the best performance in the challenge. Please refer to our report for further details of our method, and thanks for your attention. Okay, uh, thanks, if, thanks to all the speakers uh, for presenting the Spotlight Talks. We'll conclude the Ego4D challenges by uh, winner felicitation. So if any of the winners are here, 
we'll go one challenge at a time. And if you're here, please come here and uh, receive the certificates. Uh, So first is the VQ uh, 2D localization challenge, won by Hanwin and Kristen from UT. Second is the VQ 3D localization challenge. Uh, do we have any of the winners here? All right. Yeah, I need any time. Congratulations. There's something good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. But in the background, we will be behind them. No, I think you're not. Otherwise, it will flash. It's not. It's fine. Okay. You can see my current photo, but you can see it. <laughs> okay. The second place winner uh, from North Andes. Anyone here? Okay. Uh, NLQ. Uh, first place team ground NLQ. <laughs> Second team, Reller. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and third team from NYU. Okay. Congratulations. We have uh, moments. Uh, the Reller team again for moments. <laughs> it's the old, it's the only team that won two prizes this time. Yeah. Then second place uh, for moments, MZS. So zero shot. We have the team for Lenovo. Is anyone here? For Ego Tracks, University of Tokyo team. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but it's too We have Sai from Intel. Thank you. I'm so proud. Thank you. <laughs> In transcription, we have Oxford team. Anyone here? Moving on to social, uh, we have looking at me first place, PKU WICT team. Uh, okay, uh, the second, uh, sorry, the talking to me first place, the team from NVIDIA and NTU. Okay, Uh, second place team from MIT. Okay, short term object interaction uh, team from Team Pavis. All right, congratulations. Then LTA uh, team farm, which got the first place. 
Okay, and the second place, Sam's Ego AI from Panasonic. Okay, I think that concludes. And thanks to Eval AI for hosting all our challenges. It's incredible, like how much support they provide in the background to resolve all the issues. And then, of course, the CBDF Foundation for hosting the data. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, and any feedback is welcome. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Ryan, and I will be presenting our work, Egocentric Auditory Attention Localization and Conversations. In everyday environments like parties, coffee shops, or large dinner tables, we use a process called selective auditory attention to listen to certain people while tuning out other speakers we don't want to listen to. And in order for augmented reality systems to work in these noisy environments and do things like enhance or translate the speech of the person you're talking with, we need to know what the camera wearer wants to listen to. In this work, we aim to localize selective auditory attention in conversations using egocentric video and multi-channel audio. In other words, we wanna predict which people in the scene the camera wearer is listening to and who they're not listening to. Our contributions are that we introduce the novel task of selective auditory attention localization, which we call SAL. We propose a new spatiotemporal audiovisual architecture for our task, and we evaluate our model on a challenging multi speaker conversation data set showing superiority over competing methods. The main question that we address in our work is how we can use egocentric cues to localize selective auditory attention, and we hypothesize that different modalities contain different predictors. Egocentric video shows us where there are people in the scene relative to the camera wear, and it also captures social cues like who is looking at who and who might be looking at the camera wear. And we also use egocentric multi channel audio recorded from a worn array of six microphones. And because there are multiple microphones, this not only captures the speech, the signals themselves, but it also gives us information about where different sound sources are occurring relative to the camera wear. And implicitly embedded into both of these modalities is egocentric head movement over time. So in an input clip, we might see the camera wearer move their head to face a new person as they begin speaking, which would indicate a shift in auditory attention. Our task is to predict an auditory attention heat map for each input frame in the video that identifies the heads of the people that the camera wearer is listening to. We propose a spatiotemporal multimodal video architecture where the input is eight video frames that are sampled over a one second window and the corresponding six channel audio signal, which we process into per frame spectrograms as well as channel correlation features. 
We then used two 3D ResNet 18 encoders to extract spatiotemporal feature map for each modality and concatenate these. We then use a transformer to refine these feature maps by modeling relationships across the full scene. And this is especially important for our task because we need to not just locate speakers, but reason globally about their appearances, the speech, where they are in the cameraware field of view, and use this to decide which one, if any, the cameraware is actually listening to. Finally, we upsample these features into a heat map for each of the input frames using a convolutional decoder. And our model is trained end to end using pixel wise cross entropy loss on the heat maps. To train and evaluate our model, we need a data set that captures these selective listening behaviors and also actually has a way to obtain ground truth auditory attention labels. So what we did was have groups of five people at a time sit at a table and have two simultaneous conversations. And we instructed the participants to only talk and listen within their smaller conversation group. This allows us to determine auditory attention as whoever is in the camera wears assigned smaller conversation group and is currently speaking. We used several different conversation layouts and had a total of 50 participants. And in total, the data set is about 20 hours of egocentric video and audio. We evaluate our model against two groups of baselines. The first is naive heuristic baselines that use ground truth active speaker labels, like selecting all the speakers as attended or selecting the speaker that's closest to the center of the field of view. And then we also compared against the state of the art active speaker localization model. And the downstream metric we used was per person mean average precision on determining if that person is attended or not. And this is done by taking the um, predicted heat map and then max pooling it in the region of each person's head to obtain like an attention score for them. We saw that our model greatly outperforms the naive baselines, which shows that even if we have the ability to perfectly localize active speakers, it's really non-trivial to figure out who the camera wear is actually listening to in these noisy environments. And it also outperforms the prior active speaker localization model, which shows that this is really a new task that merits a novel modeling approach. I'll finish by showing a brief example of our model's output where the ground truth attended speakers will be shown in yellow and then blue boxes will show who, other people who are speaking but are not attended to by the camera wear. So to conclude, we introduced this novel task of selective auditory attention localization. We proposed a new model for our task, and we evaluated on this challenging multi-speaker conversation data set demonstrating superiority over competing methods. Thank you so much for listening, and please do stop by our poster at the Wednesday afternoon poster session. Okay, great. Um, yeah, sorry for the tech issue. Well, hi, I'm Jiajin. Uh, I'm gonna talk about our work on um, ego body pulse estimation via ego head pulse estimation. Um, this is done by, you know, you can see it, right? There's Jiaman Li, who is a PhD student, co-advised by Carrie and me. So she really did all the work, and all the work, literally all the work. But it's really unfortunate that she has visa issue and couldn't come here. So I'm going to present for her. Um, okay, uh, motivation. It might be slightly different from other talks that you see in this workshop, but I think it's a very interesting way of using Ego 4D. It also shows, you know, how, how useful the data set is and flexible the data set is. So, so human motion is very important. Um, it has so many applications. There's movies, there are computer games, and there's visual performance. So to capture all this motion, what people usually do is we have a mocap system, right? You wear all these sensors and you have all these cameras in a controlled environment. So the quality is great, um, but just because of all this hardware requirement, you know, mocap system just have very limited scalability. It has to be in a room, you know, and, and, and capture the motion capture is very limited because that's all you can do within the room you're standing there. Um, therefore, if you look at the size of different data sets of different modalities, the images will have billions or 10 millions, right? Not 5B, but you can have more than that. And videos, YouTube has 800 million, so you probably can get 1 billion videos. And 3D models, even 3D models, if you look at Optiverse and Optiverse Extra Large, you can add million, we have 1 million or 10 million. But looking at motion clips, the largest motion clips you have for human motion is 10,000. Uh, it's so much smaller. So of course, nowadays we know we just need data, but there's no data for motion, basically. So our key observation here is, well, there are many diverse egocentric videos available like Ego 4D, which is great. And interestingly, egocentric videos just directly associated with human movement. Um, so, you know, it, it, you have egocentric media because I move, I'm walking. So now the question is, is it possible for us to estimate human motion from these egocentric videos? So the problem statement is fairly straightforward. We have egocentric videos from, from front-facing mounted camera. 
We want to output and predict the full body human motions. We didn't propose this problem. There are people who have studied this problem, for example, by uh, Christian Gorham's group back in 2017. Uh, but you know, we, hopefully we propose an interesting novel solution. So uh, the problem itself has, you know, if you just want to tackle it, has two main challenges we identify. One is there are very nice data sets which has you know, paired egocentric videos and human motion captured by Chris, actually, I was sitting over there from CMU. But the data set is really small. And again, it's very hard to capture human motion. And now you also want egocentric data. So the data is even smaller. It just has one scene and has maybe one hour of motion. So we don't have that much data. And the second challenge is going from egocentric videos, problem is really, really under constraint. How can I know if I'm doing this or if I'm doing that? Right? There's just no way. So there's significant ambiguity in the mapping from egocentric video to full body pulses. That's the two main challenges. Um, for the first challenge, how do we tackle that? I think that's the most important observation we have is, yeah, there are no paired or very limited paired data set for training. There are this clean poly data set from Chris's group um, and it has 80 million motion. And there's this GMO data set from Leo Gibbs group from Stanford it has 70 million motion, but that's it, that's not enough for training. But we do have Eagle 4D, right? Eagle 4D has you know, 3,000 hour of videos and it is very rich. It has all the egocentric videos. It doesn't have full body motion, but it does have IMU. Um, so, Okay, the, the, the microphone is amazed by the um, amount of data in Eagle 4D. Um, right, but that's how I'm real. So in some sense, you can interpret it as you can translate that into head poses, right? So that gives you basically where the head is. And then if you already have head poses and you want to connect head pose to full body pose, then yeah, now you can use the mocap data. They're not as large as Eagle 4D, but they're much more than, you know, just this one video and 70 minute video. At least you have 40 hour motion from mocap data sets like AMS. Okay, so that's why we designed this uh, two-stage pipeline about which we call ego. Ego. The first stage is ego head estimation from egocentric video. The second is ego body pulse estimation from estimated head pulses. So in first stage, um, you know, how can we solve this problem? Now we want to just go from egocentric video to head pulses, and people will say, okay, this looks like a slam problem, right? All you need is this molecular slam. You can run a slam and you can add head pulses, but if you compare that with the ground truth head pulse and I realized there are two issues. The first issue is the gravity direction is unknown, right? So um, head may move and I'm wearing this you know, sen uh, sensors. So how can I know the gravity direction? And the second is the scale is different, right? Basically there's just, you know, you have to align uh, your predictive poses and rectify them to register them to the ground truth pulse. So we do that by, uh, you know, based on these slam methods, but we augment them with learning. So we have a gravity net, uh, which uh, predicts, um, take the head translation and rotation sequence predicted by the SNAP methods and predict where the gravity vector is and where you can actually train on the mocap data sets like AMS, uh, but you can augment them. Or you can take these mocap data sets, you can augment them by randomly varying the scale and rotation. Um, so you can train this gravity net. And then the scale is different, uh, the problem. So you have egocentric videos, um, we compute optical flow, and then we have a separate, which in a separate head net, which take these optical flow features and try to predict um, these, uh, the scalar values, the distances between the two steps and the angular velocities at each step. Um, so this we can train on paired egocentric videos and head poses like Eagle 4D. So the entire pipeline in the first stage is you take the videos, uh, you run the slam methods, and then you have the gravity nets, uh, which allows you to predict the gravity vectors, which allows you to rectify uh, the predicted translation of the head poses. And then you have a head net, which predicts the rotation and the scale uh, vectors for the translation, which eventually got put together so you can rescale the translation and rotation. And that gives you um, the uh, predicted head pose. So that's the first stage. Um, so we evaluate on both synthetic data sets and real world data sets, where we evaluate head orientation and head translation. And we can see that our method just works much better. Um, and in the second stage, uh, going from ego uh, head pose to ego body pose. So the problem is now you want to predict the head pose uh, based on the head pose predicting stage one to predict the full body human pose. And here now let's remember we have the second challenge. There's huge ambiguity, right? Intrinsic ambiguity going from ego centric video to human motion. There's so many diverse videos, uh, the most possible motions. So how can we get that? Um, nothing too creative. We just use a uh, diffusion model, which is a probabilistic distribution, uh, try to capture the possible motions going from the ego head pose. So we can go from the ego head pose using the only diffusion model to capture the possible variations in the full body motion. And here, 
this is a test uh, example where we have the input head pose. And here, this is the generated human motion. And here is more results compared with the baselines. You can see that our method at the bottom left uh, aligns with the ground truth much better. Okay, um, so we can also do quantitative evaluations for the second stage. You know, if you already have the head pose, how, how well are you doing on body pose prediction? We can test it on these mocap data sets and our method also does much better on all these different metrics. Okay, finally, we have stage one, we have stage two, we put them together. We want to evaluate the entire model. And again, you know, here evaluation, no, we don't have large data sets for training, but King Poly and Gimo, these data sets, although they're not very large, they're perfect for uh, testing. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, there are still you know, only 70 minutes and 80 minutes. So in addition to that, we also uh, build our own synthetic data sets for quantitative evaluation purposes, where we take the AMS um, human motion and we put them into 3 dc data sets that replica, where we run collision detection in habitats. And then we got this AMS replica ego synthetic data sets called ARES, where we have paired ego centric video and human full body motion. Uh, it's altogether, it's 15 hour motion. It's not very really large. You can reduce it for training, but it's larger um, for the previous ones that we can use both this and the previous real world data sets for evaluation. And here are some qualitative results. Oh, sorry, this is the examples from the ARES data sets. Um, you, know, you can see the ego centric videos and the ground truth motion. And here's no, the left is input, the, the, right, the right is the ground truth. So you can see that um, on both our synthetic ARES data set and the real world data sets, our method the entire pipeline now two stages going from ego centric video to full body pulse uh, works very well and better than the previous methods. And here's more qualitative results. Going from the ego centric video, this is the input. And this is the output where our method in blue is showing bottom left. And as I said, we had a probability distribution, right? So we can actually, uh, our probability modeling allows you to synthesize different possible human motions uh, from the egocentric video input. And here is just more results, um, real world data sets like the King Poly one from uh, CMU. As well as this uh, GMO one from Stanford. Great. So uh, we have this new, not really, we, we sort of re revisit this uh, task of going from egocentric video to generate human motion. And then we propose this intermediate representations hypothesis to address this limited data issue, right? Because we don't have really large pair data sets, but we do have large pair data sets if you use egocentric human posts as a head post as a intermediate representations. And then we have, you know, contributions on designing specific, you know, two stage methods and how we uh, design each of the stages to make them work better than previous methods as well as a large uh, new synthetic data sets and automatic data collection pipeline for building these synthetic paired egocentric video and full volume motion uh, data sets in diverse scenes. Um, so welcome to our poster on Thursday morning. And also there's a talk tomorrow afternoon as well. Thank you. Oh, it's mirror, right? So can I do the think? Yeah, so people can extend extended. Yes, cool.
Um, the other way around. Twenty seconds from the top. We should be like in that space. Click on the display settings. And swap. I'm not going to share the screen. Yes. So, uh, I just do. So, yeah, screen two, screen two. The other one. Uh, okay. uh, sorry uh, for the um, thing. Um, okay, let's get started. So uh, it's my great honor to be here to present our work, um, uh, which is a CPR 2023 uh, highlight paper. So learning video representations from large language models. Uh, this is a joint work with my two amazing uh, uh, mentor at Meta, Ishan and Rohit, and my great advisor, uh, Philip. So let's get into the details. So in this work, we basically focus on training uh, video language models. And we actually propose, uh, so the standard way of uh, uh, video language model is that we have a bunch of uh, video text uh, pairs and then we just train them. And then these video text pairs are basically from human annotations, which actually are very sparse and it costs a lot to annotate this um, uh, data. Uh, what we want to do here is basically want to get more data. And then we basically folk, uh, try to re uh, try to leverage large language model out of uh, to to get some text information, and we try to repurpose the large language model to be visually conditioned narration so that it can like densely narrate the entire video and then give us kind of free annotation. So here is the basically the advantages. So uh, it first give us very temporally dense coverage of the entire video. And the second thing is because uh, it's a large language model and it's probabilistic, we can do sampling out of it. Um, that's why it's more kind of diverse than the human annotations. And the third thing is like uh, compared to human annotation, it's sort of free. Yeah. Um, so let's get into the details. So uh, first we have a dual encoder model to learn the video text representations. So the dual encoder actually inherits from clip. And then we try to inflate the vision encoder to be a, a video uh, encoder. So here we use transformer. Uh, and then we uh, zero initialize the temporal attention. And on top of that, we can just do basic like projection head and then we use a uh, contrastive loss to learn the representation. And the pre-training data uh, can include both the annotated video text pairs and the studio labeled uh, video clips, which is generated by the language model. Okay, so the language supervision actually comes from two aspects, uh, which we actually call like two uh, models. One is called rephraser. Uh, and the other is called narrator. The rephraser is just like texting text out and try to uh, rephrase the, uh, the, the text without looking at the visual itself. And then the narrator is basically like take the vis visual as input and then try to caption the uh, video, like to try to describe what was happening in the video. And the advantage of the narrator is basically like, uh, if we look at the example on the, uh, on the bottom, so actually the person is doing two things, like the left-hand side is uh, holding up a container and then the right-hand side is kind of wiping the, the, the table. And then people turn to only annotate one thing because people are lazy. But actually the model can actually, if we sample multiple times, then we can see like both of the events can be described by the narrators. Okay, here is the detail of the rephraser. So it is texting text out. And then we use an uh, encoder decoder architecture like uh, T5 to do these uh, rephraser. And then uh, actually this is a pre-trained T5. We just use it out of the box. And then we can think of it as a kind of a data augmentation on the text part. Okay, so here is the narrator. So narrator have a visual encoder 
to get the uh, visual embedding. So we use a frozen dual encoder that is pre-trained on the uh, human annotated video text pairs. And then the decoder uh, it closely follows a standard large language model. So here we use GPT-2. And then to insert the video condition, we add cross attention module right before each of the GPT-2 block so that the video, can, uh, video information can flow into the text stream. And then we freeze the GPT-2 blocks because of we have some, the, the text decoder are typically pretty large. And then we only learn the cross attention between the, uh, each GPT-2 blocks. Um, yeah, so how, how can we train the narrator? So basically we just train the narrator using the existing human annotated uh, uh, pairs using captioning loss. And then we can do inference. So inference at, at inference time, so we basically input the uh, visual embedding plus a start of sentence token. And then we can do some sort of nuclear sampling uh, on top of the text decoder until a uh, end of sentence token is reached. And then we can repeat the process for multiple times. And then, uh, so the, the, the advantage of narrator is basically we can do dense narration out of the entire video. So here are two parts. So for existing video clips, we can essentially just feed the uh, clips uh, as it, and then we can just do uh, the caption uh, again. And then for the rest of video that are not annotated by the, uh, by the, by the human, we basically uniform the uh, sample, the unlabeled part, and then the statistic can just borrow from the existing, uh, like by averaging out of the existing video clips. And then uh, we uniform sample and then dense caption, and then we can use the dual encoder that we trained in the very beginning, and then use the similarity score to try to filter out those uh, unsimilar, uh, unsimilar uh, pairs that might be kind of some kind of noise. So here, let's go to the uh, experimental setup. Uh, we try to pre-train using the video narration pairs from Eagle 4D. Uh, and then we also exclude those uh, validation uh, videos in the benchmarks because we, we want to do some uh, downstream evaluation on the Eagle 4D benchmarks. And then the annotation clips become like around 4 million. And then our narration uh, narrators can actually pseudo caption the clips by 10 times. And then the rephraser actually can uh, do it by like, uh, we actually uh, try to rephrase it by three times. Uh, here's the bunch of uh, a, a downstream benchmark that we try to evaluate on, the, um, uh, on our model. Uh, this covers a wide range of first person uh, video uh, benchmarks. And then we also provide some uh, experiments on third person videos by uh, applying the same pipeline on the uh, how to 100 million uh, data set. So here, uh, here is our main result. Uh, we can see that our method outperforms the previous state of the art on a wide range of multiple video understanding tasks like uh, first person video and third person videos and in both like zero shot setups and fine tune setups. And here are some kind of more numerical results. And we observed basically two interesting things. Uh, one is core data scaling. We can see that our model uh, uh, can have consistently boost when we increase the pre-training data. And very interestingly, we observed that La Villa that trained with only half of the Eagle 4D narrations out from the baseline method with which used the full sort of the uh, human annotated uh, narrations. And then we also observed some uh, nice uh, model scaling behavior which we can increase the architecture in the, both the narrator and the underlying dual encoder. And then in both cases, we actually see a consistent boost of the performance. So if we want to know more details, so we open source all of the codes on our GitHub, and then we have a very fancy demo provided by the Hugging Face uh, on this, the middle website. And then we have the highlight poster session on Tuesday afternoon. Feel free to drop by. Thank you. Let's go. So let's get started. So um, welcome back. Um, and so we have an exciting session uh, today. So we have uh, for the next until the next coffee break, we have uh, Sura Janer, who's I'm going to introduce momentarily, and then we have uh, some challenge results. And we have a bunch of very exciting abstracts as well. And so let's just dive in. And so we're very, very excited to have Sura Janer. He is a final year PhD student at Stanford, where he's working on the intersection of machine learning, robotics and computer vision. And he focuses on enabling general purpose robots through large scale data collection and deep reinforcement learning. And he's uh, won a National Science Foundation graduate fellowship, and he did a bachelor's at Caltech. And he's gonna be talking about supervising robot learning with human video data, which is something which, I'm, which I think many of us are really excited about because one of the promises of a lot of this great data is it should enable autonomous systems. 
And so without further ado, uh, please, please take it away. Great, uh, thank you. And, and just to double check, everybody can hear me and, and see the slides, fine. Let's, you good? You good? Uh, yep. Okay, cool, excellent, good. Yep. Great, yeah, so uh, th yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, and I'll be talking about uh, supervising robot learning uh, with human video data. Now, uh, the, the long-term vision of my research uh, is towards creating a robot that we can just drop into a totally new environment and that can complete a wide range of useful tasks like we see here uh, on the left. And you know, there's certainly many problems we need to solve before we get our own uh, rosy robots, including better hardware and, and sensing. But I'd argue that one of the core challenges lies in generalization, right? Such a robot needs to generalize across tasks, uh, objects, and environments. So it, it shouldn't, for instance, need to relearn how to make a cup of coffee just because it's given a new mug or, or placed into a new kitchen. And this is in sharp contrast to kind of the current state of uh, robotic learning, where methods generally either require uh, hand design, like domain-specific state and action abstractions, or are learned purely through something like months of uh, online reinforcement learning. So while these approaches can provide uh, impressive behaviors and, and immense value in kind of constraint settings like warehouses or, or factories, they're still very much tied to the domains that they were designed for or, or trained on uh, with limited generalization to novel scenes. So for example, if we were to change the background in this grasping robot on the bottom, uh, the policy would likely fail completely. So really the, the problem we're interested in is to is in uh, getting our robots to, to generalize. And perhaps us uh, roboticists can can draw some inspiration from other fields of machine learning like NLP and vision, which have seen some you know very promising results in, in recent years. And in particular, we've seen this paradigm of uh, foundation models uh, be very effective where we have large models trained on massive diverse data sets with scalable object objectives. So things like self-supervised or, or cheaply supervised learning. Uh, and as a result, these models tend to generalize quite broadly and can be reused and adapted for, for many different downstream tasks and, and problem domains. Uh, and so really, ideally, we'd like to do something similar for robotics. Uh, so the big question is, well, what, what's missing? And I'd argue that one of the biggest missing pieces in, in robotics is, is the data, right? So we've definitely seen some great progress uh, in scaling up the collection of real world robotics data sets as well as building more diverse simulated environments. And, and these are really important research questions. But at least right now, I would say that these options still lack the sort of scale, uh, diversity, and quality of behaviors that we need to get our robots to, to really generalize. Uh, so in this talk, the, the key question I'll be exploring is if we can instead use videos of humans, uh, or at least uh, supplement learning with these data sets with, with videos of humans. And because unlike our, our robotics data sets, uh, human video data sets tend to be of a much larger scale uh, with realistic behaviors taking place in, in many diverse uh, and realistic environments. Of course, at the same time, uh, they contain a different embodiment, which makes makes learning from them non-trivial. Great. So, so today I'll be covering three works along this uh, vein. Uh, first, I'll be talking about how we can learn more general purpose reward functions uh, for robots by using human videos. Then I'll discuss how we can do uh, visual pre-training on data sets like Ego4D uh, and how that can enable more efficient robotic imitation learning. And finally, uh, I'll discuss our latest work uh, where we aim to pre-train a single model on human videos that can be used for many different types of uh, robotic applications. Yeah, so that's the, the outline of what I'm gonna cover today. And, and we'll start by talking about reward functions. And to begin with, uh, you know, what are reward functions and, and why do we care about them, right? So in the most general form, a reward function is a measure of how effectively an agent is completing a, a desired task, where ideally maximizing the reward, you know, produces the, the desired behavior. And, and these reward functions are essential for doing any reinforcement learning, often for doing planning, uh, success detection, knowing when to ask for help. And so these reward functions are, are, are important for learning, but actually designing them or even learning a reward function uh, for, for a particular environment can be difficult. And often what was learned or designed won't translate to, to new environments. So if we could get a reward function that could kind of be used out of the box uh, in a new environment and for new tasks, uh, I think that would be an important step towards enabling uh, real world robot learning. And that's what we, we sought to do. We wanted to see if can we train a, a reward function using human video data and, and get it to be more general purpose. And this work was uh, led by Annie Chen. And so concretely, uh, the, the problem setup we're going to consider here 
is that during training, we're going to have a small amount of robot data from one environment. So just robot in one environment doing a few tasks, and we'll have some small amount of demonstrations of that. And we'll have access to a, a human video data set, in this case, the something something data set, which will have uh, you know, many tasks being pre performed in many different environments. And our goal is going to be to learn a reward function such that at, at test time, we can take the agent into a, a new environment and give it a new task. Uh, and give it uh, a specification of the task, in this case, a, a video of the human uh, doing what the desired task is, and instantiate a reward function uh, such that, you know, training with our reward function will get our agent to, to complete the task. Uh, so hopefully that problem setup uh, makes sense. And, and really, the, yeah, like I mentioned, the key question we want to understand is, does including this blue box on the left, does training the reward with human videos enable it to better generalize to unseen environments and tasks versus just training with robot data. And before I get into the, the evaluation, I'll just you know, quickly describe how are we actually uh, training this reward function? And, and the idea is quite simple. Uh, we call it a DVD, Domain Agnostic Video Discriminator. It's really just a model that's going to take us input uh, two videos, and it's going to predict a binary classification of whether they're doing uh, the same task or not. Uh, and we're going to train this on all of our robot videos as well as all the uh, human videos we have from, in this case, from the something something data set. So here we can see, okay, both of these tasks, are, both of these videos are closing something, so they should be doing the same task. Um, in this case, moving something away is what the human's doing, which is while well, the robot's closing something. Uh, so this is a negative and, and so on. Yeah. And so once we've uh, pre-trained the reward in this way, uh, we can you know, potentially just use it in novel tasks and environments where we're going to give First, the agent's behavior is one video, and the task specification video is the other, and then use that score uh, as the reward. So in our, our main experiment, what we wanted to evaluate is, does training it with uh, human videos enable better generalization? So to test this, we set up a suite of a few different uh, simulated robotic environments. So we have our sort of initial environment here, uh, you can see on the left. And then we've uh, also designed some test environments where we gradually introduce some uh, domain shifts. So we change the colors, change the viewpoint, change the arrangement of the objects. And then what we're going to do is we're going to train the reward function either on just the data from the initial environment or from the initial environment and human videos. And then we're going to evaluate policy, uh, like the, the robot success rate, using this reward in all these different environments. And what we can see here is the, the green bars, which uh, measure basically just using robot data compared to the pink and the red bars using robot data and, and human videos. We see that the performance uh, when using human videos is, is much better. And especially if we look at the test environments, when you go from the train to the test environment, you see a, a big drop if you're only using robot data, but we actually see a much, a much smaller and smoother drop if we're uh, also using human videos. Uh, and overall in these test environments, we're getting over 20% higher success rates if our robot's using a reward that, that is also trained with human videos. So what does this actually look like? Uh, so this is kind of an example. We'll condition the agent on a video like the, like the video we see on the left. And then we can see that the reward's gonna encourage the robot to do you know, functionally similar behavior. Like, and this is the actual agent rollouts we see on the right when trained with that uh, reward. And we see something similar here for, for turning the faucet. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover it today, but we also ran a very similar experiment uh, looking at uh, task generalization where we held out some tasks, uh, as well as experiments on the real robot uh, in the setup we see here. And in those settings as well, we observed that uh, training with the human videos, we saw much better generalization to both environments and tasks, both in the simulated setup and in the real world. So the key takeaway for uh, DVD is that we can actually learn these sort of multitask reward functions on a mix of robot and in the wild uh, human videos. And by leveraging uh, the diverse human video data, uh, we actually get a reward function that generalizes much better to unseen environments and tasks. Uh, and, and so this was our first work actually on the, on the topic where we were exploring using human videos in, in robotics. And, and this result got me really excited uh, that you know, human video data could boost generalization and supplement the data we have in, in robotics. And so the natural kind of next question that uh, I asked myself was, well, can we, can we go beyond uh, rewards? 
And so this brings me to the, the second work that I'm, I'm going to talk about today, where we're going to look at if we can uh, perform visual pre-training on, on human video data. And to motivate this uh, a little bit, uh, I'll start by talking about, you know, there's just the standard robot learning pipeline. Uh, you know, what, what do us kind of roboticists go through a day to day when we're trying to get our robots to do something? Uh, normally, suppose, you know, I, I wanted to have my robot here uh, learn to fold my towel for me. Normally, what I might do is I might collect some demonstrations by teleoperating the robot and then train a policy from, from those, uh, you know, image observations to output actions and then deploy it. But in practice, uh, you know, chances are this, this won't work out of the box and often uh, will be very data inefficient and will require a large amount of demonstrations before it performs well, which places a lot of burden on me as a, as a teleoperator uh, controlling the robot. So really we'd like to make this uh, much more efficient. And what would be great is if we could just go onto the internet and download some pre-trained visual representation and then just collect a small amount of demonstrations uh, and, and then train a policy and deploy it from this pre-trained fixed pre-trained representation and hopefully get get good performance. All right, if we could do this, this this would be great. And certainly we're we're actually not, you know, we're not the first ones to to think of this. And in fact, uh, a number of prior works in the last couple of years have uh, found that existing vision backbones like ImageNet uh, pre-trained models or, or clip models are effective for embodied AI. And, and so while it's great that these sort of vision models not trained for robotics are useful, it kind of raises an interesting question, which is if we were to pre-train uh, a vision model, particularly for uh, vision motor control, uh, how would we do so? And could we improve over these existing, existing models? And, and towards this goal of pre-training a visual representation for uh, robotic manipulation, we're faced with two key questions, right? What is the right data to pre-train on for robotics? and what's the right objective to produce a good representation. And on the side of the data, we know we need large and diverse data sets that should involve real world interaction. And given the subject of the, the talk and the workshop we're at, it's probably pretty clear uh, what, what I'm gonna say next, which is that we think the natural choice is using uh, you know, diverse in the wild human video data sets. And this, in this work, it was the Eco4D data, um, which contains diverse real world interaction paired with, with language annotations. Now on the side of the objective, uh, we hypothesize that there's three kind of main components we wanted our, our, our representation to, to have. Uh, the first being that the features should capture some notion of uh, temporal dynamics, right? Because any robot using this for vision motor control is going to be sequentially interacting uh, in its environment. Second, it should capture features particularly with language, right? Because language informs what part of the, the image or video is relevant to, to the task at hand. And finally, because we want to do more data efficient imitation learning with this representation, we think it should produce a, a sparse and, and compact representation. So motivated by these uh, factors, we, we propose R3M, reusable representations for robotic manipulation where we start with the Ego 4D uh, video data paired with natural language. And then we train our representation uh, first with time contrastive learning. So this is going to encourage images closer in time to be closer in embedding space. Uh, with language video alignment, where we're encouraging our three features to be predictive of whether uh, video and language annotation match. And then finally with uh, just L1 uh, and also L2 uh, as part of the penalties. What we're then going to do is just take this single frozen pre-trained representation and we're going to use it to do more efficient robot learning in a pretty wide range of real world and, and simulated tasks. So in evaluating R3M, really the first thing we, we wanted to understand is does it enable more efficient imitation learning in unseen environments and tasks? So we put together this, this evaluation suite uh, that we're, where we're looking at low data imitation learning. So just a handful of demonstrations from, with pixels and actions for all these tasks we see here on the left uh, from a couple different uh, robotics environments. And then we're gonna encode uh, these images with the fixed representation that train a small policy on top to, to do control. Okay. And then we're gonna evaluate on these environments, tasks, uh, also all of which include multiple viewpoints. And what we see first is that uh, R3M actually achieves you know, over a 60% uh, success rate across all these uh, domains, despite never being trained on any data from 
these uh, these these environments or tasks, right? So this is still a pre-trained uh, frozen encoder that's never seen a, seen a robot before, and still we get pretty good uh, success rates. Uh, the second thing we observe is that compared to uh, some existing visual representations that have been seen to be pretty good for embodied AI, like CLIP, MOCA models, and, and supervised ImageNet, we get a, a pretty significant improvement uh, by using R3, more than 10% in uh, the success rate of the policy. And then finally, and perhaps unsurprisingly, compared to learning from scratch and not using any pre-trained representation, uh, there's a big improvement to using R3M or, or any uh, pre-trained pre model. The next thing uh, we wanted to understand is, you know, the, the R3M objective has a number of parts, you know, what parts are, are most important? And, and first we, we noted that, yeah, if we remove the sparsity uh, penalty, if we remove some of the augmentations we do during training, we do see, see a dip in performance. Uh, but actually the biggest drop in performance we found was if we removed the, the language supervision, um, particularly on the, on the hand manipulation tasks. Uh, we, saw, we saw a big drop without the, the language uh, component. Uh, but what's interesting is that even without the language uh, objective, this fully self-supervised version of R3M still is getting better performance than what we got out of some of the existing models like, like MoCo and, and, and Clip. The next question uh, we wanted to, to understand was, you know, how important is the data? Because in R3M, we kind of proposed two, two new things. First, we were using Eagle4D, which hadn't been done before in, in a robotic setting. Uh, and then we also proposed this, this new uh, training objective. So which one was more important? What was really contributing uh, to the success of the model? Uh, and to test this, we compared first against a, a very head-to-head -head comparison where we used the exact same uh, frames of Eagle4D that we trained R3M, but we trained a MoCo model uh, to pre-train our representation. And then we also compared to MVP, which is uh, another um, current work that, that trained a masked autoencoder on Eagle4D and, and a bigger pool of uh, human video data. And the first thing we notice is that the data is indeed important. So actually comparing the MoCo Eagle4D model to a MoCo model trained on ImageNet, we do see an improvement. Uh, so even with the same objective, using Eagle4D for robotics is doing better than, than using say ImageNet for pre-training. Uh, but we also see that R3M still improves over this model. So, so I think the conclusion is that both the data and the objective uh, were important to the, the final performance here. Uh, and, this, and in this evaluation suite, we found that actually both of these outperformed the, the MAE-based uh, MVP model. Great. And, and then the, lastly, we wanted to, uh, you know, ultimately the motivation, right, going back to the towel folding robot, was that we wanted to do data efficient imitation learning in the real world. Uh, and we want to test if R3M can do this. So, uh, you know, I, to test this, I actually took our Franco robot into my uh, apartment and given, you know, less than 10 minutes of supervision per task, uh, we trained policies like for putting the lettuce in the pan, pushing the mug to the goal, closing the drawer. Uh, and in all these, in all these uh, tasks, it's the same again, a frozen, frozen visual backbone that uh, he has not seen a robot before that, that we're using here. And then all of these tasks also involve some, some visual uh, randomization in the target object. And in total, what we found was that uh, in our real world setting, uh, actually using Arthur more than doubled the, the success rate of the clip. Uh, so overall, I think our experiment suggested that Arthur can be used off the shelf and, and give a uh, pretty good performance. We've try to make it uh, very easy to use. And one of the things that's been particularly exciting is that we've already seen uh, some adoption in, in the community. Uh, so there's been uh, you know, independent research from a number of institutions that, that have found benefits to using R3M. So for example, here's some work from, from CMU uh, that used a R3M pre-trained model. There's some work from University of Freiburg that got state of the art performance on the, the Calvin benchmark um, using R3M as well as some work uh, from Stanford that found that uh, fine-tuning out there models in, in some cases was performing better than fine-tuning them all trained on uh, in-domain data, which was uh, quite interesting. So overall, I think we, we were uh, you know, quite excited about this. And I think this tells us that we, you know, there are some promising signs uh, uh, that we can pre-train representations on human videos that are good at imitation learning. Uh, but moving on now to the, the next uh, work I'd like to talk about, how can we get a representation that's good for more than just uh, imitation learning? 
right? Because in fact, the reality is, is that robot learning consists of much more than just doing single task imitation. There's a number of problems from detecting grasps to language condition object detection or imitation uh, to scoring intensive rewards. And so while we do see that something like R3M uh, can be pretty, pretty effective for single task imitation, uh, what do we need to train a model that can be effective for all of these applications? And towards answering this question, I, I think it's helpful to think about sort of two extremes in, in representation learning for robotics, right? On one hand, we, you can focus on semantic pre-training where representations capture high level features, things like supervised image net or, or clip. On the other hand, you can have, you know, reconstruction like approaches which capture more robust uh, low level features, things like mass outline coders. And I'd say R3M does fall somewhere somewhere in the middle, uh, but different downstream you know, robotic applications may require more of one than the other, right? So how do we actually balance these extremes uh, effectively? And, and this was the motivation uh, for our work Voltron, language-driven representation learning for robotics led by uh, Sid Karamchetti. And our key insight here is that we can balance the high-level semantic and low-level features by training off language conditioning and, and generation. So concretely, uh, we're gonna be training a, a single multimodal masked autoencoder model that either reconstructs frames given language conditioning and the masked inputs, or reconstructs and generates language from just the masked input frames, right? So the former is going to be encouraging capturing more low level pixel-wise features, while the latter is gonna encourage uh, capturing high level features, features from which a uh, sequence of frames you can predict in language what, what's happening in those frames. Right? And we can just simply tune a, a single hyperparameter that's going to balance how, how often we condition versus how often we generate language uh, to kind of alternate between high level and, and low level features. Okay. And what really excites me about uh, Voltron is that when we train the model in this way, uh, the pre-trained model can be used for uh, in a number of different ways, right? So for example, it can be used as a single image representation, uh, but it can also be uh, you know, used as a language condition representation of, of a sequence of frames, or you could even, uh, you know, just give it a sequence of frames and get out a basically a, a captioning uh, model. And so in our evaluation, we, we wanted to test this, the model's ability to be used in a number of different ways in different robotics applications. Uh, and in our initial experiments, we're looking at uh, Voltron models with a bit small or base architecture trained on the something something data set compared to R3M and MVP models with the same data and same architecture. And so we began by testing it on more vision focused tasks where we use the, the frozen pre-trained uh, Voltron model uh, to, to do a grounding of target objects described in language and uh, grasp affordance prediction. And what we see is that in both cases, uh, it significantly outperforms the R3M and MVP models that are trained on the same data, as well as actually existing models like CLIP and uh, MVP uh, that uh, you know, actually see more data. Moving on to imitation learning, we again see strong performance from the Voltron models compared to R3M and MVP on the same data. Uh, we do see that the something something Voltron model still falls behind uh, R3M trained on Ego 4D. Uh, and so, you know, I think there is a performance improvement we, we see going from something something to Ego 4D. And we're currently training and working on scaling up Voltron models to Ego 4D and getting more of a, a head to head comparison, comparison there. But overall, we're seeing pretty strong performance on, on single task imitation, as well as on language condition imitation, because actually in language condition imitation, right, we can use the language condition visual representation that, that Voltron gives us. And so here we're, we're training a single policy that will be specified in, in natural language to do a task like throw the bag of chips away or discard the, the used coffee pods. And, and overall we see strong performance and we see especially uh, strong performance when it comes to visual distractors. So what we do is we, we had an experiment here and this is on the bottom right where between the training demonstrations and evaluation, we uh, swapped in some, some different visual distractors. So we changed the book from uh, purple to green. Uh, we put in the iPad playing a cartoon in the background. Uh, and we see that, you know, when we go, when we add in this um, domain shift, uh, Voltron has the smallest drop in performance. And we suspect that the fact that the representation is conditional language and ideally should be paying attention to the features that describe the language is playing a part in this, in this robustness. 
And then finally, we, we looked at how well Voltron models can be used to provide a reward function like we were looking at with, with DVD, but this time it's a language conditioned reward function, right? So we can evaluate the likelihood of some target language instruction given a sequence of frames and, and use that as a, as a reward. And here we just have a, a qualitative experiment, but we can see that you know, for this task of uh, opening the faucet, the Voltron score much more closely tracks what, what you know, intuitively is the right reward for the task than we get out of a CLIP or, or R3M scores. So I'd say the key takeaway here is that Voltron trains a flexible multimodal model that balances low level and, and high level features. And as a result, it's pretty effective, not just for you know, one type of robotic task, but across a pretty wide range of uh, robotics applications. And, and like R3M, we again, tried to make it very easy to use and, and to incorporate uh, Voltron into any existing stack. And we've also open sourced the entire evaluation suite, which has both the imitation learning and the, uh, um, the you know, grasp affordance prediction tasks all in one code base that's, that's really nice to use. So, uh, if you're interested in trying to train some models on, on EO4D or any of these big human video data sets and evaluating them, uh, I'd encourage you to check out the, uh, the benchmark we released. Great, so I have, a, I think, a, a few minutes left here. So ju just to, to sum up, uh, I think you know, human videos are, are definitely a very powerful source of data uh, for training our, our robots. In, in the work that I talked about today, we've seen that training uh, on a mix of robot and human data can enable more generalizable reward functions. And that we can pre-train uh, representations purely on, on human videos that enable more efficient learning in, in robotics across a wide range of different types of uh, robotics tasks. So overall, I, I think it's a, a really exciting time to be working at the intersection of, of human videos and, and robot learning. Um, and, and before I wrap up, I'd actually just uh, have like to make one kind of final note on, on multimodality. You know, one trend we've been seeing a lot in, in the robot learning uh, community recently is kind of the growing importance of, of having agents learn from many different types of sensor inputs, be that vision and touch, or in some of our recent work, uh, vision and audio, where we have an agent you know, extracting keys from a bag and when it can't see, it has to listen with a microphone attached to the gripper to try and locate and uh, extract the keys. And so going forward, I think, you know, how we can bring this multimodality to, to pre-training and how we can you, know, you do pre-training with data sets like Ego4D, but also incorporate not just the, the visual and language aspect, but also things like audio, uh, I think is a question that I find fascinating uh, going forward. Uh, and with that, I think I'm at time and uh, we can maybe leave a couple minutes for, for questions, uh, but I'd like to, of course, thank all my, my collaborators who contributed to, to these works uh, and the links to all the papers I talked about are, are here. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? So, um, anyone from the audience? I have a question. I hope you can hear us. Um, so, my concern is you use the term human videos, and I want to, to pull you into why ego particularly has worked. So, there are three aspects here. Mm -hmm. Is the head motion helping? And that's what kind of ego has made such a big advantage. Is it that actually the people are performing some daily life tasks that's not captured by the internet? Mm -hmm. Or is it the way we narrated Ego4D into this fine grain that made the difference? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and I think in some way, all those aspects are important. I, I think especially the, the last two that you described, right? So when it's narrated and segmented uh, and we have nice language instructions that accompany uh, the, 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 the videos, I think that is really helpful because it, it breaks it down into tasks and, and tasks that are in a similar form that we might want to assign our robot and with a paired language too, right? Because we try and ultimately would like to have a language conditioned robot as well. And so, so I think that task segmentation and narration is very useful. Uh, and the, the second one as well, the fact that these are, uh, you know, large scale, uh, and happening in real world environments, because that's that's really what's missing in our robotics data sets. It's probably the biggest thing is that we don't have data in so many diverse and realistic environments where we actually want to deploy our robots one day. And that's what uh, you know data sets like Ego4D have. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.
who is on the line. I just need to project. Oh. Okay. Probably this. So similar to the ego for D. Um, plans, we also are having two sessions here, but as opposite to them, we're actually starting with the awards and then going into the winner's talks. But I'll start by telling you what happened for to every kitchens between 2022, when we met last time, and this year. And I will present two things primarily now, and one thing in the closing ceremony, if you're still around with us, on the impact and other things you might want to look at. And I'll start by what I'm currently calling the EPEC trilogy. And uh, this wasn't really the plan, I think, when we came up last year. I don't think that we're going to put that much out in one year. So um, I'm really grateful to the teams involved. Last year when we met, we showed you Visor, which is these you know, manual annotations of hands and interactive objects. And this was released after CDPR, so beginning of July. And as you will see, we have a set of challenges now associated with the visor. So I'm assuming you've seen that. I'm not going to spend much time on that. The second part of the trilogy, which also came out in the last 12 months, was Epic Sounds. Um, and this is work primarily by uh, Jason and Jacob. And I have to uh, you know, say that the amount of effort they've done in listening to these audio signals is impressive. And um, the idea here is, in addition to the visual labels that we've collected over you know, the past years, this is audio only annotations of ongoing actions. Um, so basically, oh, I'm not sure I shared the audio, right? Maybe we can skip this. This is but people only listening to the audio and annotating what we're seeing from the audio uh, signal solely. And then if you actually look at the contrast between what people see in the audio and what they see in the video, then you can see that some of the assumptions we used to make, like the person can recognize opening bag from audio um, over the years hasn't been absolutely correct. So this is offering a new insight into what audio only can provide. And indeed, Epic Sounds is this data set of 79,000, okay, 79,000 categorized audio events of 44 classes, but also 39,000 uncategorized events. So someone saying I could see, some, I could hear something, but I don't know what it is. Only a subset of this is being used in the challenges now. Um, so these are the types of of, audio signal, of, of classes uh, that we have put up, but just to explain exactly what we have out for the challenge. So we've already released the train and valve. So these are available along with the timestamps. So the start and end time of the audio event and the label. Then we have a subset, which is the recognition subset that is released with timestamps. So you have the timestamps available and you only need to recognize the audio. But there is another subset, which is the detection one, we don't yet have an ongoing challenge for it, uh, but that's coming at some point uh, in the future. Both of the recognition and the detection form the test set. My computer is acting funny, but yeah. Both of them are forming the test set. For now, what you will see in the challenges today is purely the recognition uh, part of the audio-based pipe, uh, uh, audio-based recognition. 
and we will be announcing the winners for these. But if you're interested in audio detection, that's hopefully coming soon. And this is how uh, Epic Sounds had been annotated, where people were given just the audio signal and they were asked to annotate the start and end time of any audio event and describe it on the left here via the free form description. They could say, I can hear water, I can hear some clang, I can hear some, um, some something that's hitting a surface. From these free form descriptions, uh, Jason and uh, Jacob grouped these into meaningful clusters that form these audio classes. After doing that, we went into everything that's a collision sound and annotated it with the material that these annotations interact, the annotations showcase. Sometimes there is one material and some other times there is more than, so glass hitting metal or wood. The last part of the trilogy, and if you were with us this morning, then Andrea kindly presented it very nicely. So this is the Epic Fields data set. And what you're seeing in this example is a 3D reconstruction of one of our Epic Kitchens. You also see samples of the camera poses. So this is, for example, the person entering the kitchen. This is their first view. And this is the estimated camera as they enter. If you keep track of this long trajectory, and this is just like a minute and a half of this video. So it's not even the full extent. You see the person going all the way towards the, um, the hub. They're actually setting off the alarm. And then they go and head to this area. So this is where this camera here is. And you can see them picking something from behind the, um, the laundry. Uh, the, my brain is, is uh, tired today. From behind the, what, the drainer. From behind the drainer. And then they go there and put it on the surface. They go and pick the onion and they put it there. So again, this is less than a minute. And what we've released is camera estimations for the full extent of Epic Kitchens. Um, so we have the full video that some of you had seen before. I just want to highlight part of it, which is an integration now of the various things. So you can see now that we're able to position hands using the visor annotations and the Epic fields in 3D. So this is just out fresh from the press and credit to the team to actually pushing it just before we meet here today. Um, we also have some analysis of how big these kitchens are. So we have a diverse, a diverse set of kitchen sizes based on the number of 3D points we built, as well as the, the registration and reconstruction time we took, depending on the length of the video. This is basically the time cost we're you know, saving the community that we're giving you camera poses. So you don't need to attempt to build any of these camera estimations. Epic Fields is larger than anything that has been used by that dynamic new view synthesis. I know nothing about new view synthesis, but kindly the team at Oxford are really pushing um, on this. So a potential for a challenge in the future. Um, I would like to hear from the people involved whether that is of interest. Okay, so this is what happened in the data set over the past 12 months. And now we go into the nine challenges that were opened in January this year and closed on the 1st of June. And then we have a set of winners to announce. Just a reminder, the first round for Epic Kitchen's challenges was in 2019. Then we had only two challenges, action recognition and action anticipation. This was a, a meeting in person. Uh, that was an achievement. We didn't know then that in person is going to be such a rare occurrence. Um, and these were all the set of winners then. And there is a technical report from 2019. 2020, we were all completely virtual. Uh, this is the set of winners for the 2020 challenge where we added object detection as a third challenge. This did not continue for the reasons of collecting visors that we realized that bonding boxes isn't going to solve Epic Kitchens. Uh, the 2021 was the big extension because that was associated with Epic Kitchens 100, the big extension, where the number of challenges increased to five. These are currently ongoing this year. And this is the combined, um, this is again the virtual set of challenges. That, Again, we did meet in 2021, and 2022 was a combined hybrid approach. Uh, there were some people who received their awards in person and some who were online, and this year will be very similar. Some are here with us in the room, and some hopefully will be joining online to receive their awards. So we have four new challenges associated with Visor Epic Sounds, as well as a work by our colleagues here on the Trek 150 dataset, which we didn't release as part of the Epic original team, but they had kindly annotated um, bounding boxes of single object tra tracking, and we will be announcing winners for this challenge as well. On each of the new leaderboards, people really spent time to create the code lab, et cetera. 
um, and people were able to submit results in addition to the five ongoing challenges. I wanted to mention one special case, which is the semi-supervised video object segmentation. And that is that the leaderboard available online is only for the VAL set, not for the test set. So people only can submit to the VAL set. And so we have the VAL ground truth and the evaluation code on Coda Lab. And there is the uh, small Docker on Coda Lab that compares this and produces results. But once people submit to VAL, they had to evaluate on test. And on the test set, we did not want to release the first frame. So video object segmentation about the fact that you start from a single frame and you track. And because we have other challenges, we didn't want to release a single frame. So Ahmed created a Docker file that people can start with, and then they can actually give us their full model, which we evaluate at our end. So this is the only challenge out of the Epic challenges where you don't just submit to the uh, leaderboard. You actually had to send us your full solution as Docker, and we had to evaluate it on, other, on, the, on our end. So you'd give the code based on the package, and then on our side, we will have the Docker running the test ground truth and producing the results. This was an adventurous thing, and we ran into some issues, including some team sending us like an ensemble of 20 things that we couldn't run at our end. So we had to restrict what we could run, and that's something to think for the future. Because really, you know, some of the teams just wanted, I don't know, 20 GPUs for 20 days to run the test, and we just could not evaluate that. We had not anticipated that, to be fair. So this was an interesting test, and we're grateful to the two teams that participated on the test set. Okay. Um, another thing is action anticipation, which was always a very hot and interesting topic. Epic Kitchens really assisted anticipation, um, the first version. There were no submissions this year, not because there weren't any, but because um, people could not beat the three leader, the three winnings from last year. Um, it's quite interesting. I want to highlight that because many people still produce results on Val and publish papers. And when asked by reviewers, why don't you submit to the test set? Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I was an AC on a, on a paper and the reviewer who wasn't from the Epic team said, why don't you produce results on the test set? And they said they did. Um, and I know because I have access to the leaderboard that they didn't because they couldn't win the test set. So we are running into issues into how Val and test interplay. And as a community, we might want to think and discuss. And as I said, in the closing statements today, we might want to ask for your feedback on what we should do forward. So um, there were attempts to win anticipation, but no submissions because no one could reach the top three of last year. If you remember in 2020, we came up with this crazy idea that we want all methods to still be submitted to the leaderboard, even if they use more data than others. And we came up with this idea that it's suitable for anonymity, and we propose this discrete approach where people flag their submissions with the amount of knowledge they're using. So we have this thing where it says, if you're using some private data, which is available to certain big companies, and maybe some universities, who knows, then you just need to flag your submission by number five. If you are actually doing self-supervision on some large public data beyond Epic Kitchens, which could be Ego4D, then you flag your data as number four, et cetera. And we thought we're gonna create one leaderboard, but with all these flags. We had some set of flags for pre-training, some for what type of labels you use, and a third flag for what you train on. Do you train on train, val, or train, val, and additional data? And, you know, I still think this is the way forward. Uh, I could be wrong. So each method would evaluate. And we know here that method one, for example, and method two are not directly comparable on the pre-training because one had access to a lot of data. And the idea we had is that we still will know what's the top performance on this data set while still allowing people to say, this is not directly comparable. For example, in action recognition now, the top two winning team significantly use more training data. And my fear and concern is the same, which is next year we will not be able to break these numbers because people will not have access to the same amount of training data. The suggestion always given to me when I mentioned this is create two leaderboards, one leaderboard for the privileged and one leaderboard for the poor. And I'm like, you know, but the whole idea with these flags is actually to keep everything in the leaderboard, but allow people to communicate what exactly makes a difference. At the moment, I am failing to pass the message to others because again, people, if they don't get the top three, even if these flags are not directly comparable, they don't want to kind of showcase on the main leaderboard. They don't want to submit a report because we all want to be in the top three. 
So again, that's a big question for the community to answer. Um, I think that will become more and more of an issue as more data becomes available. And I don't think we should build two leaderboards, one for the privileged and one for the poor, because you know that's not the, the, the idea. And who knows if uh, pre-training helps. The whole idea of these three SLS scores is to know the dimensions and the advantages. So that's something to reflect. Uh, but again, I think in 2024, it will be very hard again to beat the baseline on action recognition. Any questions before we go into the awards? Yeah, reflections, thoughts, if you have any ideas, let us know. Awards and winning talks. And again, if you are virtual or here, um, please turn your camera on so that we can take a picture of you as you receive your virtual award. So Toby is our photographer. If you're here in the room, make sure that you smile to his camera. We start with action recognition and the top award goes to the team from UT Austin. And uh, we're gonna hear from them later, but for now, please give them a round of applause. You want to go here? Uh, oh, okay, let's go here. <laughs> Maybe come here. Yeah. The second team, I believe uh, we did not award the second team, but we have a third award for the team from China Telecom Corporation. I think I see them online, but you need to turn your camera on. Fantastic. So, right. Can I make these bigger? What's the right way to do that? Here. Okay, I think we can see you. We just need a big smile so that we can take a picture. Thank you. Yeah, smile, big, big smile. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you. In the action detection, in the first place, we have the team from, uh, a combined team from Paradigm, Ghanaian University and University of Wisconsin. We have the team here in place. Fantastic. And in the second place, Toby, you should receive your award so someone else might take a picture. And that's the, the team, the bias team from the University of Wisconsin. And now we go into, into uh, UDA, which is Unsupervised Domain Adaptation for Action Recognition. And we have the team from the Institute of in Info Research. Let's see, are they online? Um, NUS and Shing University. Do we have someone from the team online? Yes, no, last chance. One, two, three. Okay. In the second place, we have the team from Polytechnic di Torino. I know they are online. So, yeah. Camera, big smile. You might want to turn your microphone on. I think that's the only way you become. Uh, uh, how do we do that? Did I pin someone on? No, I didn't. Uh, I need to pin, I think. Okay, yeah, that's all. Very good. We're going to hear from them later. Can I go back a slide? Okay. Camera on again from very good. We're going to put this into a nice collage eventually. So no one will know who's online and who's not online. Next, again, a team who has uh, successfully won two awards uh, and they're here in person from the University of Austin. on multi-instance action retrieval in second place. Again, we're going to the China Telecom Corporation and that's something we should- Yeah, yeah, I'm here. It's inspiring that uh, we always wanted people to win multiple awards. Okay, replace Ben. 
I should practice this. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank Big you. smile. <laughs> I think they can hear us, but somehow we can't hear them. And in third place, we have the team from the University of Udine. I think you want to come here so that you don't. Oh, not this. Almost. Almost. Excellent. In semi supervised video object segmentation, and then, then maybe you should start and come receive, uh, give the awards for the visor challenges as a representative of the visor team. Uh, I don't think we have the first team in place. Do we have them online? It's not online. Okay. I think they sent us a recording. So I think it's just too late at the end. In second place, we have the team from university are they in person you don't think you can see them okay hand object segmentation we have team from a star singapore hmm. this is not going well Okay. And in second place, we have the team from Shidan University. In third place. Then, then I think that might be like a, not, not very successful. I don't think any of our teams are online or in the room, but we will send them their certificates. Thank you. Uh, next is the hosted group. Uh, so this is the Trek 150 team. Is anyone here? Let's hope that we have people here or online so that you can award the, set, the prizes that we have. Two certificates to award. If not, we will take a picture of you with the certificates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any of the first or the second team online? You can't see them online? Okay. Let's take a picture of Christian with the two awards. With a big smile. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, the Epic Sounds team. And I do believe they are supposed to be online. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm So here. in the... Yeah. We're going to hear from this from the team later. But in the first award, for the first time we're doing the audio only, we have the team from TCL AI Lab. Big smile. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. OK, thank you. In the second place, we have the team from Shidian University. Are they with us? I don't think so, I think. And in third place, it's a combined team from Southwest University, Samsung, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So what do we have next? Hopefully we'll be able to post all these wherever people are. It's two talks. One talk is the combined winning from Action Recognition MyR, and another um, is from the Action Detection team. We will break, and after the break, we will hear from some of the other winners in either a combination of virtual and recorded talks. With no further ado, the team from UT Austin, from UT Austin, it's time to tell us about your model that you want to challenge it.
Um, okay, it's very nice to be here again today. Um, okay, yeah. Um, okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, Okay, um, it's very nice to be here again today uh, to present our uh, solution to the uh, both the action recognition challenge and the multi instance retrieval challenge. So, uh, as I have already talked uh, in the morning, um, contrastive uh, video language pre training has become a very powerful tool for uh, video understanding. So for example, people have verified like we can pre-train on how to 100 million and then have a amazing result on instructional video. And then in this work, we're gonna show like uh, we can pre-train on Eagle 4D and then have huge performance gain on uh, ecocentric video benchmarks. Um, so the work that we built upon is the Lavella, which I will gonna present in this year's uh, CPR, uh, which basically have a language augmented video language pre-training uh, pipeline. So we repurposed the large language model to be the video con uh, visually conditioned narrator so that it can densely narrate the entire video and then provide more dense and then more diverse video text pairs uh, compared with the human narr uh, narr uh, narrations only. Uh, but this is not the thing that, uh, that I'm going to talk, talk about in this talk because otherwise that will be boring. Uh, I'm going to talk about the challenges. Um, so so here, here's our basically two challenges. One is that we have these kind of million scales of video text pairs, uh, which have huge uh, uh, challenge for like uh, loading these videos efficiently. Uh, this is from the IO side. And this, the other is definitely from the GPU memory because I think uh, so my previous work uh, was uh, fortunately be conducted using like 32 or 40, uh, 64 like V100 uh, GPUs which are, I don't think it's impossible for the laboratory to do that. Um, the, the reason is very simple because uh, we have these huge video models and it's uh, the video model compared to the image model, it has huge per sample memory cost. So the maximum batch size that we're gonna have for each GPU is very small. Uh, and then in order to make sure the contrastive learning we're gonna work, so we, we need to uh, sort of uh, scale up the number of GPUs to make sure the contrastive loss works well. Otherwise, it will lead to some collapse issue. So we're going to fix this issue in our uh, solution. Uh, so we basically try to optimize the video VIT. So we use video VIT uh, in a plain version, which just do uh, uh, joint spatial and temporal attention here. And starting from the baseline, we observe that if we use flash attention, it can significantly just remove the memory consumption on the attention bottleneck. So for like a VIT base model, actually we can remove like 60% of the memory consumption. And then we can also try to use some more techniques like gradient checkpointing, try to trade off, but this is kind of a trade off between the computation and the sort of the, 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 the training efficiency because we need to do an uh, additional step of forward during bad propagation when using the gradient checkpointing. Uh, but that's fine because we essentially want to increase the batch size. So we, we, we just trade it for to do that. Yeah. So from the uh, figure here, we can see significant uh, increase of batch size if we use both techniques. And as a result, we see a increase of training throughput. Uh, and then it's the, the like using gradient checkpoint, it will reduce the training throughput uh, by uh, like 20%, but that's something like we can accept that, right? Um, so the issue is basically like, if we increase this batch size, think about that we are using like Eagle 4D or like Epic Kitchen videos. These videos are huge and large. So typically like uh, the average length is like 20 minutes per video, which means like if we even reduce the resolution to be like 30, uh, like 300 uh, pixels uh, on the shorter scale, uh, it still have like a hundred megabytes for each video. So which is like, if we have a batch size of like around 200, that would be like gigabytes amount of uh, uh, IO for each iteration. But what we're gonna do is like, uh, it's very, very, very straightforward. Like we just cut the video into multiple chunks 
but like previous the method basically like uh, come up with these length by heuristic sort of things. And then here we give a kind of more principled way, which is basically like uh, this uh, inequality here. So uh, basically if we think of, we have a batch size of B videos and then we want to make sure the amount, total amount of the bits that we're gonna send throughout the pipeline to be smaller than the, uh, the maximum speed of our current uh, training uh, environment times the number of the, the, the time, the elapsed time of the, of the model training, which is essentially the forward and the backward time. So uh, we can just plug in the, the uh, uh, hardware environment. For example, if we are training on SSD, then the disk would be like 500 megabytes per second. If we are on a network file system, then that can be even larger, like gigabytes per second which is like, uh, so it just gives you the, the time. And then uh, other than that, we also try to increase the C CPU utility uh, during the pre-processing because we observe that the, both the video decoding and then cropping are, video, uh, are CPU intense operations. So we first decode the video and then we crop the frame that is decoded out of the video decoder. And then, so this is kind of sequential operations. And then we realized that actually we can combine these two things together. So we can just, while we are reading the uh, decoding a video, we can just treat the cropping as an additional filter in the FFM pack. So this can, so in an ideal case, this can make the scaling way much more efficient than the, like doing this sequentially. And then here comes our pre-training result. So uh, yeah, I know like uh, training on like 32 GPUs are like, uh, like unmanageable. So we, 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 we realized that actually we can do it on uh, eight GPU nodes. And then the GPU uh, hours are like uh, hundreds uh, or like uh, 400 at most GPU hours, which means we can actually train a, like a pre-train it using eight GPUs within like one or two days, which is pretty like significant kind of gain. And then also we have some more uh, pre-training results on the scaling effect. So because uh, you go for D, they announced the second version and then this actually increased the copper size by around 40%. So we can add them into the pre-training. And then we also observed that, uh, because, yeah, because we basically like doing uh, a challenge on the uh, Epic Kitchen, we don't need to uh, like differentiate the training and the validation set on the Eagle 4D. We just gather the train and the validation spell of the Eagle 4D. And then this gives us another like 20% improvement of the uh, copper size. And then we see that we still see this uh, uh, gain uh, when, do, when doing the pre-training. Uh, if we measure the downstream sort of a zero shot uh, retrieval result, uh, which maybe we can annotate more data. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's pretty much of it about the pre-training. Uh, and, and finally is the pre-training. So we want to uh, val validate the, uh, the pre-training model on the downstream, which is essentially the challenge we are participating in. Um, we, we took part in the action recognition and the multi-instance retrieval benchmark. Uh, here are some details and I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip very quickly. And we show that uh, if we pre-train on Eagle 4D, we can gain, uh, uh, we, we can, so using the VIT base model, we can be comparable to the previous state of the art, even if some of the models are pre-trained on very huge like in-house uh, data sets. And then we can uh, increase the model from VIT base to VIT large, or even with the higher resolution. And then we have this 55.4% uh, accuracy. Uh, this is on the validation set. And then uh, we compare to the last year's winner. Uh, we see that uh, single model, we are competitive uh, while using lower resolution, uh, fewer frames, and we use the public data. So that's really cool. And then also the clip model pre-trend, uh, clip pre-trend model actually is also public available. So it should be um, pretty kind of uh, really accessible. Uh, and then, and then we, we, we submit the single model on the test, uh, 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 test uh, uh, benchmark. And then it turns out like actually the same model, uh, our result is uh, much more uh, better than the last year's winner. So this is the same model, just uh, validated on different uh, sets. So I think this actually is, uh, seems to indicate like uh, egocentric video pre-training might be a better fit for like uh, performing these uh, experiments on the egocentric data, for example, like Epic Kitchen. Yeah. 
uh, finally, we also do some sort of model assembly. So this is no more magic. So we just train a few models and then gather all of them. So we get the uh, final number. And for multi-instance uh, retrieval, so basically the pipeline is pretty much uh, similar. And we basically train two models, one with the VIT base model, one another with the VIT large model. And then we realized actually we can also do model ensemble on the retrieval uh, as well, because uh, uh, if we do the dual softmax uh, operation on top of the similarity matrix, uh, we can interpret it as some kind of probabilistic distribution. And then we can just do simple uh, element wise averaging on top of these two matrices. And then this give us another like 1% gain on the single model. And then, so basically, uh, we're gonna present our poster uh, tomorrow. So feel free to drop by if you are interested. In. And then I think we will like archive the, the new version, uh, the new solution pretty much very soon. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so okay, so hello everyone. My name is Chen Ling Zhang, and I'm from Four Paradigm. Today, I want to introduce our sub submission to Applications 100 Action Detection Challenge 2023. Our team includes myself, Ling Sui from Nanjing University, and Fang Zhou Mu and Ying Li from University of Wisconsin Medicine. Temporal action localization is to identify the onset and offset and action instances, and at the same time uh, recognize their categories. Several recent works have developed deep, deep models for temporal action localization, for, but none of them are especially designed for egocentric action detections. We developed, uh, developed and published a work named Action Former. Action former is a single stage anchor free model for temporal action localization with transformers. Action former achieves state of the art performances on major temporal local action localization benchmark datasets. It is accepted by ECCV 2022. Earlier versions of action former are, are, have been applied in Applications Kitchens 2021 and 2022 action detection challenges. Here we provide a brief recap of action former. Action former consists of three key components. The first component is the center-based representations. We represent actions as center moments plus starting and ending distances. The second is a multi-scale transformer encoder that converts videos into multi-scale features. And the third is the feature pyramid. It is designed to capture temporal dependencies and different scales. For more details, please visit our ECCV22 paper and our code base. In last year, we already used action former for egocentric action detection. We use separate action former models to predict nouns and verbs. Then we combine them together to form the final action predictions. Uh, however, we use the shared clip features for both noun and verb action former models in our last year's submissions. 
In this year, we found that shared features, especially shared clip features, will hurt the model's performance on egocentric action detections. Uh, especially, we will have a large performance drop on verb, verb predictions. Thus, we use separate, separated verb and noun features for action former. Now, we introduce the process to detect egocentric actions with action former. First is the feature uh, it's the feature extraction process. We use a single action recognition backbone named video MAE. And also we use uh, in intern video pre-training, which is public publicly available checkpoints. We, we then fine-tune fine -tune the model on verb and noun subtasks of application's action recognition, uh, action recognition data set. We feed, we feed 32, 32 success success frames to extract features with stride equal to eight. Now is the action detection phase. Since action, actions in applications are composed by verb and nouns, we try and separate noun and verb prediction models with action form as we did in last year. We follow last year's solution to achieve action predictions. Then we combine the separate noun and verb predictions into final action predictions. We use the following rules to combine verb and noun predictions. For each point in action former, we grab their classification score and predictive boundaries, and use these two weights, alpha and omega, to form the final action and boundary scores. Now we show, we show our results on Epic Kitchen's 100 2023 action, action detection challenge. The results are in the right feature with a single M video MA backbone, our performance is 1.2 MAP higher than the last year's champion solution. Uh, the last year's champion solution, which, uh, which is uses multiple backbones, including slow fast, uh, slow fast or minimal and MVIT. Also, our model outperforms last year's our solution with, uh, with slow fast feature and M M uh, MVMIT features by a large margin. Our next step will be using stronger video features and incorporating object detection outputs. So to conclude, we, we explored using a strong and simple baseline action former for egocentric action localization. With separate features for subtask, our model achieves strong egocentric action detection results. Our code will be released. Thank you. I think three years, yeah, yeah. I hope uh, you can hear us right now. And I need to share the screen, right? Yes. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Right, I hope it, everything is okay right now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm Takumi Agi from AIST. I recently moved from Utokyo, right? And then now LFT. And uh, today I'm happy to uh, present this like kind of news flash of the paper entitled Fine Bio a Fine Ring Video Data Set of Biological Experiments with Hierarchical Annotation. Uh, this is joint work with AIST and U the University of Tokyo and National Center Cancer Japan, National Cancer Center Japan. Right. Uh, so the background of this uh, problem is uh, basically a biological experiment. So like performing uh, some experiment using this kind of tools. So 
to, for the progress of science, accurate recording of natural science ex experiment is pretty crucial in reproducing the right result and also kind of uh, avoiding scientific misconducts such as fabrication or falsification. However, uh, currently many researchers have to record the, all the procedures or all the, re the results they got by manually, uh, which is kind of error prone and also kind of, yeah, not, not yet kind of so confident and have limitations in accuracy and consistency. And we went to help this by automatically uh, rec recognizing the acti activities by using video recognition techniques. And all despite the importance of this problem, a uh, few works are only provided in so far. For example, for the BioBio, they said, uh, which is kind of real experiments uh, recorded uh, by ecocentric videos, which is kind of close to our setting. Uh, yeah, they provide some good videos, but still they have only small scale about 1.6 hours. Uh, and they only provide instruction of like, uh, as you're showing this kind of text, which is not enough for training some recognition models. And perhaps the closest setting uh, as a, from a manipulation perspective will be assembly one model set. Uh, however, they intentionally designed the data to be totally unstructured. So how to manipulate this kind of uh, uh, dependent on the participants and they, are no, they have no object notations, I, which I believe so. And to this end, your data set, which has kind of a kind of multiple videos. Yeah, I think the module is included. <laughs> um, yeah, this kind of multiple video of uh, performing very basic uh, experience of, for example, DNA extractions or like kind of PCR or something like that. And yeah, we basically collect 14.5 hours, which is larger than four. And also, yeah, this is a more biological experience, but we kind of wrote it to scalability rather than kind of methods. Sorry. And we we, we can explain the setup and annotation of this. So basically, yeah, we provide five, we kind of locate five third person view and one first person view cameras. And they are temporally synchronized. And also we kind of obtain extrinsic parameters by performing some simple collaboration technique. And also we tried to obtain also the half first person camera poses by using an error marker, which is not perfect, but that's yet useful in, for example, pose estimation or other tasks. And the most important part is this hierarchical annotation part. So a single video will correspond to a single protocol, for example, in this case, lists and recovery. And uh, this protocol will be correspond to several steps. So shake plates, SPP, PBS, blah, 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 something like that. And these steps are further divided to so-called atomic operations we call, uh, which is kind of a minimal interpretable uh, actions of using uh, tools in the experiments, for example, inserting a pipette into a tube or taking a micro tube from a tube rack or something like that. And as a result, we collect some 3.5K step annotations and about 50,000 atomic occupation annotations, uh, which is enough for quantitative analysis, I think. And uh, more, uh, another important thing is that we not only the temporal annotation, we uh, try to um, uh, annotate object bounding boxes, so in contrast to like similar data set, which only annotate active object, we try to uh, annotate all the object appearing in a frame uh, rather than kind of uh, uniformly collecting many number of frames. So as a result, we collect about 2000 frames, uh, object for box annotations. And uh, in addition to that, we try to uh, mark the manipulated object, which is directly manipulated by hands. And also the affected object, which is influenced by the object. Uh, which we think uh, it's important to recognize this kind of activities. And for a preliminary evaluation, we provide four benchmark tasks with baseline evaluation. So given a first person video or an image, first challenges will be uh, step segmentation. So, uh, so to temporarily segmenting the steps with, uh, of a protocol kind of instruction. And another task is to detect the atomic operation detection, which is similar to action detection from a setting. And the third problem is the, yes, the kind of normal object detection of uh, detecting object tool, uh, laboratory tools, and also the manipulated or affected object detection task. And today, so we have limited time, so we only show the kind of very basic qualitative results. So the left upper side shows the prediction the ground truth of the step segmentation task, and the uh, lower side shows the prediction on the atomic operation side. So it's a pretty, it's a bit messy because we don't didn't perform temporal uh, thresholding here. But the point will be, yeah, they perform pretty good at first sight, 
But still, uh, as we can see in the uh, step segmentation, yeah, actually the model did do not know the exact timing of when and like when and, uh, with this, the operation big starts and ends. And same as the operations, when the cut kind of into details, it's actually have many errors and still have to be improved. Right now, so we have quick results on manipulated affected object position. I saw the first also the paper here, but I uh, kindly rendered the uh, this 100 ham detector with additional branches. But in this our case, yeah, this totally almost totally failed. Maybe because of the uh, less powerful back 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 home network or something, but still struggles in especially detecting affected object. In this case, uh, like manipulated object is the microtube and affected is the microtube, rat, but still it's very really difficult to that kind of things. Right, so yeah, anyway, uh, we did a fun file, video some of the presentation for the development experience. And uh, for which our task was uh, how to understand your models for the same thing to do. And we expect the data to be released this autumn for a little bit later, but uh, yeah, stay tuned and I hope uh, the central community can benefit from these two data. So thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Francesco Agusa from the University of Catania, and now I'm going to present our work still fast. The problem that we addressed is the short-term object interaction anticipation. So given a video V and a timestamp T, methods are required to process the video to predict the future interaction that will be start after a time interval delta. Predictions are composed of bounding moves around the, the object which will be active in the next interaction, the noun associated to these bounding boxes, and a verb which describe the future interaction, a time to contact which is a real number which indicates when the next interaction will start, and a score. So previous work had addressed this task. So the baseline the first baseline has been released with an ego 4 d challenge, the first edition, in which uh, uh, we can see a uh, two branches method composed of a faster CNN object detector, which takes an input, uh, an high resolution steel image to detect all the objects which will be active in the future, and a slow fast action recognition network, which takes an input a low resolution video to attach uh, a verb to each of the detected bounding boxes. And this method, uh, needs to be a trained in two separate stages. We propose an approach, which is a two branches approach that can be trained in a hand-to-hand -hand manner. So our method uh, can process the two inputs simultaneously, an high resolution image and a low resolution videos that are be fed to, uh, to the respective backbones to extract feature stacks. Then the 3D feature stack has, uh, is upsampled to, uh, to match its uh, spatial resolution with a 2D feature one. And then the combination of these feature stacks are be sent to the feature pyramid layer to obtain a combined feature pyramid. This combined feature pyramid then 
is be sent to the our head, which is composed of a region proposal network and a royal line lane that extracts local feature to each region proposal. Then we aggregate global feature, which represents the world scene. These local global feature then are fed in a fusion network, and then through a residual connection, local feature are then aggregated. Then with two linear layers, we predict the probability distribution of nouns, of verbs, and the time to contact. We evaluated our method on the Ego4D dataset, version one and version two, and we compare our method with several uh, methods on the state of the art. For example, here we can see that uh, we evaluated our method in the validation set version one of Ego4D, and our method outperforms all the faster CNN baselines, and uh, especially for the verbs related top five mean average precision, but uh, it's still, it, it, it obtained worse performance in the top five mean average precision nouns related. This gap is still to be so to be reduced when more training data are available. In fact, in the version two of the ego for the validation set, the, the, the gap in the noun top five mean average precision is, uh, is smaller. Then we try our method in the test set of version one of the, of the ego for the data set, and uh, we compare our method with the different faster CNN baselines and inter video. And here it's interesting that we outperform all these methods, uh, consider that, uh, considering also that the inter video exploits, on, exploits uh, more recent uh, components. In fact, the inter video exploits a uh, uh, dyno object detector and a uh, video mask out encoders. Uh, instead, our steel fast is based on a faster RCNN and an X3D action recognition network. If we consider that uh, the version one and the version two of the ego 40 data set share the same test set, adding more training data, uh, adding more training data, we can see uh, an, an, out, an upgrade of our overall top five mean average precision, which starts from 3.49 and go to 5.12. And this, this means that our method is able to scale in the presence of large scale data sets. These are some qualitative results. We can see in red the ground truth bounding box, and in green the predictions of our still fast. And also, in addition, we can see nouns, verb, and time to contact predictions. And then we perform an ablation study to show the potential of each component of our steel fast. In particular, we tried different heads. Moreover, uh, we tried different, uh, different components of our head. For example, we removed the global features or the residual connections. And then we tried also different backbones, for example, using only the 2D backbone to perform uh, our predictions. In this slide, we can see the leaderboard that we have seen uh, this morning. And there is a, a method, a new method that outperform our still fast with a small gap, considering the overall top five mean average precision. And that's all. Thank you. Are there any questions for this first one? Uh, so maybe I can ask just a quick question. So you kind of in your results, you um, the noun performance is kind of dropping or not as good as some other methods. Do you have like any intuition for how you may? Yes, I, we think that, uh, for example, we're in a, if we consider only nouns, we have we obtain reasonable performance. But when we uh, we, when we uh, try to predict the nouns, verb, and time to contact, the, the, the performance drops. And we think that we need the more complex uh, approach to include the, the prediction of verbs and time to conduct to obtain uh, higher performances. Okay, thanks. Uh, so next up, we'll have Francesco pre presenting Meccano, a multiple mo multimodal egocentric data set for human behavior understanding in the industrial light domain. Hi again, <laughs> and now I'm presenting uh, this other work, which is uh, Meccano. Meccano is an egocentric uh, dataset, which is composed of multimodal data acquired in an industrial-like domain. 
So we asked 20 subjects to build a toy model of a motorbike, which is composed of 49 components with different shapes and sizes, and also two industrial tools, for example, the screwdriver, and also an extraction booklet. So to acquire this data set, we build a custom headset composed of a GoPro, Hero 4, and a RealSense, and a Pupils. So to, uh, the data set has been acquired in two different countries. And so the subject comes from, diff from eight, eight different countries with an age from 18 to 55. And we asked the, we asked the participant to sit in the table and start to build the, this model of the motorbike. So for each participant, we acquired different signals, two RGB signals, which comes from the GoPro and the real sense, the depth signals from the depth sensor of the real sense, and the gate signals uh, using the Poopy Score 3 devices. And all these modalities have been acquired simultaneously and are then synchronized. We annotated Meccano with different set of annotations. So firstly, we detected 12 verbs which describes the interaction performed by participant to build the model. And we annotated temporarily all the videos of Meccano using these verbs. Then we, we found a taxonomy of 20 objects and we labeled especially these objects in the, in the video of Meccano. And then starting from the temporal notation, uh, we uh, found uh, 61 actions that the, the participant performed considering a verb and different objects. For example, here we have a line, skew driver to skew, where the verb is a line and skew driver and skew are the objects. And the distribution of the labels of actions following a long tail distribution. Then we, uh, we labeled our mechanical data set densely with egocentric human object interaction. So which are composed of a verb, and a set of objects that are involved in that interaction. Then we starting from the contact frame in which the human is touching something, we going back uh, up to three seconds and we annotated all the, ne the, the, the next active objects. So that the objects which will, be in, which will be active in the contact frame. Moreover, we labeled all the ends present in, this, in the videos considering both past frames and contact frames. <clears throat> to show the potential of our Meccano data set, we proposed a benchmark composed of different tasks. And we performed action recognition, active object detection and recognition, egocentric human object interaction detection, and also action anticipation and next active object detection. Meccano is also useful to explore different tasks that, that are present in our benchmark. For example, has been used to, for a, in a work or two for a, to explore the task of procedural learning. For the actual recognition benchmark, we, uh, our baseline is composed of uh, two slow fast instances. And then each of these uh, takes an input, uh, the RGB and then the depth signal. And then we, uh, we added a uh, ground to attention map based on the gains of the humans to force, this, to force the network to look where the user is looking at during performing the action. And the results show that if we use all this multimodal data, we obtain the best performances. Then for the active object detection recognition, we firstly uh, trained an end object detector using our labels in the Meccano dataset, considering a cluster agnostic task. And then we consider also the clusters of the active objects present in the dataset. For the egocentric human object interaction detection, we use a uh, two branches uh, network, which is composed of the, we have a branch which is composed of a slow fast network, which takes the video shots and predicts a verb. And then we have a faster CNN, faster CNN that, that takes an input to the contact frame and predicts the box that, where the, there is the object where it is active. And the results show that if we consider the mean average precision verb, we have that the depth signal is the best to perform this task, only the depth. But when we consider the mean average precision verb and noun, 
we need also the RGB and the gate signals. And these are uh, some qualitative examples where we have the depth signal to predict the, the verb. For example, in the first row, we have take. And in the other column, we have the detected object, which is the gray perforated bar. For the action anticipation task, we use the rolling and rolling LSTM, which is which relies on different modalities. We adapted these methods considering the modalities that we have in the Meccano dataset, which are uh, RGB, depth, objects, gates, and hands. And we, we perform an ablation study to understand which combination is better to perform this task. And we, and we saw that uh, using objects, gates, and hands without the RGB and that to obtain the best performances. For the next active object detection, we can see only past frames to detect which object will be active in the future. And we use a simple faster SNN object detection considering different set of labels present in Meccano dataset. And uh, I want to say that we now we are running a competition with price on Meccano dataset which is related to multimodal action recognition. So the aim is to perform action, action recognition using all or a subset of the multimodal signals present in the Meccano dataset. And this challenge is, is sponsored by Next Vision, which is a spin-off to the University of Catania. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll start our final session of the day. So we're very happy to have David Fowey here to give our final keynote. Uh, just to give a bit of a brief intro. So David is an assistant professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, he was previously a postdoc uh, at UC Berkeley with uh, Alyosha Efros and Jatendra Malik. And he re received a PhD in robotics from CMU where we work with Abhinav Gupta and Marshall Herbert. So over to David, he's gonna talk about from hands in action to possibilities of interaction. Thank you, thank you. It's, really, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to be um, talking about this work. All right, let's see, cool, we can advance. All right, so I'm the one speaking about this work, but um, this is obviously the work of a lot of other people. So it's work of students both at the University of Michigan, including my PhD students, as well as an undergrad, and well as a, a visiting student from uh, Addis Ababa Institute of Technology. So, all right, so actually, I'm going to turn off the video. And there we go, that's good. All right, so um, I like to begin my talks with a picture. And so here we have a picture that, um, uh, you, many of you have not seen before. My I apologize to my students, they've seen this before a million times. But, and if you've seen one of my talks before, you've probably seen this as well. And so here you have a place you've probably never been to. And I'd like each of you to imagine what you can do here. Yeah, all right, let's try this. Better? Or I can talk loudly. All right, so um, you might imagine what you can do here. And so if you're jet lagged, you can see there's a nice bed all the way in the back. You might go to that, um, hopefully not during the talk. Um, but let's just, for the sake of picking something that involves like understanding hands in action, let's say maybe you go and open the cabinet. And so you can imagine what you would do in order to do that. And so here we have the cabinet in the sort of underneath the TV and you can open it and you can reach it and you can grab it and you can rotate it. And this is all very, very obvious to all of us. And one of the goals of my research has been really for actually now probably over a decade has been to develop an understanding that would let us take a picture like this and to understand at a level which would let us understand like how we would open a cabinet. And really the goal is to have a human or better understanding of the physical world from image data. And I really wanna to get to the physical properties of the world. And my dream of a system has really been, and for actually a very long time, which is why I've been so excited about uh, Epic Kitchens and Ego 4D, is to have a system that can learn about the interactive world by watching people manipulate it. So here we have, um, on the internet, there are lots of videos of people trying to sell you apartments and they show you all the nice things in it, like dishwashers, cabinets, microwaves, they open these things and they show you how to interact with it. And I'd love to be able to have a system that can understand this really, really well. And to understand at the level where we can now go to a new place and we can understand and interact with the world. And so I'm gonna talk about two things that are kind of getting towards this uh, today. And they're gonna be learning about interaction. And so here we have a sort of snippet of the person opening the dishwasher. And I'd like to develop systems that are able to really understand what's happening here. And if you actually watch this, this is a very complicated action in some sense. You have to apply the right force. You have to curl your fingers. You have to grab the right thing. You have to move it. You have to coordinate your hands so you actually trace out this arc. 
of where the dishwasher goes. And this is a very, very impressive thing that people are able to do. And so actually, it's very easy as humans to forget how good we are at things with our hands. Our hands are really, really impressive. And if you go to a, a robotics workshop, you get reminded very quickly of how good you are of, of using your hands compared to say robots. And so I'm gonna talk about understanding interaction as it happens. I'm also going to talk about the idea of how can we learn to predict this interaction? Suppose we can understand the interaction. How can we know that, for example, in the frame on the left, that we can actually interact with that object, that, that dishwasher before we even open it. And so I'm gonna talk about going from images to interaction. So these are the two things I'm gonna talk about, interaction as it happens, and then interaction as it could happen. So one of the things that we've been working on in my group for a while has been understanding people using their hands. And this came out of a great desire to basically take a lot of systems that people were developing on understanding hands in 3D and actually take them out into the real world. And these systems are often tested on in-lab settings. And along with Dan Den, who is uh, now a PhD student with me, we, we built the system of understanding human hands in contact at internet scale. And the idea was really simple. We want to know, is it a left hand or a right hand, a box around it, and a box around the object the person is holding? That's it. And so in some sense, it sounds very, very simple. And you say, well, okay, who, you know, who cares? Like, well, this sounds like a very simple problem. In fact, you know, the reviewers didn't particularly like it either. They say, well, what's the point? But what happens is you have a system and we have it trained on a large amount of data. And I'm not saying it works 100% of the time. I love it when people send me failure modes. So if you, if you use this system, please send us failure modes. We love seeing them. Because they're very interesting and they tell us a lot about hands. But what happens is once you have this, you can use it for downstream impact. So we thought people would use it for action understanding because if you can watch what people are doing with their hands, this tells you a lot about their activity because a hand is really how you're interacting with the environment. But we also found was that people used it for things like robotics, things that we didn't expect. And people use it for stuff like stroke rehabilitation. Because actually if you watch people, how they use their hands, if you're rehabilitating from a stroke, how you use your hands is actually very, very important for understanding what's going on. And actually at Michigan, I've been contacted by people doing all sorts of different things who really just, in the end, what they wanna do is they wanna understand what people are doing with their hands because it has lots of applications for medicine and for understanding and helping people out. And so what people have also done is, you know, you take demonstrations from, ro for, from people and you wanna translate that to robots. It's a lot easier to plan if you know when people pick things up and put things down. So Joseph Civic, for example, has this great paper where you break a very complicated demonstration into a set of very simple things and then planning becomes much easier. But in order to do that, you need to know when people pick things up. And it sounds really simple, but it's really, really not. So today I'm gonna to talk about our next generation of these systems. And so this is work um, by a number of students in my lab. So uh, Tanya is uh, now off to CMU for a master's. Dan Den is a PhD student. Ida was visiting us for the summer. And then Richard is a PhD student. And so this is, this is under submission. And let me first show you what our system could do in the past. And so here we have a person cooking on the internet. And what we could do in the past is we could say, okay, we have a right hand, we have a box around it, we have the object that they're holding, we have a box around that. And so you can track tools, and this is actually kind of nice. And you say, you know, we said, okay, look, we can understand tools of people as they're interacting with it. This is really great, and people did lots of great stuff. But in some sense, this is really not the full understanding of what the person is doing. This is really not enough. And so our new stuff that we're able to do is we're able to do things like, for example, segment. And so this is something which is aligned with our previous work that I was doing with Dima and um, Sonia on Visor. And so we, you know, we, we were building systems. Uh, we were first building systems that were powered by Visor and Cocoa that could produce segments from boxes. We ended up, SAM came out and this ended up being a little easier to use because it's very, it sort of worked very well on uh, third person video. Um, but we can also get segments where the hands as they're in contact. The other thing we can do is we can also get information about grasp. So in robotics, there are very, it's an easy way to get people riled up. There are taxonomies of grasps. And if you pick one, then you make a bunch of enemies. But what we do is we have the, the Kutkowski taxonomy, which is a, a very uh, standard thing. And we just sort of cut it off at a very high level. And we have distinctions like prehensile versus non-prehensile. And a prehensile grasp is things like where you actually hold onto the object. And that sounds like most grasp, but it's actually not most grasp. When people actually interact with the world, they don't necessarily, they don't achieve forced closure on objects. That's not how you interact with the world. So we also have non-prehensile grasps. We also have power versus precision. So it's basically, are you in contact with the palm? And power versus precision is very important. 
if I am using my toothbrush with a power grasp, something has gone very wrong because it's, it's a, it indicates I can't exert enough force with my fingertips. And then you also have prismatic versus circular. And these are two different configurations of your hand. And as it happens with this type of output, if you think that grasp tectonomies are foolish and a waste of time, well, the good news is that one, you can use this to evaluate your method. And then two, you can actually just ignore this from our outputs. The other thing that we do, which is perhaps most less likely to be controversial, is we have a distinction between holding things and touching things and then using things. And so we have also a notion of tools versus containers versus neither. And tools are defining what a tool is very, very difficult. Here we're defining it as something that you used like a hand. So it's in physical context. So this is not a TV remote, it's something like a knife. And so we know that the spatula that the person is holding is a tool because it's interacting with the, um, with the content of the pot. And then once you have the tool, you can also get a box around the object the tool is interacting with. And the idea here is for any of these things, by the way, these are very ambiguous things to really get a, a true answer on. Like, is it the chocolate inside this pot? Is it the pot itself? But the main goal here is to give you a sense. So it's not the be all and end all, but the hope is that this gives you a sense of what the object could be. And so it, naturally there are gonna be lots of edge cases in these definitions, but the hope is this is kind of useful. And what does this actually get you? Well, you can do things, like can search for things. Like I wanna find examples of hands using a tool, touching an object in another hand. So you can have these interesting bimanual interactions with the world. And this is something our previous system couldn't do because we could recognize we have a hand, it's touching a tool and that's where it stops. And so all these interesting things that people do with tools were just completely inaccessible to our system. And so now we have a system which also gets these second objects as well. So how do we actually train this? Well, we have a new data set for everybody and uh, it's 23 for now, which is not necessarily a title that will live on. So we'll, we'll have, a, have a, perhaps have a catchier title by the next time we talk, but it's a combination of a bunch of different data sets. Um, so there's an interact, there's an instruction interactions data set from internet videos uh, from Shengyi uh, in my in my group, and there's a visor, which is uh, which is Epic Kitchens and a specifically the visor subset. We also have Coco, and we have a new video data set, which is essentially doing like the 100 Days of Hands data set again. And each of these has different characteristics. So our interaction data set um, with articulated objects doesn't have any tools. Basically, people don't use tools when they're showing off an apartment. They're just opening cabinets. And there are very few people because it's just the person showing off the apartment. But it has all these articulations. The visor data set has tons of tool use. It is all, all tools all the time, but it's a single person and it's egocentric, which is great. So if you need single person egocentric, this is perfect for you. Poco, on the other hand, there's no tool use. I mean, there's like 1%. And this is because when you take a photo, photos are not real life. Photos are these staged examples. Someone pulls out a camera and everyone just all of a sudden freezes and tries to put their smiling face on and drops everything and acts normal for a photo. Photos aren't real life. And so you, it's not necessarily gonna capture tool use, but it has lots and lots of people. It has lots of small hands. It has lots of people playing tennis as we found out. It's Coco is filled with us. And finally, our new data set has like first and third person video. It has loads of tool use, but it doesn't have, for example, loads and loads of people in a crowd. So each of these individual sources by itself is not perfect, but by together, we cover lots and lots of interesting edge cases. So to summarize the data, we have about 257,000 annotated images across all these data, all, all these data sets. There are 400,000 hands, that's a lot, 288,000 objects, and about 19,000 second objects. So tool use is actually common in some of these, but it's, it's actually quite rare, but 19,000 is enough to actually learn something. And we have 65,000 grass annotations, because even getting that was very, very difficult, involved pilot studies by all of us, and it was very, very painful. And so getting to 65, we gave up and said, no more. It's very, very hard. The grasp categories are hard to annotate. It's very challenging. And the features that we have is that the data is all Creative Commons. The data we've released all has faces blurred. And this is a process which is both automatic and manual. And we went through and we did manual checks to remove minors from the data set. Kids put stuff on the internet, um, not understanding things. And our data sets in computer vision should not have kids in them. Um, and this obviously limits, takes, there are lots of interesting applications that who knows whether it'll work on kids, but we don't, we shouldn't have kids in our data and we should, we should actively remove kids from our data. Um, so we have this all removed. We also, we found that we get great generalization from this data set. So if I do zero shot generalization, which back in, back in my day, now I'm feeling old and grumpy. Um, back in my day, this was just called generalization, but now it's called zero shot generalization but we can match the training and testing on 100 days of hands our previous data set. 
But you get poor generalization when you go to this data set because it, you have to do well in all the different categories of data. So you have to do well in egocentric data, you have to do well in third person data, you have to do well on lots of people, on few people. It's a bit challenging to do well, well in this data set. So you get about a 7% AP gap um, if you try to test on this data set. Um, the method that we have is a relatively simple approach. And our hope here is that there are lots of clever people who will improve on this. And if uh, the next conference, there are a bunch of papers that do way better than this and produce great results, I'm very excited. So think of this as an open invitation to beat our baseline. And, but the point here is that you can actually, using a very simple method, get quite good results. And from here, the community can improve and we'll be working on this ourselves. But we have a simple method that works quite well. And the idea is we have a mask RCNN system and we just add extra outputs. So we have a box around the hand and then we predict things like we have the detection stuff, we also have the segments, we have the side, we have the contact, we have the touch, we have the, all sorts of stuff. And we all the extra outputs for every single box, these are just extra multi-layer perceptrons. So it's relatively straightforward. This is the simplest thing you can do. And if you can think of something better, wonderful. We're very excited and we'd love to see it. And to get the interaction between objects, previously we tried to predict this as an offset vector. Now, some of you may have used this and you try this on multiple people and it doesn't work very well. And so we have a new system work, which works quite a bit better. And the idea is we take a pair of regions of interest and we just train to say, do they go together or not? Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to distinguish between the different types of contact. You, this, you don't want to put uh, hands and objects and tools and second objects in the same category, but that's the general gist. And you can train it to discriminatively predict, do the objects go together? And so you can create a big pairwise matrix between all your uh, region of interest uh, uh, proposals, and you can just make a big prediction and you have basically what goes with what. And from there, you can just solve a very, very simple optimization problem with a greedy method. And by solve with optimization, we mean really, really, it's just a greedy thing. You just pick the most uh, confident uh, detection. And so you can get this big pairwise thing. Basically, the red hand goes with this yellow uh, spoon, not this red hand goes with, for example, the pan. All right. So one of the things that happens is if you play with our detector system before the previous one, you find that it has all these sorts of weird associations. You try it on multiple people. All of a sudden, my hand is contacting the door over there. Lots of weird stuff happens. And this is, uh, this is basically an issue with the previous way that we did association. And so you get these weird, you know, this, this person's hand is contacting this other person. And so we basically were able to have a new system which actually gets rid of these. And in terms of association and classification, basically, do we get the right association between the hands or sort of F1 score goes up on uh, images with lots of people it goes up from like 55% F1 to like more like 74. So it's a pretty big gap uh, in improvement. One question that you will naturally have given that this is uh, Ego 4D as well is like, well, well how does it do on Ego 4D? Uh, we weren't, we, we ended up be, due to the licensing of Ego 4D and the fact you can't disclose the data to sort of crowd work this very easily, or at least that's what we thought. Uh, we didn't, annotate Ego 40, but what we found is you can actually take our annotations and you can run it on Ego 40. And it works quite well, but you can actually combine our annotations with the Ego 40 annotations and get something which works specifically quite nicely on Ego 40. So um, just for context, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of evaluations. And this is only a subset of this. You have lots of annotations. You can have a very, very wide table. And if we go to Ego 40 zero shot, your AP for hand detection is something like 86%. Now, for those of you who haven't done hand detection, Typically what we found in hand detection, you can't actually use a COCO AP. So this is Pascal AP. So this is like with 50% IOU. And the reason is because actually annotating the extent of the risk is very difficult. And so COCO AP is kind of misleading. And so, but still 86% AP on a new data set for Pascal IOU is quite nice. But if you actually go up and retrain and you continue to train on Ego 40 and you just use some of their labels, you use some of our predictions and you self-train on that, we can build a model that gets another 4% AP um, and again, this is going from 86 to 90. So yes, it's only 4%, but it's really cutting the error rate by a lot. And we can get really actually quite accurate results on Ego 40. So what does this actually enable for you? What does this do for your life? Um, well, one of the things you can do is you can actually start going to other data sets and say, okay, can I find examples of people grasping things? So for example, here's Ego 40, and we can look at interactions of people. So here on the top left is the most non-prehensile polymer interaction that we found in Ego 40. And as someone who's supporting themselves while painting something, and they're not grasping the floor, they're interacting with the floor though. This is a very important interaction, but they're not grasping it. So this is a non-prehensile interaction. We can do things like we can detect, for example, on the bottom right is the precision of circular grasp. And you know the grasping categories are a little bit um, fuzzy, the boundaries are fuzzy, but we can imagine that this is a very useful source of information about how people are picking up with objects because it tells you 
the force that they're using and what their strategy is for picking up objects. And my hope is that this will be useful for people to figure out, for example, the weights of objects. Are people picking up things the right way? If, for example, you're using an object in the wrong way, this is actually an indication that something's gone wrong. You can also do things like find uh, configuration. So if you're a robotics person and you want to find examples of by manual manipulation, now we can go look for this. So for example, here's an example that we found automatically of a person cutting something in Epic Kitchens and you have your hand steadying the object and you have a tool being used to interact with the object as well. And we can find these, we can find tons of examples of these. And sometimes you can find very busy people. Here, this is an example of someone who's using a hand, a tool, an object, and a hand, a tool, another object. And so you have lots and lots of, you can find these interesting configurations. Now, sometimes what I will say is that this is a beta version. Some, you know, where some examples are gonna have some mistakes in terms of the, the associations, but my hope is that we have this data set and this will enable you know, increasing performance on this. All right, and you can find lots of different interactions, like for example, hand, two hands interacting with one object, you can have hand, two tools, and then the object, and so on and so forth. So currently this is in beta. Um, so we're looking for beta testers. So if you liked our previous system, we'd love to, and you have data that you'd like to try this out on. If you email me and Dan Dan, we'd be happy to uh, share the model with you to try things out. And we, this is a genuine open invitation uh, because we think this could be useful and we'd love to understand what the community likes and doesn't like because we, we can do some more stuff to fix things and we want to make sure we fix the right things. Uh, so like, for example, is there some extra feature that would be helpful? Like for example, running it on video, is, would you like to have something like that? And so here's someone making a cake and you know you, you, sort of, you can imagine running this on systems. Okay, so this is something for understanding us supervised stuff. I want to briefly advertise that not everything in my lab is supervised. So I'm going to show you two things today which are strongly supervised. We collect labels and I need to say we, we understand that supervision is not the solution to everything. And so I'm just advertising a, a paper that's going to appear at CBPR, um, which is understanding how humans and hand, human hands and objects interact. And the idea here is we're going to actually uh, use this. We're going to learn this via optical flow. And this is just an advertisement. You could, there's going to be tons more details if you drop by the poster tomorrow at um, 4.30. And the idea we've been doing in, in my, my group, and this is the latest iteration, there was a previous paper like this um, at last, uh, last year's NeurIPS um, with, with Dan Dan as well, um, was you can, you can learn to build a feature representation for images. And the idea is that we're gonna at training time have information to optical flow for common state and information about humans for hands. So if you, the main sorts of things moving around in the scene are in, for egocentric data are gonna be human hands and the objects they're holding. And so if you know this, you can actually use optical flow to figure out what pixels go together. And you can use hands to sort of get information about humans. And the idea we've been developing over a couple of papers is you basically use these to figure out a loss to organize your feature space. And we have a very, very, very simple, when you see it, you say, oh my gosh, this can't possibly work for getting good features, but it does. Um, solution for producing good features for doing things like grouping. And the idea is we just simply predict whether two pixels move together. And you can train a network which takes two pixel features from the feature space and predicts positive or negative, do they move together? And the way you find things that move together is you basically fit a fundamental matrix to optical flow and you do connected components. And this sounds like it shouldn't work, but you get the optical, you get the uh, fundamental matrix error, you run opt connected components and you have groups of pixels that seem to move together and you group them together. And on any individual frame, this is not necessarily very good, but over a large data set, you learn good grouping rules, which is actually quite surprising. And so the method itself is very, very simple. We had a very hard time, you, you write it down and you say, well, the method section is a paragraph. Hmm, this is a bit tricky. But the idea is that it's very, very simple. One of the things that I think is interesting for this is that there are a lot of older ideas that I think are now ready to be tried again, because this is something that people would have tried if I had tried this five years ago. In fact, I had tried doing stuff like this five years ago. It was a total mess, it didn't work. And it's because stuff like optical flow didn't work very well. And we can also do things like try to group pixels with hands by the same reasoning. Like if something is moving and one pixel is a hand or is a person and the other one is not a person, then maybe if they're in the same connected component for motion, then it's probably a hand holding an object. And so you can do things like, for example, um, build clusters. And we can also do things like, for example, um, take two pixels and try to predict, are they gonna go together with one pixel is a hand, the other pixel is an object. You can densely run this over the entire image and predict do these go together. And you develop an understanding of what, what stuff is likely to move the hand. And this is entirely unsupervised. Now, of course, what I will say is that this is not something that you're going to necessarily run off the shelf and have it work great on your video. That's what our supervised stuff is for. But we're also trying to push on the unsupervised front as well. Okay. And if you want more details, please come to there's a poster tomorrow at 4.30.
So the second thing I promised was going from a single image to interaction. And the idea is we want to take a single image, like before the person interacts, understand the interaction that will happen. And the core idea, so out of curiosity, has anyone here played the video game Myst? Like it was popular in the 90s. Does this ring a bell? Who here has played like one of these point and click games where you click on things and, and stuff? Oh, yeah, okay, good, better, all right. Now, so let me just show you the video. So here we have, you have a little cursor and you can click on stuff. And you can click on this button and then scene changes. You can click to move around. You can walk across the bridge. Not just the game, so the puzzles. Um, and you, uh, you click on the button, you click on the door, things interact. And um, this is something I've been subjecting my graduate students to for about four years. I say, guys, have you ever played the video game this? And they, they humor me and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I saw you last time you told me about this, we watched it on YouTube. Um, and so I've been trying to, the interesting thing here is you kind of click on an object and you interact with it. And you don't really need to specify what you do. You don't specify a motion command. You don't specify what your interaction is, but you click on a door, you interact with the door. And this is a thing which has done, been done in this, but lots of other basic video games rely on this principle. As just as an interface for interacting with the world. Like you click on something and the number of things you can do with the object, most of the time, so 80% of what you might want to do, it's kind of simple, it's kind of obvious. And so I wanted to take this idea and have a system where you click on something and you understand the interaction that would happen with it. And so Shengi uh, graciously uh, took on this problem and uh, we, have a, we have a paper under submission. And excitingly, we have a hugging face demo that you can try and actually they encourage you to try it. It works uh, quite well. And I, again, we'd love to see successes. If you have a fun success, great. If you have a fun failure, we'd love to see these as well. So we'd love seeing both successes and failures. And so there's like a tiny URL, tinyurl.com, 3 doi CVPR. And so let me sort of then jump to the actual method that we do. So going from 1990s video game nostalgia to actually what did we do? And the idea here is we have a query of something we're gonna interact with. We wanna answer the question, what can I do here? Like what's the interaction? And here we have sort of three query points. You have a, the door, you have the couch, you have something on the wall. And the idea here is that, for example, the green thing on the wall, you, it's not movable. You click on it, nothing should happen. Like there's no interaction you can do. Now, as it happens, I know, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time discussing what should we understand, what should we label, what should we, how should our inter understanding be built. Obviously, yes, you can, you can interact with the wall. You can throw something, you can tear down the wall, you can uh, cut a hole in the wall, you can do whatever. You can paint the wall, yes, yes. But for most of your interactions with just a hand, you really can't do much. Now, on the other hand, with something like the door, you can move it with one hand and it's, it's a rigid motion. Now, yes, of course, you could actually take down the door, you get just a screwdriver, you take the door off the wall and you take it off its hinges and yada, yada. But for most interactions, it's just you move the door and it rotates. And for something like the chair, you can also, you can pick it up, but it requires two hands to move. And the other thing is with the door, there's a rotation, it's a limited degree of freedom. So you have a rotation, and you have one degree of freedom and it goes around an axis. And so you can also want to be able to estimate that this is the rotation you could do. And you like to be able to understand that, for example, if you interact with it, you should interact at the handle location. And given all this, if you also have some 3D, you can also do things like synthesize what happens if the door opens. And as it happens, doors are great because they're actually uh, mirror symmetric. And so when you rotate it from another view, the mesh actually looks quite reasonable. Okay, and so our goal is to try to build a system like this. And the idea is like, we have a point of like, what can I do here? And wanna have rich interaction information. And what we're gonna do is we're, here, we're just trying to explore the idea and the architecture in the hopes that at some point we switch over to video supervision. Now, when we switch over to video supervision is an interesting question. And we just purely learn by watching people interact with the world. And so we won't necessarily be able to do it right now, but it also should inform our architecture and how we design things. Because the important thing is that in video supervision, if you're learning about how the world works from watching people, you can't have dense annotation. This is just impossible. And so there are probably cabinets in your kitchen that you interact with very infrequently. There's like an appliance that you never use. They said, why did we get this? This is a waste of space. No, it's too much to return it. Oh, it's too late. Return time is out or whatever. But you have their things that you don't interact with. Just because you don't interact with a cabinet doesn't mean it can't be opened. And so you can't depend on everybody opening your cabinet because otherwise you get into the land of just demonstrations where you, you, you know, you and your lab, you put up the camera and then you all interact and you open all the cabinets and that is how the system learns. You should be able to actually just watch the person open one thing and generalize to everything else. So we can't use dense annotation. And we also wanna be able to use 3D because actually 3D is quite useful, but we don't wanna depend on it. And so the distinction from past work has been that we, we have, um, we wanna have, uh, 
you know, we want to be able to understand potential interaction. So a lot of past work on understanding video interaction has been on interaction as it occurs. Another work on sort of RGBD stuff has been you understand point clouds or depth maps. And the idea is that you, you're going to understand the point cloud. So you actually depend on having the sensor. And so what happens is once you depend on RGBD in your data stream, you can't test this on internet images. You can't have a hugging face demo until Apple releases um, a new file format that includes depth. Like most people, most data right now is captured with RGB. And maybe that will change. But if you depend on RGBD, you limit yourself to what data you can use and what applications you can try. And then all of a sudden, you try this on a new robot and say, well, I'll, I have to get an RGBD camera. So we have a new data set, and this is RGB. It's 10,000 images mixing different domains and sensors. And we have an, the internet articulation data set. We have Epic Kitchens, of course. And we have the taxonomy data set. And in some sense, we're trying to answer 20 questions about a set of, of query locations, like, What's the, you know, can I move this with one hand? Can I move it with two hands? Um, is it a rotation? Is it a translation? Where would I interact with it? So you have like an affordance location. And we also have 31,000 immovable locations, like points where you click on them, nothing should happen. And so we build a system that is based on, essentially we have a query point and we tell what you can do. And uh, see, oh, there's a chat message. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, you have two query points and you try to, um, you try to estimate what you can do. And the, the method we use, we have an encoder like a VIT. So very, very standard. Again, the, here the idea is we're not innovating a lot on the method. We have the simple method that works. We're not adding random garbage and random special soft doubles special attention. The point is we're trying to have a simple method that works. And you have an encoder where you have a VIT and you encode the query points with a positional encoding. And then the decoder just follows like the debtor detection framework because debtor is very easy to use. It's very easy to extend. And our hope here is that people can take this and they can use it in different systems as opposed to having a gigantic paper with you know, 10 pages of method section that is impossible to replicate. And what we do is we produce as output things like, is it movable at this query point? Is it movable with one hand? Is it rigid? Is it, and here the pillow, for example, it's a free form articulation. We can also estimate where do I pick up the pillow? Like they have the affordance location. And we have a localization and here, you know, it's, it's it, nowadays, segmentation is very is much easier to do, uh, thanks to Sam, and so we get quite good results for segmenting the object as well. But for example, with a dual, you click on this, you know where you interact with, and you sort of recognize that this is a part that you interact with. You know it's a rotation. And doors, by the way, come in different flavors. You say you first think, okay, doors just they all rotate, but actually, lots of doors don't rotate. They actually translate. And so it's actually very there's not some sort of easy magic path that goes from door to how do you interact with it? And so you actually have to know where the affordance is and actually getting the rotation axis is surprisingly hard. And we also do things like produce a dense depth prediction as well. And so we can train on taskonomy and we have some of the data has depth. And so we can train the system to produce depth. So here's some qualitative results. Here we have a TV. And the idea here is you can click on the TV and you understand you need two hands to move this object. And it's, but it's, it's not, there's not a constrained articulation. It's not that it's rotate, you can only rotate it. If you pick it up, you can move it freely. Um, and the, the estimates of the heat map on the right is estimating where you would put your hands. Um, now, the hope here is right now this is being done because we have lots of supervised samples. But you can imagine, given the previous method, you have the examples of bimanual manipulation. You take an example where someone manipulates the TV, and then you rewind in time before they picked up the TV. And now you have an example of on this object, in order to pick it up, I need two hands. And so the hope is as we go forward in the future, we can train these types of systems by simply watching people interact with the world. So I'll show you some, wrap up with some qualitative results so we can take a door here. And so one of the things we found is we, we tried comparing with lots of other stuff that exists. And one thing we found is that very little stuff is actually able to solve this off the shelf. We first said, oh, whoa, whoa, why don't we just take the, the model that's trained on examples of people interacting with objects and it should be able to understand this door. Like it, it understands doors, right? Because it, it sees people interacting with doors. And so therefore, yeah, it does see the person, but it should generalize without the person, right? And what we found is that 3D ADN is our system, which was trained on internet videos to understand articulation. And if you train with people, they don't, it, the system doesn't work. Basically it depends entirely on the person because the person is such a great cue for how the interaction is happening. And so the systems, you, you actually kind of need to do something other than train on examples of people actually interacting with data. And so ours is on the right. And so you get the um, interaction with the, you get the articulation access for the door and you get the extent of the door as well. So we have quantitative results, but um, we have lots and lots of experiments and lots and lots of numbers. So I'm not gonna bore you with this. So I'm gonna give you two take homes. The first thing is that models that are trained to work with humans don't well work when you don't have humans. 
And so we get catastrophic performance when we try to take models that are trained on internet data of humans interacting with stuff, the IOU for localization, the articulation access stuff, everything is a disaster when you try to take it through examples of humans not interacting with stuff. And there's definitely something to be done where maybe there's a trick where you inpaint the humans, you make the humans disappear in the photo. There's probably different ways of handling this, but this is definitely a problem. And so understanding possible future interactions really does depend on something new. So you can't just take examples of people interacting. And this is something that people have found. Um, there was a great paper from Sar Gupta's group on understanding interactions. They spent a lot of time basically trying to mask out the hands. The other thing we found is that synthetic to real data, at least for us, is still very hard. We tried very, very hard. And we, we could not get a model which was trained on Sapien to work on our data. And we tried very hard across multiple papers to do this. And Shengyi spent a very long time trying to make sure this was as fair as possible and giving it all the advantages. And still, the system really didn't work very well. And so this is still, when you go to something like Epic Kitchens, going from Sapien to Epic Kitchens doesn't really work. And so the performance drop is huge. And finally, we can also test on like other data. So here we have the world data set. So this is from uh, Deepak Pathak's group. And here it's a, this is a, um, a kitchen inside CMU. And you can click on the store. This is something which we really, really don't have in our data set. We don't have, um, positive, we don't have any examples from CMU. And, and um, you can click on it and you can estimate, for example, here's a rotation axis. And here for this example, actually getting the rotation axis is kind of challenging. You know it goes up a certain direction, but you need to put it in the right location. And you get an understanding of where the, art, where, the, where the interaction has to happen. And so in some sense, you can produce a sort of world possibilities. And we're not quite at MIST, but maybe if you add some stable diffusion, you click on this drawer and it opens up. You add some diffusion models to fill in the details. And maybe someday we'll, we'll, have, we'll be revisiting the 90s video games um, with uh, computer vision. So to wrap up, um, I have a bunch of tools for you. So for current hands in contact, which is definitely a thing that people in this community really care about, we have information about rich state information for hands, objects, and tools. And please contact us to try things out. We love it when people show us stuff, like when people send us things, even, uh, for example, they say, oh my gosh, we tried this on this data and it's a total disaster. And here's the interesting thing. And here's what we learned. This is really useful because this tells us things like, oh, we can, we can fix this in the next model we make. Or it tells us something interesting about hands because the thing about hands is they're very, very powerful. And people do really interesting stuff with them. So if you actually watch how people interact with the world, they don't grasp things. They don't do forced closure graphs. And so there are a lot of assumptions that are maybe built into our model that we need to know about. And so seeing these failure modes, because as a community, we don't show failure modes that much. Seeing these failure modes is actually really helpful. So please contact us and contact us to try this system. And for future hands in contact, we have a hugging face demo you can try. And if you give it a shot, please let us know. It's, it's always fun to see the systems work. And it's been great fun watching lots of papers. You have the, you have the red hand, you have the orange box. It's great fun seeing this. And so with that, I'll conclude by again, thanking all the people and acknowledging all the people whose hard work went into this. So I'm the one presenting, but you know, there are lots of people who put into this. And so I'll just conclude with two videos. One of which is more of a success on our own data. The other one is a bit more of a failure. We don't have people um, uh, sort of grooming their cats in our data set. And so it uh, thinks that the cat is maybe an object and, I don't know, it's a little bit funny, but we've been trying, this is what we've been trying to find failure modes. We tried random data from our lab. This one is a bit more of a success. So thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Does anyone have any questions from the audience or online? Uh, feel free to type in the uh, chat. Uh, yeah. So how much 3D is happening in this? I'm totally intrigued by this. this amazing demo that you have a 2D image and you click on it and, and you start opening doors and stuff like that. Like, it's like when you draw these articulation axes, is it in 2D or is there some sort of 3D analysis happening? Yeah, so so you can get the articulation axis. So this is actually, we have to think very carefully about how you would get to this demo because you, you can get a uh, you can get a surface, you can pretend it's a plane and then you get the articulation axis in 2D and from there, if you assume the camera intrinsics, you can then lift everything to 3D. Now, as it happens, if the surface is not planar, this doesn't work, um, it's still a little bit tricky and we're assuming the intrinsics are correct. And there, there are ways to get it on web data, but it's, there is 3D analysis happening, but it's, it's certainly tricky. And I, I mean, we wouldn't, for example, produce a, 3D, a fully functioning 3D model from this, but it's good enough to get a sense, but there, there is 3D and it's coming from the depth. Initially, looking at 
when we observe it, but uh, before the phone and also Yeah, this is a great question. So one of the things, if you haven't played with the system before, um, I'll just do a live demo. If I'm, uh, you have this cup, and my hand is coming towards the cup, as soon as my fingers are on top, a lot of the hand in this, this affects basically almost all systems that are trained on the on sort of single frame data. They, they immediately, they just jump and say it's in contact and you get this flickering thing back and forth. And so people have various solutions. Uh, so there's a paper that was in BMB, I, I don't remember the title, but there's a paper at BMBC from Yoichi Sato's group which has a great solution, which we didn't get a chance to try in this, where you actually watch the videos. And then from there, you can actually get great labels. Because the problem is what's happening is deep networks, as usual, are taking a shortcut. And there are very few examples of people just in contact, just about to be in contact with the object in the data set. So it learns that if it's in front of the object, it's in contact. And then also, if you have people annotating data on the internet, they're not gonna be looking extremely carefully to figure out, because actually what you have to do is you have to look at the shadows. And that's the key. So there, there, are two, there are a couple of solutions. There's one, which is the, the, the great idea of you train on videos and you use optical flow to figure this out. And this is great. And I, this is one of the things that we're, is on our to-do list of stuff to add to this system. We, we tried in the past training using video as input. But what happens is if the supervision is a frame, the super, like there's no incentive for it to use the video. And there's a student who worked uh, two years ago who tried a very long time trying different, different methods and nothing would produce better results. And I think it has to do with the labels. Yeah. My question is about uh, like we're going to need some case of opportunity to kind of classify the manipulation not to be established in some case, like in the case that this is kind of ours or the static graph. Or, yeah, all of them are actually static, but actually they have manipulation dynamics. So there's a chance to extend your method to, uh, I think, to then put presentation of the video domain. To kind of, for example, like drafting, painting, or coding, or kind of like classifying from as a dynamic. I think this is a great idea. Um, we we don't have it in part because this is if annotating video ends up being very the, being very difficult. In fact, actually getting these graphs was very hard. Uh, we. We, in fact, until we figure out the right way to frame the problem, we actually we were actually annotating our, like annotating ourselves. And even then we were having a ton of trouble because um, there's so many things that are kind of in the middle. So maybe one option to get to having these types of interactions that are temporal could be maybe if you have um, man like sort of a three d reconstruction, there might be a way of having a some understand like building some sort of maybe not manually defined cat classification implicitly implicitly, exactly. Yeah. Yes, and I and I, I very much like the paper. So we should definitely talk because like this is this is a it's a great solution. Um, and it's something we should definitely talk. About. Any other quick questions? Okay, so that's very good. And now we move on. You know, um, so the first make sure to turn on your microphone, your camera and microphone. We need to check and hear you. Okay, can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's begin. It's going in the if the hear you. Okay, let's begin. Hello everyone. My name is Amisha and Nasir Mahaj. I'm, Karen, I'm... there's a delay, no? Mm, is it a delay from our end or your end? Try again. Can you just keep speaking so we can test the audio, please? Okay. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, can you give us a continuous you... audio test? I can't figure out if yes, we can hear you or not. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? It's... So no, we can't hear you. you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wait. Keep going. Let's see what, what the. Uh, okay, let's, let's go. Let's try HDMI. Now? Now? Now I can hear you, Dr. Daman. No, that's not working either. Emit M2. Emit M2. Okay, try again. Try again. Okay, Dr. Daman, can you hear Keep me? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, perfect. Okay, not hello everyone. Either. My name is Amisha Nasiri Maj, and I'm going Sorry. to. Uh, provide our work uh, on on supervised domain adaptation challenge in application 100, where we use mixed sequence prediction. Let's begin with a to? little bit of introduction. Okay, that's exactly. As you okay. Okay, so can you try speaking now? Okay, can I present now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, I start from the beginning. Hello, everyone. My name is Amrisha Nasri Maj, and I am going to present our work for Epic Kitchen Challenge on Supervised Domain Adaptation when we use mixed sequence prediction to tackle this challenge. Let's begin with a little bit of introduction. As you know, in domain adaptation, we normally have two different distribution of data. And while the task is similar, the visual information would be different. This similarity in the task uh, in long-term video in egocentric action recognitions will result in a repetition of the sequences in both source and target. And this is due to the fact that the agent that do these tasks in both domain have the same uh, goal in both of them, and this is re will result to a logical relation between actions that happens after one another. For example, think about pouring milk into something. Well, in both source and target, we can see that this sequence will repeat it, that the first uh, actor will be open the fridge, pick up the milk, close the fridge, and then pure the milk, and again, it's also continued with opening the fridge, putting the milk inside and closing the fridge. This became our motivation to work over sequential prediction for domain adaptation instead of the single action prediction. And to integrate the target information in sequential prediction, we tried the strategy that called mixed sequence generation. In mixed sequence generation, we try to replace some of the actions during the training over the source set from the actions in the target set with the same label. Maybe it's become a confusing since we do not have any target in the, uh, uh, we do not have any label in the target. So we are going to use uh, a simple sort of labeling method where we try to replace the actions with the high confidence of the labels and generate the mixed sequences. After that, having the mixed sequences, we feed these sequences to uh, our sequential classifier where we use three modality, RGB flow and audio, and use TRN to aggregate the clips of each action in the sequence and then concatenate these features and fed them to transformer to get an encoding of the actions. 
in the sequence and then trying to classify them. The point is when we try to fit the transformer with a mixed sequence, we are forcing the transformer to try to encode features which are more related to the action instead of the features that are related to the visual information. And finally, we will have the loss of the mixed sequence. And to make sure that we integrate as much as information from target, we also use a dummy cl uh, classifier where it tries to find the swapped action from the source and target. In the next step, since we know that the sequential information is due to the context similarity in both domain, we try to integrate context as much as possible in our methodology, where we try to find the top K prediction from the visual information for each action, and we provide and generate all possible sequences. And then using a language model, we try to filter out the sequences that are more probable by giving a score to each sequence. And the final result of the language model will then multiply to a coherence matrix that will be used to remove any unlogical pair of verb and noun that has not been seen in a source, so there are not logically will be also available in the target. Finally, after getting this result, with so, this sum of uh, our framework for this challenge, yeah. and by looking at the ablation study of our framework, we can see that starting from the baseline, adding sequence, we improve our results. However, by adding the uh, mixed sequence classifier and uh, dummy classifier, we boost our results a lot that we are able to improve it more and more with the context. And this gives us the fourth place in the UDA challenge and second place in this year, and also second place in the web. In conclusion, we can say that the sequential prediction between two domain is more uh, robust to the domain change. And also using a mixed sequence can help us to integrate uh, se uh, sequential information and target information during training over the sequences. And finally, we can see that the contextual information transferred between domains, and as a result, it can be used to increase the performance of the classifier. Thank you for your attention. Do you want to share your screen, the next speaker? Okay, we can see your screen, but I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Okay. You can also see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I just started now. And yeah. uh, hi everyone, and I am Kim Moi Lau and coming from the TCL AI lab. And there's three other members uh, in my lab, uh, Yasser and also Yuan and also Malan. And today I would like to share uh, the work for our uh, Eclipse Science Audio-Based uh, Interaction Challenge. Before going to, into the details, I would like to share some introduction about this uh, audio-based interaction recognition task first. The goal of this task is going to learn the mapping from the audio samples to the corresponding action labels caused by the interactions between the objects or from the events of the camera where we are and basically this data set introduces several challenges. For example, the variable lengths of the audio and background sound captured with the event activities. 
To tackle this kind of the challenge, the recent approach mainly used the transformers and training them with a, a supervised learning such as the AST and also the self-supervised learning method with the uh, SSAT to learn the mapping from the audio clips to the class label. Although transformers nowadays is a very commonly used method, but we focus on a relative unexplored domain in the CNN architecture. And there's two main reasons for us to investigate the new CNN model. First of all, the CNN are still prevalent for the audio classification due to its low computational causes and also the memory footprint. Second, some of the research found that the performance is either comparable or, or can perform better than the SOTA transformers. And uh, there's some uh, SOTA CNN based model, for example, the slow fast model, and they are using the uh, multi stream network architectures. And this kind of the architecture can provide more accuracy. However, they consume more memory for pin and also require more computational G flops to conduct the prediction. And also, this kind of the model requires two different input uh, resolution of the spectrograms. Compared to this model, we adopt a very simple method with a single stream network architecture instead of two stream architecture. And this helps us to save more memory for pin and also the computational G-flops and only require one single input spectrogram. Later on, our experiment also can demonstrate that our models can achieve a comparable performance as the slow fast model. And here, the slide showing here, the figure here also uh, show our architecture details. And uh, this is the overall architecture and the uh, details of the uh, block design. And then uh, here, we would like to share the details first. And then our model accepts the T cross F resolution of the block mail spectrogram and fit this spectrogram into our model to predict the, uh, predict the classes. For the Marco design, we follow the similar design in the rest of 15 with four different stages of the CNN blocks. However, unlike the conventional CNN residue blocks, we make some changes. We adopt a parallel multi-scale kernels in order to capture a different scale of the tempo and also the frequency information. Specifically, the large kernel here, we use one cost 21 and also the 21 cost one separate kernel to capture the long duration activities and also the global frequency information. For the small kernel, one cost three and also Q3 cost one, and we just capture the local details of the frequency information and also the short duration activities. We also adapt a depth-wise separable conclusion that allows the model to attend the time and also frequency separately. To reduce the memory for pin and also computational G flops, we place the multi branch layers at the top before applying the one cost one convolution and uh, for the channelized expansion and the squeeze operation. In order to evaluate our model, we first be train it on the VGG sound first, as shown in the table here. Our models can save more than 50% of the parameters and also G flops while obtaining a minor performance drop of only about 0.3% uh, compared to the baseline slow fast model. And our model also outperformed the similar multi branch design of the inception uh, NAS uh, tiny model. Then in the second stage, we also fine tune our model on the Eclipse science and conduct the testing on the validation set. Uh, here, the table also demonstrates that our model is outperform all other CNN based method in terms of the accuracy and also computational, computational G flops. And also we found that uh, we, our performance also outperform the transform architecture SSAST and uh, and also can save more computation power and also memory size compared with it. In conclusion, we propose a very simple and also effective single stream CNN based model in this competition for the audio based uh, classification tasks. And our model can produce a very comparable results with the slow fast model while reducing a lot of parameter size and also G flops. And our model can show that 
Um, it is outperformed the CNN-based model and also the transformer models on the Eclipse Science validation set. And we are ranking as the uh, first on the uh, leaderboard and also achieve 55.4 top one accuracy on the challenge test set. And thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. We have three recorded talks from the top, uh, top first winners of other challenges. You can watch them online instead of having to watch them together here. So we're going to save you the time and move into the next bit. But if you're interested in the winning uh, benchmarks for um, hands of uh, HOS and VOS, they, are avail they will be available online on the web page. Next, we are very happy to have Ed Miller from the, the uh, Serial team uh, and the Aria Glasses. As some of you might know, but maybe not everyone, with Ego4D and, and Epic and everyone are actively working now with uh, the new ARIA glasses. And Ed will be telling you about what's coming from the ARIA team. Unmute start video as well. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit tall for that, but hopefully uh, people can see the screen. Share. Yep. And that should have it. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Edward Miller. I'm a research product manager in uh, the Surreal team inside of uh, Meta. And uh, we're the team that is responsible for something called Project Aria. Some of you might be familiar with the device. Uh, and I'm here to talk about a number of data sets and challenges that we're announcing today. Uh, but for anyone who doesn't know a little about, about Project Aria device, let me just introduce you to what it's all about. So ultimately, Project Aria is a all day wearable compute and sensor platform in a all day wearable form factor. Essentially, you can think of Project Aria as having all the different sensors that you might expect to have one day in a pair of lightweight, all-day wearable AR glasses, but without actually the, the rendering element of that. So we can use this device to overcome the chicken and egg challenge of wanting to be able to accelerate research in this area without having to wait for a production-ready, um, thank you, Dima, without having to ready, wait for a consumer device to be available on the market. And the Project Aria device is packed full of sensors. We have two uh, SLAM cameras that are grayscale. We have a single uh, high quality RGB uh, camera for AI and semantic understanding. We have two eye tracking cameras, seven spatialized microphones. We have dual IMU, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, dual IMU, magnetometer, all of which comes into a device weight around about 70 grams. So the benefit of this is it fills one of these areas where we believe was lacking in egocentric uh, research. We want to have a form factor that is available for all day wearable use, whilst also having the rich sensor suite so that we can really progress uh, the research in the areas that we want to move forward. This allows us to really explore the all day egocentric challenges from the moment you wake up going throughout your day and really building the, the rich context throughout the diversity that we all experience in our day-to-day -day lives. A little bit of information about the uh, device itself. So first of all, all of the internal sensors are aligned to the same internal uh, clock. So it means that we can take any uh, uh, sensor stream at any one time and be sure that we are aligned to that, uh, to that time frame. 
And of course, this is really obviously important when you've tried to build egocentric data sets with multiple sources and they drift over time. So we can always use that internal time clock to make sure that we are aligned to the same, uh, the same absolute time. Second, not only are we aligning all the different uh, sensor streams to the same clock, we can actually do this between multiple RA devices. So, so what you're seeing here is a video of me trying to uh, juggle, albeit poorly, with two, uh, two basketballs. Uh, but we have an array of my colleagues around me, uh, all capturing uh, data at the exact same time. And we've synchronized them down to a couple of uh, microseconds. Um, this means that you can take challenges that were previously really hard because of not having uh, a, a perfectly aligned data and treat this really as a, a single system that has a distributed uh, uh, a sensor platform. Um, moving on, uh, we care deeply about calibration. Once you nail calibration, a lot of the further uh, challenges uh, further down the line become a lot, a lot easier. So we have highly precise uh, relative position of all sensors on the device. But of course, as we're dealing with wearable glasses, these sensors will move around. Even when you're, you're taking them up and putting them on your, on your head, they will go through a degree of stretch because of the, the temple arms. So we also provide online calibration for corrections over time. And I think as, as, as Peter Parker once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, this is something we care about deeply uh, in our team. And we, we put in provisions to make sure that when we're capturing data, do so in a responsible fashion. That includes things like having hardware uh, uh, LEDs, to make sure that we're signaling to bystanders when we're capturing data, and uh, hardware privacy switches as well, which will kill recordings to make sure that if we are ever approached and asked to stop recording, we can do that very easily. So that's on the hardware side. Uh, for privacy, we also have a machine perception pipeline uh, where we essentially run all of the sequences that we capture in public through this cloud uh, uh, pipeline to obfuscate faces and license plates. Again, this is really important when we're capturing data outside in the public where we not, haven't necessarily been able to approach everybody to ask for consent so that we can be assured that when we have data sets, they are um, removed of any personally identifiable information. So ultimately, Project ARIA is about accelerating machine perception and AI research for future AR glasses, which we're building inside of Meta. And we're doing that in two different ways. Uh, we're doing that, first of all, with our internal research community. This is the way we use the ARIA glasses internally uh, for accelerating our own research uh, uh, projects. But we also focus on empowering the external community, which is why we're all here together in the same room. And we do that in two different ways. First of all, we have the ARIA Research Kit. This is essentially a kit that we provide uh, partners that we have agreements with to provide them with glasses, machine perception services, and client SDKs, each of which I'll go into detail about. On the other side, we have open science initiatives. Again, we'll get to that later on, but let's just focus, first of all, on the ARIA Research Kit. So essentially, the ARIA Research Kit consists of the glasses, a mobile companion application that can be used to control the device, and a desktop application that can be used to manage uh, sequences and initiate what we refer to as machine perception services. Here's a visualization of, of some of our machine perception services in, in action. Ultimately, these are cloud-based pipelines that allows our partners to utilize the same pipelines that we use internally uh, from our external partners. So this machine perception service, for example, is uh, generating dense points. We can also align multiple trajectories to the same uh, reference frame. And all of the data that we're using is, is ephemeral. So essentially provide a machine perception uh, pipeline. You can submit sequences captured on the RO device. As soon as that output is calculated, the original data is removed from our pipeline. The data always belongs to the partners. We do not use that data for research. Here you're having a look at one of the machine perception services, which is estimating the eye gaze of the wearer who is uh, wearing our at this time. So we've talked about the device, we've talked about machine perception services. The final part of the research kit is this client SDK uh, with sample applications. So the client SDK essentially allows you to uh, programmatically control the device from a, from a client, whether that's a desktop or a mobile device. And we also provide streaming functionality that allows you to stream data from the RA device in real time to a client device like a mobile phone uh, or a, a desktop and use that for real time 
uh, uh, processing. And to give you just a little bit more of an illustration of what that might mean, here's a, a demonstration that we used recently with this streaming uh, client SDK. So in this video, you're seeing the uh, essentially the, the wearer or the user of ARIA holding a pair of ARIA glasses. This is streaming directly to a desktop. And then from that desktop, we're doing real time uh, tracking and uh, uh, um, object detection and lifting those detections into a 3D frame of reference. So our objective here is really to get people starting to think about how they might use the ARIA device for accelerating their own research projects, but to give people a few more examples about how this could be used. Here's an example where we're using the internal uh, magnetometer to build up a um, essentially a, a visionless map of the space. This starts to become really interesting when we think about how we can localize devices without having to rely on the uh, visual uh, sensors themselves. Another example here is how we can use the device for systems level research. In this example, we have two ARIA wearers. The ARIA in the front of the, uh, the, the, the trajectory is wearing a, uh, an X-Sense uh, bodysuit that's tracking their skeletal poses. And the wearer behind that individual is essentially observing them. All of these uh, uh, data signals are aligned to the same reference frame, both in space and time. And we're seeing the keyframes aligned to every second or so. So we can really start to understand how people move through a space in four dimensions. Finally, this is an example of Cube RCNN essentially uh, visualizing uh, bounding box detections uh, filtered in 3D. So we believe that the ARIA. Um, research kit is a really powerful tool that can be adopted by the internal research community for independent research. And just to, 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 to end this section on the research kit, I want to show a video of one of our collaborations from uh, CMU, uh, which really shows what we can do with the ARIA research kit. Now, I will just see if I can make sure that the uh, audio is working. I might need to change. Uh, Dima, what's the best way to uh, to change this so that I can... Yes, please. So really proud of that, that research. Uh, just to, to make that clear, what CMU was able to do was they were able to take our glasses, capture sequences around environments that they want to provide this service. They then use our machine perception services to calculate a trajectory from that and then pair that up in the same time frame as the uh, uh, Bluetooth beacons that are being calculated. And from that, they can train an inference model to determine location based on all that information. So it's, it's really exciting work. And for anybody in the room that doesn't already have an access to our, our Project ARIA uh, glasses, uh, this can be applied to online uh, at projectaria.com. And we really, really want to empower uh, internal uh, and external researchers to be able to conduct their own research. So that was a little, a, a little just run through of the ARIA research kit. What I'm really excited to talk about here today is our open science initiatives. This is really how we get more people working with Project ARIA who might not necessarily have access to a Project ARIA device, but who still might want to access the, the data sets, the, the tools, the models that we provide as part of the, of the ARIA program. And we're going to start off first by having a quick look at the open data sets. So last year, we released the first data set from Project ARIA that we call the ARIA pilot data set. This was essentially the, the first data set that we released from Project ARIA that consists of the full sensor suite of the device from all the different sensors that we talked about previously. On top of those sensors, that raw sensor data, we also provide these rich automatic and manual annotations that we described previously. So making sure that we have per frame poses that are aligned to the same frame of reference, that when we have multiple sequences captured in the same space, they are also aligned to the same time frame. We provide personalized uh, uh, calibration for eye gaze and also a number of other annotations, including uh, speech to text, which really open up a number of opportunities for using these data sets for contextual AI challenges. And the data set was really uh, uh, um, represents two different types of domains. The first domains or the first types of sequences that were captured were what we refer to as the everyday activities data set uh, within the ARIA pilot data set. This is really uh, sequences that are captured by actors playing out the types of scenarios that we expect to see people play out throughout their day. And then the second domain was what we refer to as these desktop activities. This is where we essentially had a multi-view camera set up and a single ARIA wearer, and they were manipulating objects so that we could use that data set to explore object detection, tracking, and spatialization challenges. And 
it's really interesting to see what happens when you release a data set out into the wild. This is really the first piece. We didn't know how people would use it. Uh, and uh, you may have seen the, the recent model segment like anything from the Meta AI team. They actually independently saw this data set and then used that uh, to make sure that the query uh, for the segment anything model was actually coming from the from the eye gaze from that data set. So we're really excited to see how people take these data sets and use them outside our team. This year, I'm really excited to uh, share and announce two new data sets. Those are ARIA Digital Twin and ARIA Synthetic Environments. I'll take us through those data sets at a high level one by one. First of all, ARIA Digital Twin is, we believe, the most comprehensive egocentric data set with a high quality corresponding ground truth. And just to illustrate exactly what I mean here, in the top uh, row, you're seeing real world footage that's coming directly out of a project ARIA device. And in the bottom row, you're seeing the simulated ground truth. So we've essentially built a uh, live and dynamic digital twin of this, this location, uh, which is within our, our offices in, in Meta. And we're using that information to provide these rich uh, corresponding ground truths for our real world data. How do we do this? Well, essentially, it required us to uh, produce hyper accurate uh, digital twins of the space. You're seeing a fly through of one of our spaces here. And we capture this uh, with a number of different means using LIDAR and then a few manual annotations to make sure that we've got as accurate a ground truth uh, on the real world footage as possible. And just to give a little illustration about what I mean here, uh, I, you can notice the differences if you pay real close attention, but uh, someone wants to shout out which one is the real one versus the, the synthetic, left or right? Yeah. Left is real. You're absolutely right. So you can see that the, we've got the OptiTrack markers that are in the ceiling that can be seen there. You can see a few of the, uh, uh, the shadows. Uh, second one, we're simulating the grayscale cameras again. Which one is the real one here? Yep. Yeah. And then finally, this one is a little bit hard. This this lighting gives it away. We'll try this one. This is this is the this is the model. This is one of the models in our space. This is a very synthetic. I know. <laughs> Which one's the real one? It's kind of 50-50, right? It's you can notice it in the shade under the uh, perhaps under here on those two different models. This is one of. Uh, several hundred objects inside the space that we have accurately produced a digital twin of. And again, we have all of this ground truth information that we can use. It's, it's really, really exciting. Um, ultimately, what this allows us to do by catching this real world digital twin of the space is we can propagate those annotations back into the real world footage. So suddenly we've got the, the raw images on the left hand side. We then see the simulation uh, after that. We've got 3D object bounding boxes, 2D object bounding boxes, 2D segmentation and, and depth maps that we can use to provide these rich annotations of the real world footage. And just to take us through a little bit more detail about those annotations, we have things like uh, pixel accurate occlusion masks. So that if we know that there is an object in front of another object, we're not expecting uh, researchers to, to, to be able to identify that object that is otherwise being occluded. And the same thing for the vignettes, for example. We make sure that we're not expecting too much uh, from our researchers there for predicting uh, the location of objects from data that does not exist. And similarly, I mentioned before, we care deeply about accurate calibration. For all of the dynamic objects in the scene, we have OptiTrack markers that we're moving around and calibrated in a number of different ways to make sure that we provide as accurate as possible uh, for that uh, digital twin. This data set is more than just objects. Uh, we talked about the XSense bodysuit that we've used previously. Uh, we have wearers inside this space that are wearing that uh, XSense bodysuit, which essentially provides a rig of the wearer as they move around. And we also have the eye gaze, of course, uh, from the Project Dario glasses. We use the rig to drive a dense model of the individuals who are walking through the scene. So we can use that to, to augment uh, uh, depth maps. And we can also, of course, take the eye gaze and project that onto uh, 2D images as well. So we're really, really excited about this data set and what people will do with it. Ultimately, uh, we want to be able to accelerate uh, research into object detection challenges specifically with this data set. And we have two associated challenges. One is 3D object detection and tracking with scene generalization. And the second is few shots 3D object detection and tracking. Essentially, the difference between these two, uh, these two challenges is for the former, all the objects that you're tracking are contained within the data set uh, for training. And in the latter, none of the objects that you're uh, required to track are included within the larger data set. You're only provided with uh, a few seconds of footage or a few seconds of annotation for those new objects. So 
really excited to to announce these challenges today. We do have a, a, a prizes for for first place, and uh, also invite uh, any uh, 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 winners uh, to participate in our BMBC workshop, which is later on this year. So do please take a look uh, on our website. It's projectara.com forward slash datasets forward slash ADT. And from there, you can access all the data sets, all the tooling to be able to get up to speed uh, with that challenge and with that data set. That's, that's one of two data sets that we're announcing today. Our team has been, uh, our team has been very busy. Um, the second data set is also tremendously exciting in a different area of research. This is the ARIA synthetic environments data set. This is the first procedurally generated synthetic, so uh, wholly simulated ARIA data set for large scale ML training. And what do I mean by large scale? Well, what you're seeing here is just a snapshot of one of the uh, 100,000 uh, unique interior multi-room scenes that we have procedurally generated uh, for this data set. Within each of these 100,000 totally unique scenes, we've simulated ARIA trajectories uh, to be able to traverse each of those environments with the same uh, uh, camera characteristics, lens characteristics that we otherwise have with the ARIA um, device. And of course, because this is a synthetic data set, we have the corresponding ground truth for RGB, depth maps, incident segmentations, so on. Uniquely for this data set, we also provide a 3D floor plan in a unique CAD-like language. This CAD-like language essentially provides uh, architectural commands to be able to produce uh, annotations such as the walls, the doors, the, uh, the, 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 the windows. And it opens up a number of really exciting opportunities for large scale ML uh, training for, for being able to de detect those types of annotations. I'll take us very quickly just through the process of generating these. So first of all, we have a pipeline for generating uh, multi-room Manhattan style uh, environments. We then populate those environments with uh, 3D objects. We're using the Amazon uh, Berkeley objects data set uh, for that. And we also then simulate these ARIA trajectories, each of which is done procedurally to observe uh, throughout the scenes. And we run the output of the simulation through our machine perception services for generating dense points. So we have that as extra information that can be used uh, to constrain the problem. We believe this is a really exciting uh, data set that represents a step change in terms of scale. Uh, and just to take one of these, these uh, um, characteristics here, we've got the number of trajectories uh, was cap captured, uh, represents um, uh, 67 days worth of footage uh, that traverses the distance between London and San Francisco. Uh, it's a large data set. Uh, the data set is roughly uh, uh, 23 terabytes in size. Uh, but we provide the tooling to be able to download that selectively via bash commands. So you're not trying to download that all to your, uh, your laptop. Um, so in the same way that we had uh, open challenges for the ARIA digital twin data set, we've also got challenges for the ARIA synthetic environments data set that we're all also excited to announce today. And the challenge here, we have a single challenge. The challenge is that given a single ARIA sequence, to output one of these language descriptions that we described previously for the scene. And that's the walls, the doors, and the windows. And likewise, we have uh, prizes for that and uh, would hope to be able to announce winners at the uh, BMBC workshop later on this year. So do again, please have a look at our website to have a look at those data sets, have a look at those challenges, and, uh, and do participate if it's in your area of research. Um, of course, these are just two data sets that we've captured internally inside of, of Meta. Um, but what this is really exciting for the Project Dara program is to incentivize other partners to be able to generate data sets and release them and use them however they see fit. So we really do encourage partners to capture them, capture data sets, release those, and, uh, and get more people working with the type of data uh, that we would all hope is available to researchers um, around the world. So. That took us through the data sets portion of the open science initiatives. Um, in order to help promote uh, the three minutes, we'll go through these very quickly. We have open tools to accelerate uh, uh, the capture of data sets. We ha essentially have a brand new set of tooling that we can use um, for working with that data. And uh, also this expands beyond the Project ARIA program. We've got VRS, which is a file format used by Meta internally for time series data. We've open sourced that and essentially this is to prevent other people from uh, uh, working on challenges that have otherwise been solved by other teams and essentially elevating the research that can be done. And similarly for open models, 
a lot of the time spent with capturing these data sets is spent on making sure that those data sets are uh, avoid of any PII, any personally identifiable information. And in the next few weeks, we will be open sourcing the anonymization model that we use internally instead of map. If anybody is capturing data either on Project ARIA or any other uh, a camera based system, they can use these models uh, to make sure that both faces and license plates are obfuscated from their from their data. So this is bringing us to an end. Open science initiatives. We're really excited to empower the community with the tools that we're using internally. We've got data sets. We've got tools. We've got models. And uh, we're really excited to see what people are doing with that. So uh, please do uh, follow on updates. Uh, you can sign up for a newsletter for those updates at projectaria.com forward slash newsletter. And we really hope to see so, uh, you all participate in the challenges. So thank you very much. Uh, we have not overtracked the 60 points of the process. Yes. Uh, from outside. Uh, we do not need, uh, without uh, speaking the markers and. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Oh. Uh, we have right now the machine perception service is a single trajectory. We have up and coming a new machine perception service that allows you to calculate um, uh, in the same frame of reference for multiple sequences, whether that happens from a single device over an extended period of time or from multiple devices at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Concerns about the um, website for the environment, uh, is the tool available uh, out, out of your desktop or the people have you just the, the data, the, the B models? And also, which is which is next step? Which is the goal? Because usually, uh, when you have, when you have a first person uh, vision, you have the person involved in yep. the actions. Yep. Uh, it looks like it's more for robotic stuff for learning navigation, but there is no human right interaction. Are you thinking to uh, bring something in, or what's next? In yeah. this moment, that doesn't look me uh, like a scientific vision data set at all. Yeah. So to answer your first question, first of all, I think you're asking about the the environments that are a synthetic environments data set. We're not providing the uh, essentially the the dense geometry of those scenes. Um, we do have that, and we could release that in the future if that's going to be valuable to the community. And we, we, yeah, we're. we're... This can't be recreated at all. Your synthetic environment using any tools you're providing. I see. I see. I see. I see. Open source blender or whatever. I see. Yeah. So we can build our own environment scanning with a map board, and then. My students can simulate interaction with. Uh, I don't. I, we haven't. We're not open sourcing that part of the pipeline yet. If there is interest in that, then that's something I'd, I'd love. I'd love to talk about. Yes. So, so we'll have a paper out, which is the first portion of this research in the next few weeks, and from that point, we'll uh, continue to iterate on that sort of line of research. Um, the second point. Remind me of the second point. The point is that no oh, humans. so there are no humans. Like yeah, so, so we're really zoning in on the challenges that we face in, you know, internally inside of Meta. Our team is responsible for, for building the algorithms for things like Quest, uh, things like you know whatever we have on, on, on AR, AR glasses or the future mm -hmm. uh, machine perception pipelines. W one of the uh, challenges that we have uh, for those is being able to have you know robust dynamic object detection and robust um, static scene reconstruction challenges. So that's okay. the area that, that we focused on, on at when the we moment. See interactions. Yeah. Then object detection is easy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like if, uh, if as long as you're far. Yeah. 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 A lot of occlusion. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the main. Problem. Absolutely. Absolutely right. I mean, it, this is something that we face internally as well. The ARIA um, uh, project ARIA pilot data set. If you're you're really focused on that, that's that's going to be the data set to have a look at, and that's been that's been out for a for a year or so, uh, but has all of these messy interactions that we experience throughout our day to day. So do have a look at that, and uh, we are actively looking at what's the next data set for you know future years to be able to open source that will allow people to accelerate the type of research that I think you're 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 talking about. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hi. How many devices can we scan each? Can't have. Have. We can tell you it's not few. So we've got 12 now. So yeah. If you need 12, 16? 16. If you need enough, I think there is more. We have everything. <laughs> so, so ultimately, it'll come down to the, the nature of the research, right? Uh, DEMA is, is a, a special case. Yeah. And uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, yeah, sure. yes, sir, if you yes, can yes, showcase yes. The, 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 the value, the, uh, the, the uh, research that you want to conduct, 
there it's not for sale for, it's not for okay. not for sale i don't have that information to be able to share um but it's you know putting up these programs is 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 no small feat we're not actually constrained by cost it's more the the manufacturing of those devices we have a finite number of devices that we are able to manufacture um but we are are dedicated to this project we're serious about it right thank you thank you very much thanks for inviting me thank you we're moving now to let's move to Speaking up session. And the first the first paper is Civilian camera civilian knowledge uh, towards an egocentric epistemology for computer vision and that it comes to something. Okay, and so now for something completely different. Uh, this is a sort of philosophical and thought piece by my student Sam Gori, who couldn't make it. And so I'm going to do my best job to present it for him. Um, basically, third person photographs, that's what most of people in computer vision look at are neat in the sense that they're really well organized, whereas egocentric photos, as we all know, are noisy and messy. And this is because in third person photography, there's a person who's chosen them, chosen to upload them to Flickr or YouTube or whatever, but based on their own personal motivations, whereas egocentric photos are messy because they show what's in front of the camera, regardless of the quality. So we might argue that egocentric photos are a more objective view of reality. And this comes back to a philosophical argument that Sam has been uh, looking at. It's this idea of situated knowledges. So uh, Donna Haraway back in 1988 talks about something called epistemology, which is the study of how we know things. 
Um, it turns out feminist theory has a fraught relationship with science because many opponents of feminism cite scientific facts about women and their supposed inferiority to men. And there's all kinds of other examples of this where science has been taken out of context and used in ways that it wasn't intended to be used. And so Haraway wants to find a theory of knowledge which accepts both true scientific knowledge as well as arguments against bias in science. And so she employs this metaphor. She says that all of the views of the world come from somewhere. So a scientist who looks at bacteria or a distant star isn't doing it objectively. They're seeing it through microscopes or telescopes that are built for observation for their eyes. And so science can't sort of take this view from nowhere. When it does, when it drops out the fact that there is a person, a scientist involved making decisions, it drops part of the sort of biological technical system. And she calls this process a God trick. It's the idea when we pretend like we are measuring something objectively when we're really not. It's not an argument against scientists because many of us know the limitations of our methods, although many of us don't necessarily write them in our computer vision papers. But it is an, it's an argument about how scientific findings can be taken as true without understanding those limitations. And so in the case of computer vision, we perform these God tricks fairly routinely. We take photos that were taken again by people who are making decisions. We assemble photo data sets and we say, okay, this is the objective view of reality by which we will measure the performance of our algorithms. And then we take these benchmark evaluations as objective views of our models. So we're doing these kind of two God tricks, pretending things are objective when they're not really. Um, and Sam is arguing that egocentric vision actually offers maybe a path forward because in some sense, egocentric cameras avoid the first God trick because the photos are being taken sort of without control of the person wearing the, uh, who's, who's taking the photos. But it still falls into the second, which is that we treat our benchmark evaluations as true. Um, and these benchmark evaluations though, capture things that are not objective like data set curators view, um, like for activity recognition, for example, which classes are to be labeled, how they're labeled, what the definitions of the classes are, and so on. It's only a partial view of the problem. And so Sam has been thinking about how to correct for this second uh, God trick. And so his, um, his proposal is that instead of taking the researcher's view when performing evaluation, what if we took the data collector's view instead? So for example, after asking research participants like in Ego4D to go out and gather data, return some of them to, to, to the lab and have them qualitatively evaluate the top models. This sort of avoids the God trick because the people who are making these, these decisions about the algorithms is no longer the researchers, it's the research participants. It sort of inverts the typical power dynamic so that we are not in control of everything, instead the participants are. And so um, as part of his thesis, he did this for one particular problem, that of image aesthetic quality assessment. And he has a paper at AAAI this year if you're interested in, in learning more, and you can also read the extended abstract. The, the, the idea is an image aesthetic quality assessment. There are standard data sets and there are standard ground truth labels of how good each image is on an aesthetic score, on an aesthetic scale. And then the idea is that the algorithm is supposed to produce the same scores. Um, but these are not objective data sets because someone took the images, someone selected them, someone labeled them, someone defined the metrics, and that's all sort of hidden behind this objectivity. And so his proposal is that maybe an alternative way of doing this is returning to sort of qualitative methods to evaluate something like this, something as subjective as aesthetics. So he developed this kind of interesting uh, um, uh, evaluation system where he has this cell phone app that um, a participant, it's a little, uh, it's a little, it's not quite smooth, but anyway, you can make it use your imagination. It's an, it's an app where basically it's a shutter, uh, it's, an, it's a camera app that doesn't have a shutter button. And so you wander around pointing at things and the algorithm takes a picture whenever it thinks the aesthetics is high enough. And then to evaluate, you can then switch to a different model. Say I wanna use model B of image aesthetics instead. And then you can wander around and, and have the participant um, give feedback. And so the participants sort of say things, can give feedback then about the quirks of the algorithm situated in their own lives. And they can give feedback on the problem statement, like 
this image quality assessment thing maybe doesn't make any sense anyway, but it empowers them to be able to do that. This is a slower and less practical version of, uh, of model evaluation, but it's also honest and human centric. And it emphasizes that our work exists in service to people. So if you're curious more um, about this, uh, check out the extended abstract by Sam. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So does this view uh, apply to, let's say, any task? I'm, I'm saying this partly because researchers like numbers. So like for quality assessment, it looks it looks to me like, you know, inventing the metrics and the numbers was like, we had to do something, but it's not the most natural way. So this makes a lot of sense. But let's say you want to evaluate, I don't know, object detection and uh, does that apply, do you think that apply to any task? So I think I have two thoughts. Um, and again, I'm sort of channeling Sam here, although I agree with his thesis overall. I think thought one is that we should all be better in situating what we say is objective. So we can be very clear about where data was collected. What were the decisions that were made in collecting a data set? You know, there's a lot of work, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of discussion in the community about how, about how to do this, this better. Um, and we can, we can acknowledge the fact that each of us has biases in what we're trying to do. Most of us have the bias about trying to publish our papers. We want to pr present results that are better than somebody else's. We know that. The community that reads our papers may or may not know that. Certainly the media doesn't know that. Um, but then I think the more extreme view that I could take is that it doesn't make sense for computer vision to be thought of as an objective problem because vision inherently is subjective. Vision is defined only in terms of the observer. You know, for example, I'm colorblind. Each of us have slightly different color vision systems. We all see the world differently. And so it's almost wrong to believe that there is one way of seeing the world. It's almost wrong to say that there is one bounding box around every object that describes that sensation that somebody gets off of, uh, that everybody in the world gets off of that image. That's an extreme view, um, but I think in the limit, that's, that's probably true. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Some of you might think uh, he's taking something out of the cup, while others might think he's putting something into the cup. But the answer here is he's taking something inside the cup, specifically a tea bag. So what we have learned from this, we have realized that the temporal, uh, we, if we could see more, more neighborhood frames, that would be easier to. Uh, understand action. So we have realized that temporal context is really important for understanding any kind of action. And that is the core of solving any kind of temporal action understanding, including our problem action segmentation. So in this study, we focus on egocentric temporal action segmentation that has uh, that is a crucial problem in computer vision and has a wide range of applications in mixed reality, robotics, uh, human behavior analysis, etc. So in recent years, we have seen, uh, seen significant progress in this uh, task through di different uh, visual language representation learning approaches. However, the, uh, the backbone still remains the transformer models. So uh, 
to to improve the overall performance of the action segmentation models, we need to improve the transformer architecture. So in, in this study, we propose two new ideas to improve transformer backbone. So before we go to the method, uh, let's recap the problem definition. Unlike regular action recognition problem where you will be given with a uh, train video and you need to uh, predict an action out of it, here in a temporal action segmentation, you will be given an a uh, whole untrained video, and I need, need to segment the video into multiple action chunks like this. So the current state of the art method uh, for this problem is bridge prompt plus as former, which was proposed in last year's CVPR. And here bridge prompt is basically a feature representation learning approach to visual language uh, constructive learning. And as former is the transformer backbone of it. And here we will focus mainly, mainly on improving the transformer backbone and we'll take S former as our baseline. So this is a baseline S former, which is basically an encoder decoder style transformer. Uh, it takes frame voice features from video as input and the encoder actually uh, gives an initial segmentation output and multiple decoders refine the output and give a better final uh, result. So we've improved the baseline, uh, baseline S former and I proposed a new uh, architecture for the X former, which is uh, which we where we incorporated two new ideas over the baseline. So our first proposal is dual dilated attention. So in the baseline model, we had only one branch of attention, which which uh, first captures the local uh, local context uh, with smaller attention window and gradually with the number of uh, layer increases it. Uh, increases the uh, window size and captures more global features. But here the problem is that uh, it's strictly hierarchical and because of that, it misses out the opportunity to learn uh, temporal level features adaptively. So here we uh, propose to add another attention branch and which is uh, works more reversely. So here this br another branch starts with capturing the global information first with larger attention span and then uh, gradually captures more local features with smaller attention branch. And, and each, uh, each level, it, uh, these two branches gets fused and this fusion helps to learn more uh, temporal features adaptively. Our another proposal is encoder-decoder cross-connection. So in the baseline model, we had, uh, we had a sequential uh, connection between encoder-decoder, like uh, from, uh, from last layer of the encoder, we have connection to all other layers of the first decoder and last layer of the first decoder to all of the layers of the second decoder and so on. Because of this nature, it misses out the opportunity. Uh, it actually like uh, causes a loss of local information because there's no information is passing from the lower blocks of the encoder. So here we propose a label-wise cross connection between encoder and decoder. So in our proposal, we, we have level-wise connection from, uh, so we have level S connection between uh, each decoder block to from uh, their corresponding encoder blocks. So because of that, uh, we prevent the loss of uh, local information here. So to validate our uh, proposals, we uh, did an ablation study where we tried out different configuration of our proposed method. And here we can see that adding uh, dual dialed attention and cross, uh, cross uh, encoder decoder cross connection, we have improved the baseline. Uh, furthermore, we tried out different feature representation learning approach with our uh, backbone transformer. And here we can see that with bridge prompt, we have, uh, our model performed the best. So we would recommend using this bridge prompt with our architecture. Uh, finally, we compare our uh, transformer model with uh, other well-known uh, standard approaches. And uh, here we can see that uh, on two different uh, well-known data set, GTEA and HOI4D, we outperform all other methods and achieve a state-of-the-art performance. So to further validate our approach, we did a uh, visual analysis. So from the analysis, we have found that our uh, architecture performs comparable to the baseline as former in most general cases, but uh, in more challenging cases, it outperforms the baseline. So for example, in this, uh, in this case, the action is shake. 
uh, and our our uh, our model uh, could perfectly predict the action by capturing subtle hand movement and uh, more relevant global feature where uh, the baseline fails to do so. In another interesting example where we have found an error in the ground truth level in the data set. So the ground truth level was shake, but we have found that it, it, it was supposed to be background class. However, uh, our model predicts is currently uh, as background class showing the reliability of our method. In another case where uh, the core action is uh, followed by a scoop, and uh, here we can see the baseline model outputs it does scoop due to the influence of the previous action and uh, getting influenced by irrelevant global pattern here. And our ma methods could uh, perfectly output uh, it as core. And uh, so with these examples and the results, we can uh, see that our model performed uh, model achieved state of the art performance, demonstrating comparable performance to the baseline in, in the general cases, while outperforming the baseline in more challenging cases. So uh, it, it shows its adaptive, uh, ability to adaptively focus on temp uh, temporal, uh, accurate temporal, local, and global context when uh, when appropriate. And our future plan is to extend the work further. Uh, with trying out uh, new ideas on, on the architecture and uh, extend the work uh, in more diverse uh, data sets. So that was from my side. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, very, very quickly, uh, yes. uh, show some examples. How do you define challenging? Mean that you say uh, take, release, and, yes. and like, what was the other one? Uh, you had like this example with take versus shake, okay. Yes. Uh, is shake challenging because it's ra more rare or how do you define? So I heard the thing is for some actions, uh, the local context are more important for other actions, global actions might be important. So in the baseline model, it's uh, hi strictly hierarchical. So it captures the local information first and then uh, gradually cap captures more global information. So that's why it initially get biased towards local action and then gets biased towards global actions. But in our method, we we have two different branches that uh, and we have the fusion between those two branches. That's why it cap uh, it actually adaptively captures uh, appropriate uh, temporal level features. So. For, uh, for example, here, local inf uh, global information is more important. So here, our model uh, focus on more, more on global features. But for, and uh, here, the local information is more important. And here, our model focuses on local information, but the baseline fails. So uh, that's the main idea behind the work. OK, thank you. Thank uh, you. OK, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank and you. Now have
Um, can people on Zoom hear me? Can you try again? Hello? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. We, we can see all your, we can see this, this mode. Maybe you, you can duplicate it. Yeah, on mirroring. Okay. Um, do you do you need the, this view? Because you can duplicate the full screen presentation on both screens, which would be. Uh, I don't need the presenter mode actually. Okay, I, I think you can. Oh, I see. You cannot see it either here. Um, maybe I can. Yeah, yeah. Go, go to. Do the presentation mode and then you can. Sorry, I'm not familiar with. Yeah, oh. you can go here to presentation mode. Okay. And, and and then you can, I think if you use live show, you should appear the same both. Let me see. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, sorry for the technical issue. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a PhD student in uh, Michael Blass Group and Omar Hilliger's Group in ETH Zurich and MPI. Uh, the topic of today is called Arctic, uh, a dataset for dexterous by manual hand object manipulation. So to motivate the project, I start with an uh, everyday example. So we human manipulate complex objects in our real life. So we open laptop covers, we apply water spray to clean windows, and we use scissors to cut uh, with our hands. Um, however, inanimate objects, they don't move by themselves. So object articulation and movement are caused by human motion. And this understanding of causality in uh, hand object manipulation has not yet uh, been studied, has, uh, is not yet the case for machine. So the reason is that uh, this is partly because existing data set, they mainly focusing on grasping, uh, interaction with rigid objects, and there's no data set with two hand dexterously manipulating articulated objects. So to this end, we introduce a data set called Arctic. So Arctic is data, a data set consists of two hand dexterously manipulating object with articulation. So here we show some 3D data captured in Arctic. So we rendered both the hands and the objects onto the RGB image we captured. So here we show the, uh, the ground shoes. So the hand is not actually white and the object is not purple here. It will also capture the full body human motion for the interaction with articulated objects. Um, the motion we focus in Arctic is not uh, about grasping motion. So we're focusing on highly dexterous manip manipulation with objects. So on the left, we show the ground truth of two hands manipulating two uh, articulated objects. And on the right, we show highly dynamic hand object contact because uh, it's manipulation and not just grasping. Um, here we show more ground truth for the Arctic data sets. So below, uh, we can eat, there's a one sequence below. So what the person is actually almost dropping the object. So this is not scripted, but uh, because we're using a motion capture setup, so we can capture those fast motion. Um, here we showed uh, all the views we have on the Arctic data sets. We have a allocentric views and one egocentric moving view, and they're all synchronized and calibrated. Um, we introduced two tasks on Arctic data sets. One task is called consistent motion reconstruction, and the other task is for, called interaction field estimation. So for the reconstruction task, the goal is to, given a monocular video of a person manipulating articulated objects, we want to reconstruct for every frame, uh, both hands and also the articulated objects. But we require the reconstruction to be consistent in time. So by consistency, uh, what we mean is that uh, it's illustrated in this example here. So the person is opening a door of a microwave, so it's very uh, common motion. And the below is showing a zooming view, and the person is actually not maintaining stable contact with the uh, door of microwave. So this is actually from the prediction from the baseline network, trained on Arctic. So uh, in real life, uh, when we're opening a microwave door, in order to be a physically plausible in terms of this interaction, we have to maintain contact in the same region. So that's what we're focusing on for this consistency task. So here we show some qualitative results for the reconstruction, just to show the feasibility of the task. We are hosting a workshop uh, right now as well uh, for ICCV. 
Well, so that's an Arctic data set challenge if you are interested in taking part in the future. Um, so we have a second task for Arctic data set, which is called interaction field estimation. So the goal of the task is given a monofield video. We want to, for each frame, estimate both the left hand and the right hand. And we want to estimate a concept, a, a notion, which we call interaction field. So to define interaction field, we want to motivate that contact is a very important prior for hand and object interaction. For example, people have been using hand and object contact as a prior for generation task and reconstruction task. Um, but mainly what people are using in, in uh, contact representation is binary contact. So in this example on the left, the person is holding an object. So usually binary contact means for each vertex on the hand, we want to determine whether it's in contact with the object. So it's a binary label. Um, however, when we have two hand dexterously manipulating objects, not all the hands are always in contact with the objects, but they can be in close proximity. So we need a more generalized notion of contact for two hand manipulation tasks. So we call that a uh, generalized contact representation interaction field. So the idea of interaction field is that given an image as an input, we want to estimate for each hand vertex the closest distance to the object mesh, and for each object vertex the distance to the hand. So if we visualize those distances as a heat map, we can see the brighter the color here actually represents the closer the hand and object distance are. So we can see the object to the right hand, the handlebar is light up because the right hand is holding the object. While, while as the uh, right hand uh, fingertips are quite bright because they're actually in contact with handlebar compared to the palm region. And because we have two hands, so we have four interaction field to estimate in total. So if we visualize this interaction field as a video, um, to, to, we can get a sense of the intuition. So the important thing is that uh, this interaction field estimation uh, representation uh, is not limited to only contact, hand and object contact uh, scenario. So when your hand is not in contact with the object, it still have a proximity uh, notion for hand and object representation. So I hope uh, we can also use this representation for downstream reconstruction tasks, for example, of, uh, optimization. Um, so we introduced the two tasks for Arctic, but I believe that Arctic can uh, help with a series of uh, downstream tasks. So one line of tasks is about generation. So in the literature right now, there are three stream of hand object generation tasks. Uh, on the left, we have a hand grasp generation. We are given a object mesh. We generate the hand that grasping the object. Um, in the middle, we have an object uh, uh, hand motion generation task where uh, we want to generate a rigid uh, object motion with the hand for motions such as picking up an object from the table. On the right, we have a similar setting, but for full body uh, setup. So Arctic uh, can potentially help with this task because Arctic uh, contains object with articulation and Arctic focus on no longer grasping motion is focusing on dexterous motion. So um, we can generate, uh, have a more generalized settings for a task like this. Um, I want to highlight there's another line of work that perform articulated object pose estimation, and they're mainly focusing on estimation from depth images, and they don't actually model human. Um, however, in real life, the reason a laptop can be open is because we have human in the scene. And Arctic can potentially be used in those settings to jointly reconstruct hand and also uh, articulated object in depth images. We also have code online already uh, in case someone want to render the depth map. Uh, so all the links, code, and other competition are on this page. If you are interested, you can take a uh, photo. Thank you. So we go directly to the next talk, and then we're going to have questions for uh, both um, first two talks. Okay. Uh, can I wait for 10 seconds? Anyone take a break?
see it. Uh, quick. You, you should you should share your screen. You should share your screen. Oh, it's not done enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Where's that? Um, uh, share your, just share the whole screen. Then share the whole screen. I'll share the whole screen. Okay. Cool. Good. Yeah, then we're right now. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Chow and I'm happy to invite you to present our paper. Ego-centric audiovisual object localization. Uh, so let's get started. So before we move to the formal task definition, I would like to share some uh, motivating example. How, do we, how should we start a, a unique characteristic in the ego-centric video that related to the solution of ego-centric audiovisual object localization? Okay, let me play the video. Sorry, it's the sound. Let's see. It's plugged in. It's plugged in here. Yeah. Oh. I think you might need to change. Oh, you make the speaker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Let's try. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. So yeah, first we want to show some uh, examples about the videos. Okay, let's how to play it. So this is an example from Abbey Kitchen. They said we can find that like the recorder is usually moving in the things, and the recorded viewpoint is also like moved. And okay, let's come to this problem. Uh, here and another problem is the out of view sound. So ego centric video typically have a limited field of view. So which means that the certain sounds may occur outside of the camera's friends, which may introduce the noisy information uh, towards the audiovisual learning. Okay, let me play this video. So you can hear that while the uh, recorder is cutting the camera, it's also like a frying pan outside of view. You can clearly hear that. So now comes to our task definitions. So what's the egocentric audiovisual object localization? That's like, given a video and an audio string showing here, we want to spatially localize what's the object that emits sound in a uh, visual footage. It's like a figure showing here, we want to localize the firing point inside. But the previous example showed that uh, the viewpoints may change uh, frequently, resulting, of, uh, resulting in different looks of the object and the sounds may not be directly visible due to the limited field of view. For example, like the human speech here. So these all challenges uh, make the egocentric audiovisual of the localization problem more difficult. To solve this problem, we uh, propose a new methods. So we first uh, give an overview of our method. Our goal is to estimate the key method that represent the sound object, and, but, we need to know that uh, there's no ground truth available during the training time, which means that we don't know what's the sounding objects during the training. So, which means the mo model should be trained with the self supervisions. And additionally, we want our model to tackle these two challenges. One is learning a represent representative uh, visual feature by mitigating the ego motions. Another one is like we want to alleviate the out of view sound problems uh, by designing module and training strategy. So here comes our framework. So given the uh, input video and the input of audio, we want the model to have the capability to deal with the out of sound. So how could we do that? We introduce another sample audio, which is randomly uh, picked from the data set, and we mix them together to create a mixture input. And during training, we extract the visual feature and the, also the audio feature of the, from the mixture. And we, we force the model to learn about the audio, uh, out of view sound disentanglement, which we inject with the visual features here. And we want the disentanglement module to extract a visually indicated sound representation. And the uh, marks will be output from the decoder, which will represent 
was the input audio dominated at the rich location inside the audio map. And next, to, to further enhance the visual feature, we introduce uh, soft localization uh, modules, which we want to associate the visual feature with more audio cues here. And after that, we enhance the visual features and fit into the geometry aware temporal modeling module here, which we aim to tackle the shifting viewpoint problems. And so here, given the details, so our geometry aware temporal modeling can do contain two steps. So first, we will measure the uh, geometry transformations, which is, is exactly is the homo homographic transformation metric between the friend I to friend J, and we then warp the visual features from J to I, uh, as the equation showing here. And next, we will all the visual feature friends are aligned under the same viewpoints, and we will do the temporal modeling here by query, by aggregating the visual informations temporarily and calculating the weights along the temporal uh, dimension at each spatial locations. So our final goal is to estimate the heat map that represent the location of the sounding object, and like the uh, map showing here. And our final tuning objective will become a combination between the localization loss and the sound disentanglement loss. So for the localization target, we adopt the contrastive learning target, which we push the visual and audio feature sample from the same video closer and pull the uh, visual and audio feature from the different video uh, far further. And the second dis disentanglement loss is uh, driven by our mixture and separated strategy. And another contribution of our work is that we uh, collect the sounding object annotations here. Uh, you can see like the left hand side showing the example how we we collect, we annotate the sound object at the bounding box levels, and the right hand side showing the statistics of our uh, annotations. So the challenge is stemming from the variation in du in the duration duration of the videos, and also the object area, and also the occurrence of all the view sounds. You can see like many of the objects are small in 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 the egocentric videos, which will pose a uh, significant challenges to solve the audiovisual object localization problem. And to benefit from our collective episodic object data set, we can, we can compare our method quantitatively with the state of our third-person view localization methods. So uh, to name a lot, like the mixed uh, method, which from the last year CVPR is to uh, make Divide a method to mix the sound from different video and localize the object there. And you can see clearly our methods outperform out, out all the methods in a large margin across all the metrics. And also the right hand side showing the figure showing that uh, the module design of uh, in our model is showing the effectiveness of addressing the ego motion and also the out of view sound problems. So here I want to show some uh, qualitative videos to dem demonstrate our localization results. So here the example are from our every uh, sounding object data set. And next we also show some qualitative results from the more challenging ego body data set. So come to the uh, conclusions. So our we we are the first one to explore the challenging ego-centric audiovisual object localization problem, where we identify two challenges: the ego motion and also the out of sound problems. And we our method shows that the temporal modeling is an effective way to mitigate the viewpoint change and disentangle the out of sound. It actually can improve the localization performance, both for uh, benefit from the training and the inference process. And we also propose a data set that presents the sounding object uh, annotations. And thank you for the attention uh, and welcome to stop by our poster on the Thursday afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Since we are a bit beyond beyond schedule, the schedule, uh, we go there. You can go directly to the poster if you have questions. Sure. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, so in that and case, let's show share screen. Okay, I'm going to share screen too, right? Yeah. Okay, so anything Okay, we can connect with that. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. I'm Jian Wang. I'm a PhD student in Max Planck Institute for Informatics. And it's my pleasure to present our CVPR paper, Seeing a Very Egocentric Motion um, of 3D Human Pose Estimation. And the task of ego pose uh, estimation is to estimate 3D human body pose from a single head mounted fish eye camera. This allows a person to move around a large scene, uh, while the traditional pose estimation method can only record in a fixed volume. With this advantage, the egocentric pose estimation method shows great potential in various applications, including the AR and VR applications. A number of methods like Moto Cap2, Exigo Pose, and Eagle PW have been proposed towards Eagle Pose estimation tasks. However, when taking account of the surrounding scenes, current method usually suffers from artifacts, including body environment penetration or body floating issue. Our method, however, produces ac accurate and physically plausible 3D human body poses from a single egocentric image. So how do we do that? We note that from our wide view fisheye camera, we can capture both human body and uh, surrounding scene information. Based on this observation, we firstly estimate the scene geometry and then propose a scene where post estimation framework that leverages the scene context to constrain the prediction of body poses. Firstly, we propose two data sets to enable the training of the network. network. We propose Eagle GTA uh, that contains 320,000 frames. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a synthetic data set based on the motion sequences of GTA IM and also Eagle PW scene. Uh, that is uh, in the WOW data set with pseudo ground truth scene constructed by the structure from motion. Both data sets uh, contain body pose labels and scene depth map for each egocentric frame. And based on this data set, we, we can train an egocentric depth estimator uh, to predict the depth map of a surrounding scene, and we can reconstruct the point cloud of the scene uh, from this depth map. However, available depth estimation network estimates depth with the human body. Thereby, it leads to a negative impact on the post estimation component. So to solve, to solve this issue, we predict the depth map, including the human body, and a human body segmentation mask. After that, we leverage a depth impending network to recover the depths behind the human body. Finally, we combine the projected 2D pose features and scene depths in a common voxel space and regresses the 3D body pose heat maps with a V2V network. The 3D voxel representation projects the 2D poses and depth information from the distorted fisheye camera space to the colonical space and further provides direct geometric connection between the 2D image features and 3D scene geometry. In order pr to prove that the scene geometry can supervise the prediction of the pose, we use different depth maps as input and show that the predicted poses changes to standing, squatting, and sitting to better adapt to the input changes of the scene geometry. Here, we show our qualitative results on our test data set. Our method showed significant improvement compared with previous ego pose estimation methods in terms of pose accuracy and physical plausibility. Okay, what else? Um, and here we also show our results for the in the wild images. So note that the background scene are constructed by the SFM. Here we show our quantitative results. 
Apart from the MPGPEs estimating in table one, we also show that the plausibility of our estimated pulse in table two. Most of our estimated pulses is not penetrating the environment and also in contact with the scene. Inclusion, we have proposed a new approach to estimate egocentric human posts under the scene constraints. We propose two egocentric data sets containing egocentric post labels and scene geometry labels. We also propose a depth implanting network for estimating the depth map of the, of the scene without human body. For the future works, we can extend the current work to the video-based scenario and explore the egocentric scene reconstruction and re-rendering, global human post localization, and physics-based uh, physics motion refinement problems. Thank you for your attention. Okay, let's get to the last talk, and we have was the defense of the UV understanding via 3D and pose estimation. Uh, hello everyone uh, thank you for the stating and did uh, my last talk and i'm take uh, uh at a phd student at the university of tokyo and here is uh, my intensive work at the metal reality lab and here i will present assembly hand towards Egocentric activity understanding via a 3D hand pose estimation. So, uh, in this work, uh, we aim to understand the egocentric activities using 3D uh, hand pose estimation. And here we propose a new benchmark called uh, Assembly Hand. And here is the largest uh, 3D hand pose data set uh, with accurate 3D hand pose annotation. And this data set features uh, a high quality annotation. And we have uh, 3 million images in total. And also we have uh, uh, 490 uh, K ego images. Uh, this uh, statics is also the largest uh, to date. And we proposed uh, automatic annotation method uh, using uh, multiple egocentric images. And also we benchmark egocentric hand pose estimation task. And finally, uh, we proposed uh, new pose estimation uh, approaches using action recognition. In the uh, previous uh, work uh, called the assembly hand, uh, provost uh, multiple action uh, recognition data set. And here, hand pose uh, estimation are given from the egocentric cameras. Uh, here, uh, the, uh, we use uh, Quest 2 headset. And uh, since the egocentric view is limited, uh, prediction is not so accurate. And here, uh, MPJP is at uh, 27 millimeters uh, when we compare it to the manual grand truth annotation. Uh, on the other hand, in our methodology, we try to use uh, synchronized uh, outside in cameras to uh, predict a reliable hand pose. And we uh, developed a multi annotation method and we uh, gave a 3D uh, uh, pose annotation. And then we project a 3D pose to the egocentric cameras and then a benchmark uh, egocentric. Uh, pose uh, task. And here, uh, this multiple annotation is quite accurate, uh, which achieve uh, 4.2 mm millimeter errors, and which is the 85% uh, lower than uh, original assembly 101 uh, annotation. And here's the overview of uh, our benchmark construction. In step one, uh, we use the multiple outside uh, images to uh, uh, deconstruct the 3D uh, key point. And here we use uh, some like a triangulation method uh, and then the uh, MV exonet aggregate uh, multi view features uh, to give 3D prediction. And using that uh, prediction, uh, we 
paired with the uh, egocentric images and they train a single view network on it. And finally, uh, we evaluate uh, the pose prediction. And here, uh, given the sequence of uh, hand pose prediction, uh, we retrain the uh, action classifier and then we uh, solve the bulb classification task and then we report this bulb classification task uh, accuracy as the a new proxy evaluation for hand pose estimation. And here is the overview. And so uh, for the technical detail, please uh, see our uh, posters and uh, come on Wednesday. And here's the qualitative result. The above result are uh, a grand truth uh, prediction uh, from the uh, exo views. And here, we, as you can see, we have a very accurate uh, key point annotation. And the second law is a single view network trained on the egocentric images. Uh, the prediction is also well aligned to the uh, our gen newly generated uh, grand truths. And the last one is uh, baseline for the uh, Quest 2 VL headset uh, called the Umetrak. And this uh, model takes the egocentric images. Uh, that's why the sometimes uh, uh, prediction became inaccurate as due to the uh, hand object occlusion like the second image case. And here the depth estimation is uh, quite uh, yeah, incorrect. And this is the quantitative result. And usually uh, we use the MPJP as the pose estimation uh, metrics. We also report the above classification accuracy. And as you can see, uh, our uh, new model, uh, SV EgoNet, uh, uh, outperformed the baseline. And also, uh, we also uh, report the uh, confusion metrics. And here's a summary of our assembly hand data set. Uh, we offer uh, a great three hand pose annotation, and we provide a baseline for egocentric hand pose estimation, and we propose uh, a new pose evaluation scheme using uh, bulb classification. And the potential application and the usage of this data set could be like a pose estimation addressing like a heavy occlusion in egocentric setting or a multi view hand pose estimation or like a contextual uh, pose estimation using action label or like object information like uh, uh, yeah, object pose or object bounding box. And finally, uh, we may uh, go to the action recognition using 3D hand pose, uh, 3D hand poses. And uh, our, our posters will be presented at a Wednesday uh, session. So please uh, come here and also uh, data and the code is already released. And then we will use this, this data for ICCB hands challenge. So uh, please check it out. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'm not muted. Very good. I won't take more of your time. We did have a selection of papers from CDTR, as you've seen. But of course, it's very hard to scan through the list of papers and figure out which papers are of relevance to um, egocentric uh, work. So I want to highlight a few papers we haven't successfully selected. Um, so you might have seen this in the workshop. So we, there is a paper on action detection using audiovisual temporal context worth highlighting. Um, tomorrow's session, um, um, these are our orders. So uh, this is a work on our work on long tail video recognition using EPIC. Then on uh, Tuesday afternoon, this is the work that David Fauhi had presented earlier on unsupervised extraction of manipulated objects. On Wednesday morning, there is work on te leveraging temporal context in low representational power regimes. Again, an attempt to actually go um, into you know, more efficient approaches into extracting understanding from egocentric data. In the morning as well, 
there is um, this effort on relabeling the full extent of EPIC in this case, using another approach called the Therblings in Action, um, a new set of motion primitives. Um, so if you're interested, you can visit that. On the um, afternoon, there is this work on affordances from human videos, again, learning from human videos and directly applicating, uh, uh, applying this into robotics. In the uh, afternoon session, there is this work, which is ours, on uh, early action prediction from egocentric. A highlight work on Thursday morning, latency matters, real time, action forecasting transformer work. And finally, in the afternoon, affordance diffusion, synthesizing hand object interactions from egocentric footage. So, you know, more to highlight, more to do. I'm sure you're gonna walk around and find even more than the ones I managed to find over the course of scrolling through the videos. And if you think that's enough, you will be bombarded by stuff that's coming out on archive very quickly. This is a work I was particularly impressed with that just came to archive a month ago on learning handheld object reconstruction from in the wild videos. Right, so uh, basically one of my concerns is how to highlight such impacts. And maybe in this workshop, we're not really successfully uh, capturing everything that's happening. So currently we are awarding um, all the successes based on the benchmark. So benchmark papers are receiving awards. We're still inviting some keynote papers from CVPR and we have all your nicely accepted abstracts, um, but it feels like it's limited. We're still not capturing the extent of where egocentric now has reached. And I remember Jitendra was saying data sets are gonna survive a lot more than benchmarks. Uh, so that's the question to say, you know, how can we expand beyond the limited number of benchmarks? Moving forward, I have a proposal. I'd like to hear from all of you what, we, what you think is to actually have general awards top five or top 10 awards for best works that utilize, in this case, Epic Kitchens or its trilogy. So not restricted really to the benchmarks. And so this will be decided by a committee similar to how we do outstanding paper awards and conferences. So they will be apples and oranges. And we need to decide who has contributed most in that year to the egocentric community. So this could be related to any of the benchmarks if that's outstanding, multiple benchmarks, or could be independent of any benchmark. Uh, could be published work, ongoing work, or unpublished work, but there will be a deadline at which you submit for, from, for consideration. You say, my work is a deserving top 10 contribution to the EU community this year, and we will receive awards accordingly. I think feeling how we're go going forward, this might be a more inclusive approach. We might see more mixture of things that are not highlighted by some of our benchmarks. Benchmarks will remain open, so the test sets, you can submit to them at any point in time and use them as a way to highlight successes in any of the predefined challenges. Um, I think we're considering this as a way forward for next year and would be keen to hear from you or the community about whether that matches expectations or a disappointing direction. With that, I particularly want to highlight a few people who worked really, really hard. Sidant, who's not here and has really contacted most of you uh, to arrange to come and give talks. So special um, thanks to him and of course, uh, Mike, Antonino, Siug, Drew, uh, and all the team who've worked behind the scenes. And we hope maybe next year, if we say there are all these works coming in Ego, maybe next year we will be the top ranked topic in CVPR. This is probably one of you, you know, you look at these things, recognition is going down, 3D is now going up, and we might be hoping that one day next year, or maybe in a coming two years, that the Ego topic will be the top submissions into CVPR with the efforts of all of you. Um, that's the mission. Let's see if we can deliver it. Thank you very much. <laughs>